Pedro, we're live. You see recording started? Cloud started. Backup is rolling. Uh, just give one second to confirm that the streaming is uh, working properly. Yep, we're good. All righty, thank you. <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Environmental Protection. At this time, would all panelists please turn on your videos. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair, we are ready to begin. Uh, thank you, Sergeant. Good afternoon. I am Jim Gennaro, Chair of the Environmental Protection Committee. Today we'll be holding an oversight hearing on building electrification. We'll also hear three bills. Uh, and I'm going to uh, pretty much dispense with most of the substance in my opening statement because I'm very eager to hear from the witnesses. <clears throat> and um, uh, I've had discussions with a lot of uh, uh, people who are you know, stakeholders in this process. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> I am going to be you know, keeping my questions to a minimum for the sake of you know, getting through all the witnesses. Uh, <clears throat> I will have ample opportunity to you know, talk to stakeholders as this process goes along. Uh, please rest assured that this, this bill is what will, uh, at least you know, 2317 is my full-time job now. Uh, every, every word of testimony that is submitted, I will read personally. Uh, for 13 years, I was the um, policy analyst to the Environmental Protection Committee, and I chaired it for 12 years once upon a time. Now I'm back, I'm grateful to be back. And um, so just so, so you know, if, if I don't ask you a lot of questions about your testimony or no questions, it does not mean that I'm not interested. It just means that I wanna hear from everyone and get everybody on the record. Um, we've had to do some things like, you know, limit the you know, testimony to two minutes. I don't ordinarily do that, but with, uh, you know, more than a hundred witnesses, it is necessary to do that if we wanna get done by midnight. Um, and uh, I'm going to, with regard to 2317, we're joined by my good colleague, uh, council member, um, Ampri Samuel. She'll be recognized momentarily to give an opening statement on her bill and talk about that. It's my understanding that the other sponsors are not here for their bills. So let me just say a little something about their bills. Um, intro 2091, would amend previously enacted local laws to add a study of building electrification in New York City. This legislation would require that the building electrification study consider regulatory bar barriers to building electrification, lack of both uh, customer awareness and workforce familiarity with electrification, costs for property owners, and time frames for electrification consistent with state and local greenhouse gas reduction goals. That is intro 2091. That is sponsored by Councilmember Kalos. Um, the next 2196, um, which is uh, sponsored by council member Lewis, uh, 2196 would require an agency or office designated by the mayor to conduct a study of the health impact of the gas stoves and to make a recommendation as to whether it would be appropriate to create a phase out policy of gas stove. This local law would take effect immediately if passed. And um, uh, with that, as I said before, I wanna limit what I have to say both in my opening statement and in, um, and in my questions, I wanna be spare. With regard to that, I would urge my colleagues, um, uh, well, I, I was only one colleague on, um, um, on, the, um, uh, in, um, on the Zoom right now to be spare with questions as well, so we can get as many witnesses in and have them not wait so long. Uh, and in terms of the run of show here, um, Sergeant and the uh, committee council, am I, uh, am I 
free to uh, bring on council member um, Samuel for her opening statement or is there other housekeeping stuff we need to do now? Just a little introduction. So um, okay. I'm Tamara Swanston, Council of the Environmental Protection Committee. Welcome to the hearing on environmental protection. Before we begin, I wanna remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please be aware that there could be a delay in muting and unmuting, so please be patient. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. We will begin with testimony from the administration, which will be followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. Uh, we will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, including responses. I will call on you when it's your turn to speak. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in the order that you raised your hand. Thank you. And now I will hand okay. off to Chair Gennaro and uh, he can also <coughs> hand off to uh, Council Member uh, Alika Amphrey Samuel. Uh, 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 thank you, Samara. I, I thank you for your good work over the years. You were counsel to the committee uh, in my previous tenure uh, um, at the council and your good work continues. And uh, that, that you just reminded me that I am you know, remiss in not doing something that's very important, which is thanking the really terrific committee staff who've done such great work in getting us to this good day. Uh, we just heard from Samara Swanson. We have policy analyst Nadia Johnson, Ricky Chawla, and financial analyst Jonathan um, Seltzer. And finally, uh, last but not least by any means, my own terrific legislative director, Nabi Kaur, for all of their hard work. I appreciate it very much. And with that said, it is my great honor and privilege uh, to bring on the uh, uh, prime sponsor of 2317. It has been a real delight working with her on this bill and just as a colleague in general. Uh, and uh, we're going to miss her when she goes to HUD and does great things on the <laughs> national stage. Um, uh, and I thank her so much for the sponsorship of, of, of this bill. And um, with that send up, how about that, you know, Alika, that was pretty good, right? So, um, so uh, it is my pleasure to recognize Council Member Amphrey Samuel, who will give her opening statement on her bill. It's been an absolute joy, <laughs> Chair Gennaro, to, to work with you um, just over the past uh, couple of months. I, I appreciate your leadership. And I do recognize your, um, your years of hard work around environmental protection. So, so thank you, thank you, thank you for all you have done. And I look forward to working with you um, in the days to come. Um, thank you, Alika. So I, I do also just want to thank you for having this hearing and, um, and for the ability to discuss intro 2317, commonly referred to as the gas ban bill. And I thank you for giving me the opportunity to address the committee today. The 41st council district, which I represent, encompasses Brownsville, Ocean Hill, parts of East Flatbush, Crown Heights, and Bed-Stuy. And my communities and communities like mine have astronomically high levels of respiratory diseases and poor health outcomes many of which are directly related to climate justice and injustices. This legislation, intro 2317, would effectively prohibit the use of gas operated heating systems in new construction or gut renovations across New York City. The city has set a goal to be carbon free by 2050 and this bill codifies and creates the parameters to ensure we meet that goal. Ironically, the most affected communities are usually left out of conversations about climate change, although our residents are literally paying for the effects with their health and sometimes their lives. The illustration that I often use, you have heard me talk about this time and time again, is when other parts of our city were converting to clean energy buses, the old diesel buses were not taken out of service. They were sent to other depots like the East New York Depot which services the bus lines that run through my district. It's ironic because our residents contend with some of the highest rates of respiratory issues that are directly related to environmental factors. 
The stakes for our residents are very high and I'm proud to represent their interests and that of the entire mm -hmm. city as we look forward to eliminating aggressive and reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, simple. As the experts have and will continue to testify, when space and water heating appliances such as furnaces and boilers burn gas or oil to produce heat, they emit several dangerous pollutants. We can make a major dent in these emissions in our atmosphere by prohibiting natural gas hookups in new buildings and gut renovations. Although other locations have already realized the goal, as New York City goes, the rest of the country follows. So I look forward to today's discussion. I look forward to the attention that will be placed on this issue. And again, Chair, thank you for recognizing this pivotal moment in history. So on behalf of the advocates and friends that have worked tirelessly with me to move this bill, we appreciate you and today's the day to have this discussion that we've been waiting for for so long. So thank you everyone. And again, I look forward to the, to the discussion. Thank you, Council Member, for your very gracious opening statement and your kind remarks and your <clears throat> and your uh, you know, tireless advocacy uh, on this bill. It is uh, uh, it is uh, it has really been terrific. And um, uh, thank you, uh, thank you for that. <clears throat> and uh, I think I am clear to call on the administration, right? Uh, but I, and before I do that, just to um, uh, you know, just a word to, to the people who will be testifying. Uh, you know, um, these bills consist of words on a page <clears throat> and, um, you know, the best kind of testimony, which really helps us the most to fashion the best bill <clears throat> is, is testimony that goes, you know, directly to the wording or, you know, essence of the bill. So you see the bills, they, so, you know, if you had, you know, your druthers, uh, uh, you know, the best testimony is what would you do? Uh, to you know, add words to the bill, to take words away from the bill, to change words that are in the bill. This is what really helps us. Sometimes, you know, philosophical discussions uh, are great about how our planet is ailing, and like we all get that. But this is a you know legislative hearing, and we want to focus. We want to laser focus on uh, you know twenty three seventeen and the other bill. So try to be very succinct in um, you know giving us uh, you know. Your, your best testimony that, you know, directly affects the wording of the bill if you are, are in a position to do that. And uh, with that said, it's my privilege to call the administration. I guess that's, uh, I guess, Samara, uh, you as the, um, as the, um, the uh, what's the, what's the proper so term of art that you're going to be playing? Bill. No, 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 but in terms of your role here today, like you're, you're the, what do you call the I'm role? I'm the moderator. The moderator, correct. Okay, yeah, moderator. So you as moderator, uh, you know, please, uh, you know, do your thing, bring on the administration, uh, you know, swear them in and let's get this thing going. Thank you very much, Samara, I appreciate it. Oh, okay, uh, now <clears throat> I would like to deliver the oath to the administration so I will call on them each individually to record your answers to be followed by your testimony. So please raise your right hands. I don't see, I see uh, Gina, but I don't see Anthony Fiore or Ben Fern. Oh, I'm here smart. I'm looking for Anthony Fiore or Ben Furness. Uh, I'm here as well. Hey, he's here. I'm, um, um, Anthony's he's here. here. I see Ben. I see Anthony. Okay, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. Okay, uh, thank you. And now let's hear your testimony. Thank you so much, Samara. And, and thank you, Chair Gennaro, for, uh, for holding this hearing. And it's, it's been really a delight to, to, to work with you in, in, in the run-up to this conversation. Thank uh, you, Ben. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Furness, and I'm the Director of the Mayor's Office of Climate and Sustainability. 
I am joined today by Anthony Fiore, the Deputy Commissioner and Chief Energy Management Officer at the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, and Gina Bokra, the Chief Sustainability Officer at the Department of Buildings. I want to thank you, Chair Gennaro, and members of this committee for the opportunity to testify on building electrification and introductions 2317, 2196, and 2091. A recent report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change found that unless there are immediate and large scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, the world will continue to see increases in the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events and heat waves that would imperil global agriculture and health. New Yorkers are already too familiar with the serious consequences of extreme weather, most recently managing the impacts of Tropical Storm Henri and Hurricane Ida. As world leaders convened in Glasgow for the UN climate change negotiations over the past weeks, it's become clear that cities are leading the way in the fight against climate change. Uh, the Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act is providing support for major new investments in decarbonization, and that and the big Build Back Better Act signal that cities will be critical in our country's work against climate change. Cities are taking ambitious action to confront the climate crisis and build a green and just world and New York City is leading the charge. Together with the Council, we have taken bold action to cut greenhouse gas emissions from all sectors as fast as possible, including requiring buildings to undergo retrofits, transitioning to renewable electricity, accelerating the shift to cleaner modes of transportation and creating green jobs. But there is more we can do, and we must take every opportunity to reduce greenhouse gas emissions for our city and for our planet. New York City is committed to achieving carbon neutrality by 2050. The fossil fuels used to heat, cool, and power our buildings are responsible for nearly 70% of greenhouse gas emissions in New York City. They also emit a wide range of air pollutants that harm the health of New, York, of New Yorkers, especially our most vulnerable. New York City has already been a global leader in building emission reductions, notably through the passage and implementation of the Climate Mobilization Act and its centerpiece, Local Law 97, which places targets on greenhouse gas emissions from existing large buildings. With the legislation being proposed here today, we can lead again. The next generation of buildings is electric. Setting ambitious targets for new buildings to be built without reliance on fossil fuels presents an opportunity for us to shape the future of our city and lead the world in developing the high efficiency electric buildings of the future. To meet our carbon neutrality goals, improve air quality, and create a city that is cleaner and greener, it is time for new buildings to be built without on-site combustion of fossil fuels. Gas or oil heating systems lock buildings into fossil fuel infrastructure for years to come, and those are years that we do not have to waste. All electric buildings are a solution to improving the climate and health of our residents. Buildings with efficient electric heating and cooling have existed for decades and are currently being built all over the world, including in New York City. The technology is reliable and functional, even in very cold weather. Cold climate air source heat pumps, the, the best available technology to provide high quality heating and cooling, provide clean electric interior comfort well suited to New York's weather. These systems offer efficient cooling, heating from temperatures below negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit and operate at more than double the efficiency of resistance or gas systems. These benefits to New Yorkers come with a reasonable price tag. The cost to construct a new all-electric building is relatively similar to that of constructing a new building that heats with gas, and because the building can be designed climate-friendly from the beginning, they avoid costly retrofits down the line as we race towards carbon neutrality. The International Energy Agency reports that globally almost 180 million heat pumps were used in 2020, and that to reach net zero emissions, heat pump use will need to increase significantly. The IEA has also noted the importance of setting a date certain when new buildings will be electric buildings in order to keep the world on what they describe as the narrow but achievable path to carbon neutrality by mid-century. Electrifying buildings to cut greenhouse gas emissions is also in line with recommendations by the New York State's Climate Action Councils. In 2021, the city conducted a, a conducted a study entitled Pathways to Carbon Neutral NYC in partnership with our utilities, Con Edison and National Grid. This study found that electrifying heating and domestic hot water systems can provide immediate emissions benefits in efficient buildings, even with today's grid, and that these buildings get greener as the grid gets cleaner. 
In 2019, thanks to the work of advocates and, and our partners at the state level, New York State passed the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. The CLCPA committed us to 100% zero emission electricity by 2040. And even today, before the projected increase in renewable electricity, a building drawing electricity from the grid creates lower greenhouse gas emissions and less air pollution than one burning fossil fuels on site for heat. Now, this change uh, is needed, but we are here to help. We are committed to working with building owners to provide them with the support they need to shift away from fossil fuels. We have already launched a number of programs providing personalized technical assistance and connecting building owners and operators with financing. The NYC Accelerator Program is a $33 million commitment to support a rapid transition towards decarbonizing our city's buildings, including electrification and other alternative technologies to reduce emissions from existing building systems. As part of that citywide effort, the Accelerator has expanded its training and technical assistance offerings to support high performance, new construction, electric buildings that will set a new precedent for the future of our homes, schools, and offices. We're also ready to support these changes with financing. Property assessed clean energy financing gives building owners access to loans with no upfront capital with payments that are tied to their property tax bill. I'm very pleased to share today that starting in January, thanks to legislation passed by the city council, PACE financing will be available for new construction of electric buildings. We believe this shift will continue to grow the electric building industry in New York, support the next generation of high efficiency buildings without fossil fuels on site, and would help developers and builders comply with introduction 2317. Now I'll speak briefly about each of the bills that are being heard today. Uh, intro 2317. We are excited to testify today on introduction 2317. This bill represents a major shift in how new buildings will use energy and provide heating and cooling, and we support this critical climate action. We are looking forward to working with the Council and all of the stakeholders here today to ensure that the bill is as, is ambitious as possible, while still being achievable for builders and developers throughout the city. Introduction 2191, uh, this would require a study to determine the feasibility of electrifying existing buildings. The NYC Accelerator does a lot of work to assist existing buildings in efforts to electrify and reduce their carbon emissions. We would like to continue to work with buildings to eliminate as much as possible their fossil fuels on site. Uh, the bill is currently drafted as this study to the long-term energy plan. Uh, we believe this is a critically important topic that warrants detailed study. However, the long-term energy plan is well underway, so we are happy to discuss with the council an alternative mechanism to get this work done. Introduction 2196 would require a study on the health impacts of gas stoves and a recommendation as to whether it would be appropriate to phase out gas stoves. Uh, robust research exists on the health impacts of gas stoves, and we support reproducing a report on, on, on this existing research, uh, both at the national and local level, and inclusive of any equity implications to inform policy recommendations and implementation in residential settings. Uh, to conclude, uh, we really look forward to working with the Council on leading, leading the way on this critical issue. Uh, thank you so much for holding this hearing chair. It's lovely to see so many people so passionate about this issue at this hearing today. And now I'm happy to answer uh, any questions. Uh, thank you, Ben. Your testimony is most appreciated. Uh, uh, we've been talking uh, um, all along on this bill. <clears throat> and so um, I'm going to forego questioning for the sake of my colleagues who may have questions and also to get to uh, our, our, our hosts of, 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 of uh, you know, you know, scores of people who want to testify. Uh, staff has, has just let me know that uh, we have uh, other council members on the Zoom, uh, uh, members of the committee. Uh, uh, council member Dharma Diaz is with us. We thank her for being here. Uh, council member Menchaca uh, are, uh, is, is here and uh, uh, council member Steve Levin, all members of the Environmental Protection Committee are here as well. Uh, uh, and so I, I, I thank them for their, um, for their attendance. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, 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 I'm, I guess I will pose one question. I'm sorry to, you know, sorry to kind of, uh, I'm giving myself a little, you know, latitude, <clears throat> but as, because um, it's a little bit uh, off topic, shame on me. Mm -hmm. uh, when I passed the first, you know, greenhouse gas reduction bill, the, you know, near, the uh, you know New York City Climate Protection Act of uh, you know 2008. 
that mandated a 30% reduction in, uh, in city generated greenhouse gases uh, in the city sector, that'd be city buildings, city fleets, you know, city facilities like sewage treatment plants and other things, a, a you know, 30% you know, greenhouse gas reduction by 2017. <clears throat> that was not realized. When we, and then two years after that deadline and you know, local law 97 was passed, that, that part of the, that, 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 that deadline in 2017 was changed from 2017 to 2025 with a 40% reduction. Um, <clears throat> this is one of the frustrating things about, you know, passing good bills and making sure that they make their way down the track. <clears throat> and so because we're talking about climate reduction, it sort of points out that sometimes we pass bills and they're, you know, difficult, uh, you know, difficult to achieve. And, you know, the administration itself, this administration, the previous administration has had difficulty meeting that and uh, uh, you know, you know, meeting that uh, mandate. So, where are we now, and how are we looking for forty percent by twenty twenty five? Because we missed the twenty seventeen, <clears throat> and this will be the only question I ask all day. That is a little bit off topic. I'm giving myself a little bit of you know latitude here um, to to ask that because <clears throat> you know the private sector is being asked to do something here, and the city hasn't lived up to what it was supposed to do, and so I. I I think it's important to tell people where we are on city reducing its own greenhouse gases. Um, <clears throat> and so how are we doing? Uh, like, are we on path for, um, uh, um, on target for 40% by 2025? And, you know, you can give a brief reply because I don't want to take too much time. Yeah, th thanks so much, Chair. And, and thanks for, for both passing that really crucial piece of legislation and, and holding us all accountable. I think we, we share the same goal of reducing emissions as quickly as possible. Uh, I didn't put it in as a goal. It was a mandate. It was, I, I fought to get that mandate. Everybody wanted a goal. Bloomberg wanted a goal. The council wanted a goal. I wanted a mandate. We got a mandate. Mandate's supposed to be a mandate. So what do we got? So, so we've been investing uh, billions of dollars to, to retrofit the city's uh, municipal buildings, to electrify the city's vehicle fleet, and we're currently seeking to, to build two new transmission lines that would bring clean and renewable electricity in order to power city government operations. Uh, at this point, we're on path to, to hit that 40% reduction by, by 2025, um, and I, I'd also love to have Anthony Fiore, who's joining me from the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, to, to add any additional uh, uh, context that, that, that he thinks it, it warrants. But we share the goal and, and we're on track to meet that that ambitious target. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, yeah, Anthony. Thank you, Chairman. I, I also would mirror Ben's comments about thanking you for that initial legislation um, so so long ago. And I think it was really um, uh, innovative and first of its kind. Uh, so let me just speak to the last kind of full year of emission reductions that we have pre-pandemic, that's 2019. Um, the, the investments that the city has made in its buildings has reduced those emissions 23%. That's compared to 18% in the private sector. So I do believe those investments have paid off. Um, we are leading the way here. That said, there's much, much more to do and we look forward to continuing a great relationship with you in, in getting us there. Thank you. I uh, thank you, Anthony. I do appreciate that. And now I'll give an opportunity uh, to any of my colleagues uh, who are um, on the Zoom to ask questions of the administration. So Samara, they're, they're supposed to raise their hand and you're supposed to handle that, right? Does anybody have questions for the administration? Oh. Am I am I am I muted? No, I'm good. I'm on. Right. OK, uh, Samara, am I to conclude that uh, no one has questions for the administration? Uh, I see Councilmember Member 11 uh, has his hand up. Uh, uh, I recognize Councilmember Member 11. Uh, Steve, you're muted. Hi, I'm unmuted right now. Um, okay. I had my hand raised before, Steve. Hey, Steve. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't know. Hey, hey, uh, I'll tell you what. Just um, in there. Um, 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 why don't we do this? Uh, uh, Samara, like rather than me being the shot caller on who has their hand up, like, you know, you're going to take care of that. Okay, Samara? Yeah. So, Levin, uh, Amphrey Sambo, and then Levin. 
Okay. Okay. I, it, 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 is, it, is, it is my privilege to recognize Councilmember Amber Samuel. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So I just have two questions. Um, one, does the city work with you, the utilities to understand? <laughs> does the city work with the utilities to understand if electrification supply can meet demand if more buildings go electric? And clearly I'm asking that question because we're constantly hearing that we don't have enough energy sources to even do this. And so I would like to speak on the work that the city is doing with the utility companies to talk about the energy supply. And my second question is, you mentioned financing options. Can you provide a little more detail about what's available come January and how? Sure. Yeah, thanks so much for both of those questions, council members. So first on the utility point, you know, this, the city and, and Con Edison work, work really closely uh, to ensure that the grid is, is, is uh, reliable uh, and resilient, uh, and we do that via direct conversations and also as part of Con Edison's rate cases where they, they plan their investments to, to accommodate the shift. Um, you know, based on, on our conversations with them, I believe they're, they're testifying today, so I don't want to speak for them, but, you know, we, we have a very high level of, of confidence that, that this type of shift towards uh, electric, electric heating, towards the types of deep carbon emission reductions are possible and consistent with the types of investment plans. I, I mentioned the, the Pathways to Carbon Neutrality study that we conducted in partnership with Con Edison and, and National Grid, and that sort of showed the way that, that with thoughtful and, and, and strategic investments, uh, the uh, building electrification uh, is possible and, and the addition of, of new buildings that are electric buildings is well within the, the capacity of, of, of our systems. So one additional point I would make is, um, you know, all new electric buildings that are highly efficient, uh, because um, electric heat pumps tend to be more efficient than conventional air conditioning. As you know, we have a, a, a what's called a summer peaking system, meaning you know our uh, uh, our grid uses the most electricity during the summertime when everyone is running their air conditioners. Um, heat pump systems are more efficient than conventional air conditioning, meaning that if a building is built all electric with a heat pump that provides heating and cooling, they actually create less strain during that during those summer months than, than they otherwise would. Um, and so that's just another piece of information that, that gives us a, a level of confidence here. Um, as to your second point, uh, the, the new type of financing available is called Property Assessed Clean Energy Financing. This is a program that was authorized by the state and, and, and authorized by the city council, and it allows uh, uh, developers to um, Take, take out a, a loan with no money down in order to provide uh, financing for that addi any additional costs that might come from, from building an all electric building uh, and, and pay those costs back on their property tax bill. So it means that the, the financing is less expensive than it otherwise would be. And it means that uh, if they sell the building, that loan travels with the building rather than with the owner, uh, making the, the terms much more appealing. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we think the, the costs at this point are about comparable between an all electric building and a, and a fossil fuel building. But to the extent that there is any sort of differential, we're, we're, we stand ready to, to provide uh, this, this, this category of financing to, to help folks uh, um, ease those costs. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Amper Samuel. Um, so, Samara, like, I should recognize Steve, but you should recognize him. I'll recognize him. Councilmember Levin should, has his hand up, so okay. um, if you um, call on him. Okay, uh, I recognize uh, my good friend Steve Levin. Thank you very much. Oh. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, uh, thank you uh, very much, Councilmember Amper Samuel. Um, uh, I feel recognized, so thank you. Um, um, my, uh, my my question is um, so just to just to, I, I think I heard you correctly, um, Mr. Furness, that um, so the administration fully supports. Um, the the legislation um, sponsored by Councilmember Amper Samuel 2317. Uh, yeah, we, we, we support the notion of, of creating a date certain after which all buildings would be electric buildings. We want to work together with the council and all the stakeholders here today to, to set to, to, to determine what the, that timeline ought to be. Uh, we want it to be aggressive, uh, uh, but also uh, achievable. And we're looking okay. forward to hearing all the, the testimony here today to, to, to craft that. Okay. I mean, as, as we all know, um, you know, myself, council member Amprey Samuel, um, you know, we're, we're, um, uh, leaving at the end of the year. And so this is a, a bill that it's a, it's a new term. The bill would have to be reintroduced. It would have to be, um, uh, you know, it would have to be reheard. 
um, redrafted the whole, you know, everything like that. So um, if, if it were not to pass in the next um, six weeks, so uh, is there a commitment from the administration to, um, to, to work to pass this legislation by uh, our deadline, which is like uh, really just a week, uh, a month from, from now? I think, thanks, Council Member. Uh, the answer is yes. You know, we, we, we think there's been an enormous amount of thought that has gone into this from a, a wide array of stakeholders, and we're really, really ready to, to roll our sleeves up and work to, uh, to get this done this year. And, okay. um, can you talk a little bit about what, um, what the administration is doing um, beyond uh, electrification for new construction and, and um, and what the administration is doing around renewables and um, incentivizing um, retrofitting on renewables, um, uh, um, uh, large scale renewables, so solar farms, wind farms, and and um, and and how um, we're seeking to um, uh, move to to. Uh, to outfit, you know, our, our aging housing stock. I mean, a lot of it is retrofitting. Um, so, so what's what's the um, strategy, the long term, ten year strategy for um, uh, for moving our building stock if it's um, if it's currently based on you know fossil fuels, moving it over to renewables. Yeah, thank, thanks so much for that, Council Member. So, so I would describe this as a sort of two pronged strategy. The first, as you identified. It's about uh, dramatically reducing the amount of fossil fuels that are used in our existing buildings, improving the of those systems, improving the efficiency of those buildings. Um, and you know, we we do that both uh, through the NYC Accelerator Program, which which provides a high quality technical uh, personalized technical assistance to buildings to help them bring come into compliance with Local Law 97, our really ambitious. Uh, 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 carbon emission targets for existing buildings. Uh, and, and we provide technical assistance for, for buildings that are subject to those laws and also a broader universe of buildings where improving their, their, uh, their efficiency, improving tenant comfort, reducing their energy costs and, and, and cleaning up uh, their, their building systems. The other half of that, as you mentioned, is even as we're shifting uh, away from fossil fuels, we also want to be making sure that our grid is, is as clean as possible. And that means embracing uh, every form of, of clean and renewable electricity that we can be bringing into New York City. So, you know, we've been working in close partnership with, with New York State uh, to, 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 to advance two brand new uh, transmission lines that would be directly connected into New York City to provide, to provide over 2,500 megawatts of clean and renewable electricity from wind and solar and hydropower that, that come from points north. Uh, we're also working with the state and the federal government to, to accelerate offshore wind, which will provide another major source of, of clean and renewable electricity. All this, even as we want to, you know, be dramatically expanding solar on roofs across the five boroughs, you know, another really important piece of the Climate Mobilization Act uh, was this requirement that new buildings should take a hard look at putting solar uh, on, on their roofs. And, 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 and we're, we've also been launching a, a new program called uh, Electrify NYC, which provides uh, support for uh, one to four family homeowners who are uh, interested in, in putting solar on their roofs and, and, and shifting to electric systems for, for their work. So what yeah. kind of support or what kind of support does that take the form? So it's 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 a personalized technical assistance to provide uh, everything that you would need to to put that on your roof. Um, we, we, we connect both with contractors and also with uh, technical support and, and financing that's available from the utilities. Or from I'm inspired. And then my last question is, is there any reason, and I, I apologize, Chair, just, just uh, last Steve, question. Oh, please make it brief. Very brief, last brief. question. Is there any reason why a new building sh should have or would need to have um, gas as a heating or cooling source? So, you know, I think for the overwhelming majority of, of new buildings, so the typical residential, typical office buildings, uh, we think that they're really uh, cost competitive uh, uh, electric options available. Now, for some types of uh, industrial facilities, things that are much harder to electrify, processes <clears throat> require very high amounts of heat. Um, we think that there's other low carbon technologies that are available to help produce some of that, but electrification might not be the, the choice right now. And uh, I know the council has had some, some thoughtful <clears throat> potential exceptions or particular treatments that they're looking to include in this bill. And we think those are, those are, those are thoughtful options too.
Thank you, Ben. Thank, thank you, you ben. very much, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, and, uh, uh, Samara, any other council members wishing to be heard or can I proceed to the next uh, witness? I believe you can, I believe you can, we proceed to the next witness. I think Gina wants to testify. Gina Boca. Uh, thank you, Samara. Uh, the Department of Buildings does not have separate testimony, but I appreciate it. Okay, well then, it's just for questions. Okay, uh, 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 you know, thank you, Gina. I, I want to thank you and all the members of the administration uh, who, uh, who have been our partners uh, thus far and will continue. Uh, and so thank you very much. And as we spoke and yesterday, you're going to have people uh, stay for the duration of the hearing to listen to every word of the testimony, right? Correct? That's right. Okay, great. Great, Ben. Uh, I'll be talking to you really soon. I'll be talking to you really soon, I am sure. <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to call our next witness. Uh, this is a, a member of the State Assembly, um, Emily Gallagher. Uh, I know her by reputation. I know that she is you know, deeply involved in the issue of uh, building electrification. Uh, many people know that uh, she is the next uh, witness. Um, you know, being that she is an um, elected official, I'm not going to put her on the clock, but I uh, hope that um, uh, she will be um, um, economical in her testimony. And with that said, it's my privilege to call um, member of the assembly, Emily Gallagher. Thank you so much, Chair. I'm really grateful to be a part of this hearing. And uh, I've taken into account your words about um, being economical, and so I am going to not read my beautiful poetry about um, the the climate crisis. Uh, I will skip that. I, I know we all know that. Um, so at the state level, we've responded to threats of the climate crisis so far with goals, um, but we really need so much action to be happening. And I'm really grateful for um, intro 2317 because I think this really sets the tone for the rest of the state. And if New York City can lead on electrifying all of our buildings, as well as the other, um, the other intros that we've been hearing about, we will be really able to move off the grid. And there are other, there's other smaller cities in the state that have done this already. If the New York has been working on this, and they've actually seen a decrease in costs for their, um, their developments, and it has been a very successful program. So I'm really excited to see what this, what innovation this will bring to our uh, city. And I think our city is really in a leadership role here. If we can pass this bill to electrify buildings at New York City's level of government, it's going to demonstrate to the entire state and the entire country that this is absolutely achievable. Um, so we, we absolutely need to pass this act. Um, over 70% of greenhouse gases and emissions are coming from buildings. They are the result of the use of natural gas as an energy source. And they're also a major cause of indoor air pollution. And um, the air quality in my district is very low. In Greenpoint and Williamsburg, we have very high rates of asthma. That is exacerbated by the indoor air quality of outdated systems. But with all of the new building that's happening, in my district and across this, this city, we actually have a really big opportunity to not just improve our, our life here on earth in terms of uh, the, the waterfront and climate, um, the climate catastrophe that we're facing, but also for personal health. So I am absolutely in favor of this. I strongly urge the New York City Council to pass this intro, and I will be following at the state level uh, to pass it across the state. I think this is one of the most important things we can do in the next two years. Uh, and I am really excited to see um, New York City be the first major city in the country to do this. So I think that concludes my thoughts. Um, 
just know that I am waiting for you all to do this so that I can really pack the punch at the state level and convince everyone that this is uh, the clearest way forward. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, 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 Ms. Gallagher. And, and uh, uh, you know, please give uh, my regards to my uh, environmental mentor, Steve Engelbright. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, um, whom I go back with to 1975 when I was in my teens and he was in his 20s. Um, <clears throat> that's how it all started and the rest is history. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, I've been told by staff not to call on people who want to question and not to call, you know, subsequent witnesses mm -hmm. because uh, um, Samara is supposed to do that. So I'll ask Samara if any members uh, have a council, uh, have a questions for the assembly member, and uh, if not, to uh, call the next witness. And uh, so, thank you again. Uh, thank, thank you again, Ms. Gallagher. Appreciate it, and good to, good to get to see you. Yes, yes, I look forward to it. Okay, you bet. Jim, I don't see any hands raised, so oh. I believe I can call the next witness, which is Dale Brick from the Regional Plan As Association. Hi, thank you so much. Can we actually have Chris Halfnight go first? Because my testimony is going to key off of his and he's going to go through the specific legislative language um, as you requested, Chair. And thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, 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 um, I will state, Samara, that I don't I, I don't have any um, uh, I don't have any problem with that. I don't have any objection. Thank no you so much. We're Chris trying to Halfnight. consolidate. Chris Halfnight. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Gennaro and committee members. Thank you so much for holding this hearing today. Uh, I'm Chris Hafnett. I'm Director of Policy at Urban Green Council. We're an environmental nonprofit working to reduce the carbon footprint of buildings. Um, as Dale mentioned, my testimony today is aligned with, with the environmental groups who follow, namely RPA, NRDC, and NYLCV, and AEA. Um, and with the Chair's permission, I'm going to take just a, an extra minute of my colleagues' time to quickly hit on a few of our recommendations. Uh, it, uh, first of all, uh, um, I don't see the clock running. Um, is the clock running? Uh, Samara, is the- Yes, sir, the clock is yes. running. Okay, the clock is running. I'm really not a fan of like one council, one witness yielding time to another. And so um, uh, I'll, I'll give you a few more seconds on the clock, but I, I uh, you know, the standard Understood. is like two minutes per witness, and so let's do that. So put a couple of seconds back on the clock, and you know, because once I stop making exceptions, it gets to be a whole thing. Understood. I'll move quickly. So Urban Green is dedicated to an ambitious, equitable, and affordable transition for New York City buildings from fossil fuels to clean electricity. I'd like to frame my testimony with four key facts. First, boilers, furnaces, and hot water heaters emit more carbon in New York City than all uses of electricity accounting for 40% of our citywide emissions. These systems are our primary climate challenge. Second, heat pumps are so efficient that they save carbon today, even with New York City's dirty electricity grid. Third, research will release in December shows our grid is ready. We have room to grow building electrification now. And fourth, the additional upfront cost to build all electric in New York City is small, about 2% right now for multifamily buildings. That's why Urban Green supports intro 2317, and we recommend some important changes, and I'm gonna quickly focus on two. First, we recommend phasing in the requirements, starting with buildings up to seven stories in two years, and then adding buildings with eight or more stories in five years. We recommend this approach because electrification is easier in lower rise buildings, and it's ready to go. Above seven stories, system design becomes more complex. And the biggest challenge is domestic hot water systems in the large residential buildings. There are limited equipment options on the market today, and there's minimal industry experience designing and installing efficient all electric hot water systems to meet the needs in those buildings. So an ambitious but reasonable phasing will yield a better result. Equally important, this phased approach allows time for planned updates to tighten the energy code. That's how we can ensure that new construction is not just all electric, but also highly efficient, which means lower utility costs and, and increased affordability. My second point today is that electrification is much more challenging for existing buildings. I'm excited. So for uh, me- I, 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 What I'll do is I'll give him a few more seconds because I ate up some of his time. So uh, 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 please carry on briefly. 
Um, uh, Chris. Thank you very much, Chair. For major renovations to be included, the law, we recommend that the law have a clearly defined and high threshold where renovations present similar electrification opportunities to new construction. And if major renovations are not included, we urge consideration of how city government can lead by example with an electrification requirement for major renovations of city owned property. In our written testimony, we also recommend lowering the CO2 emissions limit to address fuel blending, adding electrification ready requirements and adding more detail to make exceptions in the law limited and justified. Thank you very much for the opportunity to comment. I'm available to answer any questions. Uh, thank you. And, 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 uh, and uh, you know, for sure, I will, um, you know, read in detail your full written testimony that goes for uh, all witnesses. Uh, I do have a question uh, with regard, um, you mentioned fuel blends. Can you um, expand upon that a little bit? Certainly. So the, the bill currently sets a, a carbon emissions limit on combustion, and that limit is just below the carbon dioxide released from combusting natural gas, right. which means a zero emissions fuel like hydrogen blended with natural gas, even just a very, very small amount of blending would push the, the emissions below that limit and unintentionally unlock the ability to install fossil fuel equipment in a building because technically uh, you could combust blended fuel in that equipment and not exceed the emissions limit. And and you are and, and you and, and and you favor that or you don't favor that? Uh, I think NRDC is going to speak more directly to that, but we okay. do favor being cautious because uh, there are a lot of unanswered questions about uh, renewable fuels or blended fuels, and we think that uh, taking that step should be uh, very uh, be done with eyes wide open. And right now, it's it's sort of an from our view an unintended uh, consequence of the current structure. Uh, but, but it, you know, if something meets a standard or it doesn't, right? And so if we're doing this via, and, you know, and the reason we're doing it via standard because people essentially have a right to hook up to a gas, you know, because that's, you know, that, you know, you know, that's a power given to people from the state. So we're, you know, we're, 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 we're doing this tricky BTU standard. <clears throat> um that we're you know allowed to do and um so would you propose that there be some study of that or or you know absolutely. like how would we handle that in your opinion absolutely i think it's a very important issue to look at going forward um our uh perspective right now is that we shouldn't open that door until it's better examined and we're certain that that's a direction we want to go for new construction in terms of enabling fossil fuel equipment okay uh uh to be continued and i know you said that uh nrdc is going to talk about that right absolutely okay uh so um uh, thank you uh uh thank you chris uh um uh, samara are there any uh, any other um uh, you know, council members that wish to ask Chris a question. I don't see any hands raised. Okay, well, let's call our next witness. Well, the next witness is um, Dale Brick, unless she doesn't want to testify now. I'm sorry, you want to um, testify? council member Ambry Samuels has a question. Oh, okay. Okay, council member Ambry Samuels has a question. I think it's the placement of my hand in my picture box. Um, but just real quick, everything that you just stated, Chris, is that inside of your testimony along with the recommendations that were made? Yes, it is very much so. It's it's expanded in the testimony. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. All right. Now, Dale Brick. Thank you so now. much. And apologies for that. Uh, hi, I'm Dale Brick. Uh, thank you so much, Chair and Committee, for the opportunity. Um, speaking on behalf of Renewable of a Regional Plan Association, RPA is an independent organization that does research and analysis to inform good public policy, such as the policy you're developing right here. So uh, our goal, as I think you've heard from many already, and I hopefully from everyone here, is that we have to be ambitious, we have to meet our climate goals, we have to be pragmatic or it's not going to work, and we have to center equity and make sure that we're making uh, sure low income and affordable housing is at the front of the line, not the back, uh, as we decarbonize our building sector. And we endorse all of the um, 
the adjustments that Chris just went through, and you'll see the details on that in all of our testimony as we hand it in. And we think that with those changes, this bill is going to deliver on those goals um, that I just mentioned, being ambitious, pragmatic, and equitable. I want to just touch on some of the context here, because I think it relates to the questions, including the one you were just discussing. Um, and that is the state law that the assembly member and others have mentioned. We have climate legislation at the state level that requires that the electric grid clean, is cleaned up, that we get to 70% renewables and 100% carbon-free electricity. And we will ensure that that, uh, that electricity is there and available to serve the heating needs of buildings in the city and throughout the state. So there's been a lot of, I've heard a lot of pushback in conversations from stakeholders that we should wait until we finish decarbonizing the electric sector before we even uh, really take bold action on buildings. And we absolutely cannot do that. If we do that, we will then have to retrofit all the buildings later. We'll have all of these sunk costs in a continued expanded gas distribution system. And those will be stranded assets that customers will have to pay for. Uh, so we feel very strongly that we need to do in tandem the building sector and the power sector. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dale. Always a pleasure to uh, to see you. Uh, you know, we'll be continuing our our, our uh, you know conversation as we go forward. Uh, I'll ask Samara if anyone has questions for Dale, and then if not, we'll move forward. I don't see any hands up at the present time. Uh, thank you, Dale. And uh, uh, if you call our next uh, next witness, please. The next witness is Donna De Constanza from NRDC. Ooh, I think I'm unmuted. Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, Chair De Niro, Council Member Ambry Samuel and members of the Environmental Protection Committee. My name is Donna DiCostanzo and I'm Eastern Regional Director for the Climate and Clean Energy Program at the NRDC, an environmental organization that has been advocating for clean energy policies and programs in New York for more than 50 years. And we really wanna thank the council for its leadership here and especially thank Chair De Niro for his years of dedication and longstanding legacy on these issues. <clears throat> Efficient electrification of building systems is the best, cheapest way to deliver the health, climate, and jobs benefits of a net zero green energy economy to all New Yorkers. But we need to do this in a way that is as ambitious as feasible, prioritizes disadvantaged communities, and improves affordability. NRDC strongly supports Intro 2317 and moving it forward as soon as possible and supports the recommendations of Urban Green Council as well as detailed earlier. To reach the goal of equitably decarbonizing New York City's building sector, we'd like to highlight just a few important points. So first, new buildings are of course easiest and cheapest to make all electric and highly efficient. We shouldn't be putting dirty fossil fuel systems that last decades into our new buildings. The more gas infrastructure we build now, the longer all gas customers will be saddled with the expense of stranded assets. And just wanna highlight the importance of continuing to prioritize energy efficiency in addition to electrification. Saves people money on their utility bills, increases grid resilience, and makes it easier and cheaper to meet additional power needs and meet our renewables targets. Now, going to uh, low carbon fuels, which was mentioned earlier, so-called renewable natural gas or biomethane, which has been put forward as a building decarbonization solu solution in various contexts, is a dead end solution for buildings. There isn't enough of it now or expected for the future. It's too expensive and we need to use what little there is sparingly and strategically for hard to electrify sectors, not buildings. In addition, and most importantly, it also produces the exact same toxic air pollution as fossil gas. Similarly, boosterism for green hydrogen in, bu in buildings is diverting attention and expired. from electrification. We need all new pipes to distribute it and new equipment to burn it. And it's also a risky solution to decarbonize buildings relative to proven and readily available high efficiency electric heat pumps. So happy to provide additional information on these points, specifically on these issues, and just really appreciate the opportunity to testify today and look forward to working with the council uh, to advance this policy. Thank you, Donna. I gave you a couple more seconds because you served for many years as the council, uh, as my council, uh, you know, to the committee on um, environmental protection. You served with great distinction. 
and you've gone on to, um, you know, to become a, you know, national leader on environmental issues with uh, NRDC. Uh, I'm very grateful, for, uh, you know, to see you and to have the benefit of your views and for all of the, you know, interaction that's gone on uh, between, uh, you know, in, between you and, you know, my staff and the central staff of the council. So a, 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 a privilege to be here with you today. Uh, I don't have any questions because we're going to talk, uh, you know, down the road. Uh, uh, Samara, any 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 questions for our um, um, uh, council alumni? Um, right? Did I say that right? Alumni or whatever? Um, uh, our council alum Donna. Anyone have a question for her? I don't see any hands raised. Okay. Uh, so with that, we'll thank Donna once again and uh, look forward to speaking with her and call our next witness. The next witness is Samantha Wilt from NRDC. So sorry, Chair and members. Um, Donna spoke for I'm starting now. You need to un. Samantha Wilt. I'm so sorry, Samara. Donna testified. We just didn't know who was going to be available. So I cede my time. Thanks. Oh, okay. Uh, um, thank okay. you, Samantha. You're ceding uh, your time. The next witness is Carlos Castell Croak from the New York League of Conservation Voters. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Carlos Castell Croak. I'm the associate for New York City programs at the New York League of Conservation Voters. I'd like to thank. Chair Gennaro and Council Member uh, Amprey Samuel for the opportunity to testify today. Buildings are the number one source of emissions in New York City, which is why building emissions have been such an important policy issue over the past decade. However, we've only seen building emissions decrease 18% from the year 2005-2019, meaning that we are not on pace to meet any of our citywide emission reduction goals. New York City must implement ambitious legislation and programs to fight climate change, and a bill like Intro 2317 will help us get there by requiring a phase out of the use of fossil fuels. This legislation is important because building electrification will not only reduce emissions and fight climate change directly, but will also create tens of thousands of clean, green jobs. An overwhelming majority of clean energy jobs in New York are in the building sector, mostly due to policies and programs like this that focus on clean electricity and energy efficiency. We can rapidly increase the number of green jobs with policies that scale efficiency and electrification. Building electrification will also let us utilize local renewables for fuel and keep our energy dollars in New York State's economy. However, building electrification will not be an easy task. It will require thoughtful and pragmatic policy that considers multiple different variables, including the rate of technology advancement and lead times needed to implement a new way to build buildings. Therefore, we agree with our colleagues at Urban Green Council, NRDC, and RPA with the following list of recommendations for intro 2317, which I'm not going to read, but Chris said them all. Um, we also support the passage of intros to, uh, 2091 and 2196 to help us study the feasibility of electrifying existing buildings in order to further decarbonize and to study the health impacts of gas stoves so they can fully understand how important electrification may be not only to climate change, but to public health. Thank you. Thank you, um, Thank you very much, Carlos. Um, uh, are there any questions for Carlos? <clears throat> not seeing any hands up. Okay, well, let me... Let me thank Carlos and the lead conservation voters. I have a you know long-standing relationship with that good organization. Uh, and then actually, we have people kind of broken up into panels, uh, and so uh, that uh, you know kind of concludes our first panel. And uh, uh, Samara, so I, 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 and so the next uh, you know, next four witnesses would constitute the next panel, so to speak. Uh, I don't want to read out all their names, um, uh, but uh, um, Samara will take care of that. Uh, but with that said, uh, I, 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 I yield to uh, Samara, who will call the first witness of the next uh, um, of the next panel, which uh, you know consists of four witnesses. Okay, so the next witness is Santos Rodriguez from the Building and Construction Trades Council of Greater New York. 
Thank Time you starts much. now. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Council Members. Good afternoon. I am Santos Rodriguez. I'm here to testify on behalf of Gaia La Barbara, President of the Building and Construction Trades mm -hmm. Council of Greater New York and vicinity, in opposition to Intro 2317. Uh, 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 Santa, oh, okay. Yeah. I just, I just want to make sure the clock was started. It, it just started. Uh, please okay. continue. The Building and Construction Trades Council is an organization of local building and construction trades unions that are affiliated with 15 international unions in the North American Building Trades Union. Our local unions. Uh, our local union affiliates represent approximately 100,000 construction workers. The building trades mission is to raise the standard of living for all workers, to advocate for safe work conditions, and to collectively advance working conditions for our affiliates, as well as all workers in New York City. We agree that climate change is real and that we must act to reduce carbon emissions. However, we must pay attention to details to ensure that we are acting prudently and not just acting so that we can make headlines. We need a policy that will successfully transition us to renewable power economy. Intro 2317 will not successfully accomplish its intended goals in our city under the timeline proposed in the bill. Pardon the phrase, but you can't simply flip a switch. This transition simply won't happen overnight just because we want to. We're opposing intro 2317 because the existing buildings that would be impacted by intro 2317 are not designed to convert to high performance electric systems. Additionally, high performance electric power systems are not fully proven in large buildings. Aside from difficulties, this, building impo this bill imposes on buildings operations. It should also be noted that electric power grid in our city is already stretched and stressed. Our city is no stranger to power outages and such an, an occurrence would have an even greater impact in electric buildings and a multi-day power outage would render those res residents uninhabitable. Similar to those, similarly, it does not appear that anyone is considering the impact Time policy expired. will uh, have on uh, the cost. Uh, 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 please finish your sentence, Santos. Thank you, we'll have a, co a cost on electricity. This bill will impose significant cost increase on the residents of an all electric building. Uh, for this reason, it must be prudent that we're charting uh, the course of our future. We need bigger bridges to get from where we are to where we wanna mm -hmm. be. We need, we need a just, tran just transition. We oppose 2317 because it's bad policy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, and also uh, I've been, uh, 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 thank you Santos. I've been, uh, I've been notified by central staff that the best way to proceed regarding questioning would be to wait for all of the members uh, of the panel to testify, and then we can visit the panel with questions. This came in Tamara from, uh, yeah, it came in from central staff to me. So why don't we uh, follow that protocol? Let me just, uh, I'm also, uh, in, in, um, the central staff is feeding me uh, information. Um, I I, I think I've just been texted that council member um, Ulrich is here as well. Yeah, I hope that is the case. Uh, happy to recognize him. <clears throat> and uh, so we will, uh, I, I will, I'll, I'll do what I'm told and I'll, I'll follow the protocol of having the uh, four witnesses from this panel uh, uh, each give their uh, statements and then uh, you know, um, council members can question uh, whomever they wish in this four-person panel, and we'll keep that protocol for successive panels. Um, this is coming right from staff to me, Samara, so I guess we're going to do that, okay? Okay. So there well, you go. We're, just, we're figuring this out uh, as we go along. We're one <laughs> happy bunch of people trying to figure it out, and so... Um, so we, uh, so I thank you, Santos, and then uh, we'll have the three other uh, witnesses from this panel. And once we get to the end of the panel, uh, we'll open up the panel for questions from members. Thank okay. You, the next witness is Charlie Samboy from the Building Congress. Oh, good I'm afternoon. Now. Good afternoon, Chair Gennaro. We have a much larger submission, which we will submit uh, online for your reading. Uh, to be brief, we support the intent of the bill to enhance the air quality that we breathe. However, we do not believe that this bill has been written in a manner that explicitly accomplishes that objective. 
and could have uh, tremendous consequences on our building industry. First, uh, this intro seems to ignore the status and complexity of bringing the entire energy grid onto a source that is much cleaner than fossil fuels. Much of New York City currently relies on burning of fossil fuels and requiring that new or modified buildings convert to electric in the timeline that the bill calls for simply will divert the burning of fossil fuels further upstream. Uh, earlier this year, the governor announced uh, two projects that will bring 18 million megawatts of energy down to New York. However, those projects are not slated to come online until 2025 and 2027 for each of those. Uh, secondly, the bill may have un unintended consequences given the broad application to new buildings and existing buildings that may go under that may undergo renovations. Uh, without an appropriate phase-in period for different building types and sizes, we think the existing energy grid will be taxed and will not provide for readily available technologies or cost-effective met methods to be implemented. We believe a sound approach would be mandating for smaller single or multifamily buildings of a certain size and then scaling that to much larger and complex buildings over time. Uh, lastly, uh, we, we support a greener city. We support uh, resiliency efforts. However, we continue to believe that this bill as written uh, does not provide us with enough direction to be able to accomplish its goals, uh, accomplish its stated goals. Again, we will submit testimony for your reading uh, at a later point in time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Samboy. Uh, uh, please stay on until the uh, um, um, end of the panel and uh, uh, we will come back for questions if anybody has uh, them for you. Uh, Samara, next up. The next witness is Philip Skalaski from the Durst Organization and the New York Energy Consumers Council. Time starts now. Hi, thank you, Chair and committee members. I'm Phil Skalaski. I'm the Senior Vice President of Engineering and Energy Services at the Durst Organization and the Co-President of New York Energy Consumer Councils. Uh, I'm supportive of the bill. However, I believe that significant changes are needed. Local law 3217 should provide for hybrid heating options and an exemption for cooking gas and residential units. Heat pumps can heat buildings reliable, reliably only at milder outdoor air temperatures above 32 degrees Fahrenheit in modestly humid weather. When paired with natural gas condensing boiler systems, which can provide efficient heating at low outdoor air temperatures, a hybridized heating system would result in a more favorable solution that is economical, reliable, and sustainable. Limited use of backup boilers would not on, only add significant amounts of greenhouse gas, would not, I'm sorry, would not add significant amounts of greenhouse gas and would reduce pressure on the electric grid during, week, during winter peaks. It would also allow for important redundancy for providing heat in the case of electrical outages. We believe market drivers, including Local Law 97 penalties will serve to curb the use of natural gas, and we are open to exploring how usage limits can be set and regulated. There should also be an exemption for cooking gas in apartments for the following four reasons. Carbon impact of gas cooking is minimal. Very little energy is involved in cooking with gas. And until the grid becomes greener, electric cooking will increase carbon. And four, the electric cooking systems available today are lacking and will further increase carbon. Based on a case study of a 560,000 gross square foot multifamily residential building, the carbon impact of gas cooking is minimal at only 40 tons per year, which equates to approximately 7.5% of the building's total energy usage. Electrifying cooking will result in an additional 24 tons, of year, 24 tons of carbon per year. This increase would remain a carbon penalty in the, until the grid becomes 40% cleaner than 2024. Time expired carbon coefficients. Uh, get, just real quick, the, uh, the electric cooking systems are not the same as heat pumps. They use resistance electric heating and they don't have the same efficiencies as heat pumps. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Skolaski. Um, please stay on for uh, questions. The next witness is Demos Demopolis from Demopolis. Teamsters Local. Yeah, Demopolis. Demopolis. Time starts now. Thank, thank you very much. You did very well. Uh, thank, uh, I want to thank you and good afternoon, Chairman Gennaro, committee members, council members, and assembly members, and uh, 
everyone else in the audience. I'm here to speak in opposition to the bill as written. Uh, intro 2317. Uh, My name is Demos Demopoulos. I'm Secretary, Treasurer, and Executive Officer of Teamsters Local 553 and Secretary, Treasurer of Teamsters Joint Council 16, representing 120,000 Teamsters throughout the city of New York. Intro 2317, as it stands now and if passed, will have a harmful effect on working families and an industry that is made up mostly of small or medium sized family owned businesses who have been serving customers in the five boroughs and providing good union jobs with excellent pay, pension, and medical benefits for their families. Since 2012, the industry has been working hard to re-engineer its fuel and make heating oil cleaner by blending biodiesel, which is a drop-in fuel that can replace conventional heating fuel without expensive changes to customers' heating systems. We have helped the industry any environment by lobbying in the past to lower the sulfur content in heating oil. And now with blending of biodiesel will further the goal of using a cleaner fuel and protect the environment. We urge you to consider this and not pass this intro 2317 legislation and protect Teamster families. And I just want to add because uh, uh, Chairman Janow may mention back in 2008, uh, we were instrumental in, in working with him to lower the sulfur content, not only at the city level, but also at the state level. And we achieved that along with the industry. So thank you for that, Chairman Gennaro. Uh, 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 thank you very much, Demos. Yeah, I remember when we reduced the sulfur and, uh, uh, you know, number four fuel and it was um, and all the work we've done together on biofuels. Uh, it, it, it's been uh, um, it's been great. And uh yeah, and, and so, uh, you know what, uh, uh, Samara, I, I, uh, I've got a question. Um, so I'm going to, um, um, I'm going to address my question to Mr. Skolaski of the Durst Organization. <clears throat> um, you know, uh, Philip, you there? I wanna make sure Philip's there, yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah. I'm here, yep. Okay, <clears throat> um, uh, you know, we've heard testimony, uh, you know, uh, earlier in the he in the hearing um, about the efficiency of, uh, of 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 like the new breed of you know heat pumps, uh, uh, so to speak. Uh, we heard Ben Furnish in the mayor's office or somebody, uh, you know, talk about them being, uh, you know, working in you know in in below zero temperatures, uh, and you uh, you know indicated in your testimony that below thirty two degrees. Um, uh, there's a real efficiency drop off if you could if you could speak to that. Sure. So heat pumps are essentially using outside air to pull the heat out of the air and push it into the building, right? So right, yeah. So so, so what you have is what you have. So so if, if you have zero degree air, you're trying to take heat out of zero degree air. Um, you know, which can be done like you know, there is heat in any air above you know above absolute zero, of course. Um, but it just becomes harder to get at. I think that's your point, right? It becomes a lot harder. And if you look at the efficiency curves of heat pumps, as you get lower temperatures in humid climates, you start freezing the outside condenser. And then the outside condenser has to be defrosted. And it uses a, a, a defrost method to actually defrost that, which uses even more energy. So your efficiency numbers go way down when you get to very cold outdoor air temperatures. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, very, very high efficiency above certain outdoor temperatures, but as you get colder, yes, they still work. They do work below out below zero. They are, they are capable of working, but they get very inefficient at that point. Uh, let me ask you this. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, if you're with the Durst organization, I don't know how far flung the, the, you know, the Durst organization has buildings and what cities they have them in or whatever, but, you know, perhaps you're aware uh, or, or maybe you have knowledge of, you know, other cities that have, you know, are climate pretty much um, um, and um, um, are these systems being installed uh, in large quantities in cities that you know roughly have you know New York City's temperatures I, I'm not talking about Chicago that's really cold I'm not talking about you know Washington you know DC which is a little warmer but places that are about uh, you know our our uh, um, you know the, the temperatures that we have in the winter here in New York, there are presumably other cities um, um, where, where you may know whether or not there is a deployment of uh, you know, heat pumps. I, I can't speak to buildings outside of the Durst organization. We're more tri-state area, New York City centric. 
Right. Um, but that said, yes, heat pumps are much easier to deploy uh, in southern, you know, southern areas, less, less, you know, where we don't get into, you know, multiple, you know, multiple freezing days at a time um, below 32 degrees. It does, it does get deployed, but um, yeah, I, I, I can't speak for the other climates, but okay. again, um, I, the, COPs I, I, of, the COPs of, of heat pumps go way down when you get below a certain temperature. And some, you, you need to look at the efficiency curves of these issues and these, uh, these units. And until the grid is completely green, it doesn't make sense right now in some cases. Uh, and, and, uh, and I'm uh, not saying I'm not saying on 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 you know warmer temperatures, and that's why I'm looking right. at a hybridized option. Yeah, I, 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 I Ampri Samuels has a question. Uh, Chairman, oh, sure. Council yeah. Member Ampri Samuels has a question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, can, can we, I mean, I, I'm just finishing up my questions, and then, okay. I'll, then, then, then we'll then we'll get to her. Okay. Uh, is is that a, yeah? Okay. So yeah, let me just kind of finish up here. Uh, and also, um, Mr. Skolaski, you're, you, you know, you, um, you, you mentioned a lot about, uh, uh, you know, cooking systems and like the tonnage of carbon that goes up, uh, uh, you know, this is all in your written testimony, I would, I would presume. It is. Yes. Okay. So we'll be taking a close look at that. Also, you know, because you're in the industry and you deal with, uh, and a lot of entities, um, you know, you know, trade associations and whatnot. Um, uh, um, are you familiar with any trade association that that represents heat pumps? Is there a trade association that represents that industry? I'm kind of wondering why they're not here. I mean, if I were them, I would be here. Um, I mean, so I, there, there are many manufacturers out there that represent heat pumps. There are, uh, I don't know about trade associations. There is a trade okay. association and they're here. Oh, they're here. Okay, very good. Okay, so I look forward to that. And then I have my final, uh, and uh, uh, Santos had to go, but I do uh, have a question for, uh, for, 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 uh, for Demos. Uh, Demos is my understanding, you know, based on uh, conversations with staff that, um, that um, uh, you, you know, you, you testified against the bill upright. Um, uh, it's my um, understanding by talking with the mayor's office and talking with staff uh, that, uh, that, that that bio heat blends, you know, greater than, you know, 20%, uh, greater than B20, you know, B30 uh, would meet the current standard in the bill. And if we were to have, um, uh, you know, bio heat, uh, because it, it, it does at higher blends, B20, B30, uh, you know, meet the standard, you know, what would that do to your, um, uh, you know, if that were the case, uh, you know, what would that do to your, you know, perception of this bill if bioheat uh, were to be included? Uh, as far as we're concerned, it would, it would be a, a great improvement. Uh, thank you. See, I, and I, I, and I, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Also, I think someone earlier, forgive me, I forgot his name, testified to some degree that uh, if bio uh, fuel was introduced in it, it would lower the, uh, it would meet the requirements, if I'm not mistaken. I, I mean, it's certainly a, 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 um, one of the things that, um, you know, is going to be a, you know, debate that, you know, rages between now and when we, you know, come to closure on this is, um, you know, what we do with, fuels like bioheat and, uh, and, and uh, you know, so-called sustainable natural gas. And so, you know, that is going to be a, uh, a topic for sure. But I um, uh, just want to let you know that I haven't forgotten about bioheat. We've come a long way with New York City on bioheat. And um, we will continue that discussion. And with that, Samara. Uh, may, that, may, I, may I one more thing? Sure. Okay, so uh, what was just discussed about the heat pump not being efficient enough in colder temperatures, you may recall that when uh, gas interruptibles were put into a lot of the buildings where uh, uh, the building was supplied with heat and hot water by gas, but at a certain temperature, the oil was kicked in because the gas was unable to supply the heat and hot water needed in the lower temperatures. So I think what uh, uh, the gentleman was speaking about that was pretty much the same idea. 
that okay, severe well, temperatures, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and when that happened uh, a few winters back where it got severely cold for a stretch of time, the oil companies were unable to uh, uh, make the deliveries to get to the buildings in time because a lot of the supers didn't rely on having the oil tank full in case there was severe weather. They let right. them go down and because the, they were just relying on the gas, but when they needed the oil, they turned the switch on, it wasn't there. Right. So everybody was calling at once. So the industry handled it, we got the job done, but uh, if we're in a severe stretch of cold weather, it could be a problem for many tenants. Thank you, Demos. I appreciate that. And uh, with, 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 uh, uh, I want to thank all the members of this panel. Uh, I know Samara. So am I going to recognize uh, 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 Council Member uh, um, Amprey Samuel? Should I do yes, that now? Yes, please okay. recognize yes. Council Member okay. Amprey Samuel. Council Member Amprey Samuel, thank you for your patience. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. At this point, like my, my, my soul is burning right now, right? Um, and, and I just wanna go just, just, just Demos, you just said, you know, you talked about folks, you know, with, with, with heat and, you know, being cold. And, you know, I represent the highest concentration of public housing in North America. And my residents are always cold, right? And so yes. as we're having this conversation, I'm trying to figure out, I keep hearing a no and like opposition to the bill and it's easy to say no, right? The hard part is coming up with how do we get to a yes? What are the solutions that are accurate and factual? And, and, I'm, and I'm just saying that because I represent a district right now. And if you heard in my open testimony, you know, we, we're suffering here, we're dying. And so to just talk about jobs being, you know, like the, 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 the detrimental impact or, or unintended consequences related to jobs, I'm talking about, you know, how do I represent communities that are dying because of unintended consequences or intended consequences of diesel buses being sent to Brownsville in East New York, right? We don't have a good history in this city of showing up for people that don't have a, a, a true voice. And so with my bill, I am trying to hear and listen for suggestions on how do we get to a yes, right? That, that's what I'm looking for. Not the, you know, and thank you Santos, you know, for your testimony, but I, I, you know, I heard opposition, I heard, you know, climate change is real, but you know, the transition is off, the timeline is off. Okay, but, but what part of the, the bill and the transition would make sense for you to agree to it, right? That, so that's where I'm coming from with this conversation. And then, you know, um, Chair, I uh, again appreciate the, the hearing itself, but I would love to see a balance in who's testifying because that's also helpful in being able to, to kind of go back and forth and having a discussion as to one person said this, and well, this is my suggestion to what that person just said. It's just helpful to have that type of dialogue. And uh, one last thing, um, heat pumps work in New York City. I'm working with organizations that are testifying today, right? Um, they work in New York City. They're, they're working on heat pumps across the state of New York. We're having conversations about the pumps right here in Brownsville with the Nehemiah homes. And so to say that they're not and that they don't work is just, just inaccurate. And so um, I'm gonna just end that there because there was a lot that was said with this panel. And again, it just kicked up my, my, my blood. And um, I just wanna have a real conversation about how do we get to a yes? Um, I'm gonna jump in first and uh, I, I'm gonna jump in first, Demos. Uh, 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 first of all, council member, we, we, we went through great lengths with staff to make sure that there were, uh, and I'm not gonna worry about the clock right now. Uh, that, that, that there were, uh, you know, that there were, you know, panels in favor and panels that either had issues or were in, you know, opposition. And this is part of the back and forth. And you'll see that as we roll through the hearing, um, that's the approach that we're taking. We have people that are, you know, strongly supportive, people who are, you know, against and people who have issues where if we did tweaks, it would be it would be better, and I'm just trying to, you know, elicit information. I went back to Demos and said, "Hey, you know, like, 
you know, you know, you were at a no. And if bio was part of the equation, where would you be? He said that would be better. And so this is, I think, part of the of the you know dynamic that we're trying to do here. Uh, you know, people have their opinions. Uh, people have their well, not, you know, you know, you know well, that, was a, that was a point of my that was a point of my statement right now. Yeah, you know, people had their opinions. So I just wanted to I wanted to put it to context because yeah, my it, testimony it, was said, you know, said a little something. But I want to put it context. The, you know, where I'm coming from to just put that out there so that hopefully the next panel, again, this is not my committee, but just hoping that the next panel will have a balance so that we're doing this. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean yeah, no, I mean, what, what we do is we normally panel like-minded, you know, people who are sort of like coming from the same orbit. And so we had like, so the first panel was very pro, you know, this panel was not so pro, let us say, and then like the next panel, they're going to knock your socks off, trust me. You know what I mean? And so you're going to be feeling great about yourself. I'm here and for so, it all. I'm here okay. for it all. Okay. I just jump in there. Yeah. No, I mean, this is why this is why everyone, you know, likes working with you, you know? And so, um, you know, you just come right out with it and, you, you know, it's, it's just, it, it's, it's, it's wide open throttle. And so that, that's, uh, that's great. I'll give, uh, uh, and I'll give Demos the last word on this and then we can proceed to the next panel. You're going to love, Council Member. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Again, I want to thank you because yes, the introduction of the or uh, uh, more of use of biodiesel fuel uh, will be cleaner, will meet requirements. And as far as uh, buses go with diesel fuel exhaust, that's a maintenance issue. A lot of these companies, uh, and maybe even the city itself, uh, don't maintain the bu the buses diesel engines as much as they should, that would eliminate all that smoking and all that diesel. There's all kinds of things they could do, but certainly uh, besides maintenance, the burning of a cleaner fuel will also do it. And I, I guarantee okay. you that. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you. Okay, I, I, think we're, I think we're good to move on to the next panel. Is that, is that okay, council member, we good? <laughs> it's just show. No, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, you know, <laughs> You're the sponsor. I want to work with you. I'm like your client. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm like, uh, I'm, I, 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 uh, you know, I'm trying to bring all perspectives in and, and like these people signed up. That's how it works. And so thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Next panel. Okay. Samara. Okay. Um, the next panel starts with Zachary Steinberg from the Real Estate Board of New York. And he will be followed by Whoa, 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 wait, wait, a, wait a minute, wait a minute. I think uh, I think you're missing the fourth panel that starts with uh, We Act for Environmental Justice. Oh, sorry. Uh, the fourth panel, excuse me. The fourth panel uh, starts with Sonal, Sonal Jessel and, uh, from We Act and also Annie Cafaro from We Act. And then we have Lonnie Portis from We Act. Then we have Pete Sakura and Rachel Rivera from New York Community. Yeah, that, I, and, and you know, let me just jump in for a second uh, for just like a point of order regarding Pete and Rachel. Uh, you know, I read the testimony that came in from Pete and um, he is he's kind of like sharing his testimony with Rachel. They're kind of like doing it together. So we're gonna make a little accommodation for the last two witnesses on this panel. So like the two of them will have four minutes combined. They're kind of teaming up on their thing. They have it, it's almost like a play. They have two different, you know, you know, he starts and she goes and he starts. It's all part of the same testimony. So we have a total of five witnesses, and the last two are sort of coupled, so to speak. So Pete and Rachel will be kind of you know, doing a four-minute thing between them. Okay. And I want to accommodate that. Okay. And so all with right. that said, let us commence. All right. So now Jessel. Thank you. Thanks, uh, good afternoon, Chair Gennaro. Thank you for the opportunity to, to testify regarding intro 2317. And thank you to Council Member Ambry Samuel for your championship of this bill. My name is Sonal. I'm the Director of Policy at We Act for Environmental Justice. Over the past 32 years, We Act has been combating environmental racism in Northern Manhattan. I'm here as a co-leader of the Gas Free NYC Coalition. Uh, we are championing Introduction 2317 because we believe it is important to prevent future indoor and outdoor pollution that hurts our health. Building pollution contributes greatly to poor air quality in New York City. 
It is communities of color that have older, under-maintained buildings that are energy inefficient, leading to more exposure to air pollutants that hurt our health. Higher rates of buildings in communities of color, and importantly, public schools, are still even using dirty fuel oil that must stop uh, very immediately. <laughs> Introduction 2317 focuses mainly on limiting natural gas emissions. The use of natural gas emits dangerous air pollutants, such as NOx, that directly leads to respiratory and cardiovascular diseases. A 2020 report found that children are at the increased risk of illness from gas stove pollution, and their increased risk is at 42%. We need to see a bill that reduces emissions limit to 25 metric tons of carbon, includes major gut renovations, speeds up the timeline, and reduces exemptions such as for commercial kitchens. Commercial kitchens are a major source of neighborhood air pollution, one of the top sources in New York City. I want to underscore that reducing greenhouse gas emissions does not mean losing sight of other co-pollutants that consistently plague communi communities across the city. So far, no testimonies have even touched on local air quality as a motivation for the bill. The comments promoting hydrogen blending, biofuels stating gas stoves are zero emissions is doing just that. NOx pollution from natural gas from stoves, uh, as well as SO2, PM2.5, and other pollutions from energy sources have direct respiratory impacts and that needs to be centralized. Um, additionally, we need to see leadership from our city. City-owned buildings should be in first in line for decarbonizing and electrifying. We must not see big buildings, such as public schools, get new gas infrastructure starting now. They must not be exempted in this bill. Um, and even the biggest schools right now in New York City are getting new gas infrastructure and they're all in communities of color. And that is directly related to local air pollution and health impacts. I'd also like to quickly rebuke some of the points by public testimonials stating that a grid isn't ready and that heat pump technology doesn't work in New York City and point to the mayor's uh, office statements at the beginning that say exactly the opposite. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you very much. We appreciate your testimony. And like we did with previous panels, uh, we'll wait for these. Uh, we'll wait till the end of this panel and then we'll revisit the entire panel with questions. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, Samara, please call the next witness in this panel. Samara. The next witness is Anne. Annie Kafaro from We Act for Environmental Justice. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair, Chairman Gennaro. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Annie Kafaro, and I'm the climate justice organizer at We Act for Environmental Justice. Uh, and I'm going to continue our testimony as part of the Gas Free NYC Coalition in support of Introduction 2317. Um, which, as Sono mentioned, will address local air pollution that disproportionately harms communities of color. Um, a 2021 study confirmed that racial ethnic minorities in the United States are exposed to higher PM 2.5 pollution associated with residential gas combustion, and in certain instances facing 32% higher exposure. This has led to disparate health outcomes for communities of color, which experience higher rates of respiratory diseases like asthma. We must improve air quality in more vulnerable communities, especially as summer months continue to break record highs and trigger dangerous respiratory responses that lead to hospitalization and premature death. There's an opportunity here to ensure that neighborhoods like Inwood, Jerome Avenue, East New York, East Harlem, that are hit first and worst by air pollution and climate change, see development that is all electric and improves the air quality for the residents who call these places home. In the absence of global and national leadership after the COP26 climate summit, local governments with global influence like New York City can lead by example for cities around the world. That is why we must pass intro 2317 and accelerate its implementation timeline to one year after enactment. A delayed timeline will lock in decades of new fossil fuel infrastructure, which we simply cannot afford. In order to further strengthen Intro 2317, we must also lower the threshold of the air pollution limit in the bill from 50 kilograms of CO2 per, per BTU to 25 kilograms. This will prevent the use of biomethane and hydrogen blends and eliminate any possible loopholes in the law. We must also include a clear definition for gut renovations. Um, additional recommendations put forth by the Gas Free NYC Coalition will be included in my submitted uh, written testimony along with other um, partner organizations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we'll come back for questions. Uh, Samara? The next witness is Lonnie Portis from We Act for Environmental Justice. Time starts now. 
Hi, I first want to thank uh, Cheryl Gennaro for his leadership and dedication to electrifying New York City school buses, buses, and now for the opportunity to testify on the matter of building electrification. Um, I'm Lonnie Portis, the Environmental Policy and Advocacy Coordinator here at WEACT, and routinely analyze New York City policies and programs for equity and climate justice, and support a group of community members mobilized around environmental issues in Northern Manhattan. The bills being heard today, intro 2317, 2091, and 2196, all move us forward in the right direction toward equitable implementation of Local Law 97 and mitigating the negative environmental health hazards caused by the, fossil, by the use of fossil fuel energy. Uh, my colleagues and Gas Free NYC coalition members have already testified on the need to pass 2317. I want to add that the city needs a actionable plan for the city's existing buildings and homes. And this is why it's so why we support intro 2091, mandating a comprehensive and holistic study of building electrification. The data and recommendations that would come from this study will be essential in accelerating the equitable implementation of Local Law 97 uh, with the emission reduction goals of 80% by 2050. Uh, we do recommend that the scope of the study be widened to include opportunities for and pathways to equitable um, electrification. Moreover, 20, intro 2196 is a study of the negative in health impact of gas stoves will acknowledge on public record the harms and dangers associated with cooking with fossil fuel and catalyze a plan to further protect the health and safety of New Yorkers. Electrifying gas appliances would address the 52% increased risk of children experiencing asthma symptoms associated with gas stoves. Such indoor population dis uh, disproportionately affects community colors and low-income households uh, with similar uh, across the city. Uh, the study uh, should need to be broken down by race and neighborhood to ensure environmental justice and making recommendation. It is important to highlight and recognize the importance of electrifying buildings and homes, but also remember that these, effect, these efforts will happen simultaneously with the transition to clean, renewable energy production, electrical grid moder moder modernization, and expansion of community solar. Uh, Time expired. Reason, uh, we act uh, for environmental justice supports 2317, 2091, and uh, 2019. 96. Thank you again, Chair Gennaro, Environmental Protection Committee. Thank you, Lonnie. We'll come back with questions. Appreciate it. And we had a good time with that bus thing. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, the next witness is Pete Socorro, and he's going to be sharing with Rachel Rivera. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thank you very much for having us. My name is Pete Sakura. I'm with New York. Uh, I, I just want to make sure that I just want to make sure that for the sergeant to set the clock at four minutes because Pete's going to be sharing his testimony with another witness. That's as per my reading of his testimony that I got last night. And so um, so we're going to do four minutes for you both combined. OK, Pete? Yes, Chair. Thank, thanks very much, Chairman Gennaro. And thanks for holding this hearing. Uh, my name is Pete Sakura. I'm with New York Communities for Change. And I'm with Rachel Rivera, who is also one of our member leaders. Um, NYCC is part of the Gas Free NYC, NYC campaign. and we are not funded by the fossil fuel industry or the real estate industry, uh, unlike some of the entities that you've heard from before. We are here to pass, uh, to urge you to pass intro 2317 before the end of the year and strengthen it so that it takes effect in one year on all building types. We also urge you to include gut renovations defined as Alt-1, which is major alterations. Intro 2317 fights climate change and creates clean energy jobs. And there's no time to waste here in the climate crisis, as you've heard. The bill fights both inequality and climate change at the same time. New York City faces an existential threat, and there's no time to delay. So we appreciate your strong focus on this. I want to echo the administration's testimony about the real world here, which is in contrast to what I saw from the industry, which is complete this right here. All lies. All lies. Our testimony includes... Um, links to almost 80 building projects. I would urge you to. Uh, I, 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 would, I would urge you to focus on the veracity of your own uh, testimony. Yeah, well, we're rebutting what they just said, which is a whole bunch of misleading or outright untrue statements. I could go through them one by one, um, but frankly, it's like playing whack-a-mole. Um, none of it makes sense, and the administration. Uh, laid out the practicality and affordability of this legislation, as well as its feasibility. And we agree with them. This should get done right now. Um, and Rachel Rivera's story uh, illustrates why that's the case. But before we do that, because I'm a little worried about technical difficulties here, I want to again point out that in the real world, heat pumps are working, geothermal is working, and we've supplied you with lists of almost 80 building projects that are either passive house 
or fossil free that are large. You're gonna hear from a lot of experts uh, after us, including Columbia University, Alloy, the Architects, Block Power, and on and on and on with individual experts who are actually doing this work in the real world. So we urge you to follow their advice, pass this bill right now. And now I'll ask Rachel uh, to speak about her experience, which illustrates why this is so necessary. Thank you. Okay. Hi, my name is Rachel Rivera. Uh, I am, I, I live in uh, Brownsville. My family lost everything to due to Hurricane um, Sandy. Uh, then my, also, my family also lost everything in Puerto Rico uh, due to Hurricane Maria. Um, during Sandy, I was home at bed which was in a red area, a red zone. Um, I, I heard a cracking noise. I went to my daughter's room, took her out of the bed because I got scared. As soon as I took her out of the bed, my ceiling caved in. I would live on the last floor. So the whole room and my ceiling caved in onto her bed. We lost everything. Uh, at the time, my daughter was only six years old. Uh, we fled into the night with nothing. We were in the, in the shelter system, which was like a, a evacuation center for people that was uh, victims to Hurricane Sandy. Um, months later, uh, Hurricane Maria hit. Uh, that we lost everything in Puerto Rico. The family that I had living in Puerto Rico. I also lost a family member, family friend, um, because he drowned. They found him after the uh, the flood waters receded. To this day, me and my daughter suffer PTSD from the storms. Uh, when Hurricane Irene Ida or Irene Ida hit New York again, we suffered PTSD. My daughter now is fifteen going on 16 and she was scared to the point that she came out to say, mommy, are we gonna to survive this one? Are we gonna perish like everyone else? So I, I am one of the victims that lived in it. And I wanna also thank you for passing the local law 97, but due to all I'm so sorry for my background noise. It's that I'm running outside. Um, my daughter, I have to run to my daughter's school, so please excuse my background noise. But again, okay. thank you for passing the law 97. Now it's time to pass this bill 2317. Again, thank you, and please do not waste time on passing these laws because it, it reflects on our future, unlike people like myself and my daughter and my kids. Thank you again. Thank you, thank you very much. And, uh, uh, and no problem about the background noise. Um, and I, I have some comments for the uh, uh, panel. First so, uh, with uh, Ms. Uh, Jessel, I, I, uh, I, I thank you for uh, you know, bringing out the issue of local air quality. Uh, you know, I knew back in 2008 when I was passing the, you know, New York City Climate Protection Act um, and, you know, reducing CO2 in the city. There is no way to reduce CO2 without reducing NOx, SOx, PM10, PM2.5, carbon monoxide, uh, you know, ground level ozone, uh, okay. all of the other so-called, uh, you know, criteria, air pollutants. Uh, it is one of the main reasons why I passed that bill in the first place, because by regulating CO2, it gave me the ability to regulate the you know, criteria air pollutants essentially through the back door. Um, and so uh, that is an important point that you made, and I do appreciate that. Um, uh, Ms. Carforo, um, your testimony was very pointed and, and very specific about language and changes that we ought to do, and I think it's you know, uh, you know, that kind of specificity is a model for the sort of testimony that we are, um, you know, looking for. Uh, Bonnie, a, 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 a great friend, thank you also for being very specific. And, um, and, and Pete and, and Rachel, I certainly appreciate and admire uh, 
uh, you know, your, 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 your passion, your, you know, perseverance on making sure that we, you know, do get a good bill done before the end of the year. And this is why I'm doing this bill completely full time until now, until the end of the year. So I didn't have actual questions. I just wanted to make, you know, comments uh, uh, um, about your testimony and that it is, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, certainly, you know, much appreciated. And we'll continue this dialogue um, with WEAC and with, uh, you know, New York Communities for Change as we go down the road. And with that, Samara, does anyone else have any questions for this panel? Right now. Um, okay. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, if I could, Samara, I um, we've been here a while. I need about I I um, I need a two minute recess, and I will um, I'll be back inside of two minutes, and then we'll call the next panel. Uh, in the meantime, you can call the names of the. Um, of the next panel just to get them ready. And I promise to be back within 120 seconds in order to, uh, you know, continue. Okay. I just need a brief, okay. uh, a brief recess. Okay. Um, the next panel is Zachary Steinberg from the Real Estate Board of New York, Josephine Zurica from the American Council of Engineering Companies, Sarah Baya from the Magnuson Architecture uh, and Planning, Mark Ginsberg from uh, um, AIA, I guess. Those are the next witnesses to testify. Reason. I got to get something else to put on. Okay, Samara, I am back. Thank you, everybody, for the recess. Sorry to uh, impose. Um, are we all teed up? Tamara, are we, is the next panel ready to go? Yes, the next panel is ready to go. Uh, I called them and they were, um, they, right. Uh, again, Zachary Steinberg from the Real Estate Board of New York, Josephine Jureka from American Council of Engineering Companies, um, Sarah Baya from Magnuson Architecture and Planning, and Mark Ginsburg from uh, AIA. Should I begin? Uh, 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 is Zachary ready to go, and Sergeant? Yes, the clock is ready to go. You can begin. Thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing. REVD supports the goals of intro 2317, but believes that changes are needed for the proposal to succeed. This is the case because policies around building electrification and the elimination of on-site fossil fuel combustion have trade-offs and raise many critical issues that need to be balanced. 
Key issues include the ability of the electricity system, including generation, transmission, and distribution to provide reliable low emission power to buildings, efficiently securing emissions reductions, and allocating costs that result from the higher, higher cost of electricity. Unfortunately, the current proposal raises significant concerns on each of these points. Those are explained in our written testimony. We think these risks can be mitigated by thoughtful improvements to, to the bill. These improvements include the following. A phased in effective date that better accounts for the cost and effectiveness of efficient electric based systems, the reality of the electricity system and cities need to grow our housing supply. Revney believes an appropriate phase in would be 2025 for buildings under three stories and single family homes, 2027 for all buildings under 10 stories and 2030 for buildings over 10 stories. This has numerous advantages. First, in requiring small buildings to go first, it reflects the reality that heat pump technology is already cost competitive and proven in these buildings. As electric heat pump systems are less proven and more costly for taller buildings, and particularly for domestic hot water and shared dryers, this phase in would give time to ensure product manufacturers provide high quality cost competitive systems for these buildings. This would help to avoid buildings utilizing inefficient electric systems like electric resistance heating that would quickly overburden the grid if used widely. Rebney believes this suggested time frame will allow more efficient and reliable heat pumps to become more readily available for the larger scale buildings. Second, it would align uh, better with other aspects of state and city policy like the energy code and local law 97, and it would give more time for on-site storage systems like batteries, which are finally on the verge of being approved to be used in buildings. Finally, this phase in approach allows for electrification to better align with the greening of the grid, which as we've talked about previously in this hearing will allow for a much more holistic approach to eliminating fossil fuel emissions. We also would support the imposition of an electric- Time expired. Uh, please finish your sentence. We also would support the imposition of an electric ready requirement on buildings constructed prior to the full effective date of the law to ensure that those buildings built in the interim could be more easily converted over to electric systems. And we would encourage a focus on new construction rather than uh, major renovations of existing buildings given the many challenges that arise from trying to do this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I uh, uh, appreciate your testimony, Zach. Uh, please stay on uh, and we'll do questions at the end of the panel. Uh, Samara? Josephine Zurica. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Gennaro and members of the committee. My name is Josephine Zurica. I'm a principal at Dagger Engineering and chair of ACEC New York's Energy Code Committee on whose behalf I am appearing today. I'd like to start by saying that ACEC New York supports the goals of intro 2317, but we do have recommendations for improving the bill. We're in agreement that the bill should apply to new buildings. However, the intent of the bill as it relates to existing buildings needs to be clearly defined. It should reference an accepted definition from building and or energy codes to define the applicability of the law. Um, depending on the applicability of the bill, the level of challenges and recommended timeline for application to existing buildings should be revisited. We support intro 2091 as a measure to study the challenges of electrifying existing buildings. In addition, we propose a phase in uh, for the bill. Um, the, we are concerned that the absence of a phase in could result in many buildings using electric resistance heating rather than heat pumps, which would tax the grid and result in an increase in short term emissions and operating costs. Uh, an appropriate phase in we believe would be for new construction uh, for buildings three stories or less residential two years from the enactment of the bill and a later date no sooner than 2027 for all other buildings. Um, in addition, we recommend uh, that within two years of enactment all new construction be should be constructed to be electrification ready meaning that the building has been built in such a way that the conversion to all electric can be done without major changes to the building. We also recommend that the city should commission a study by an independent third party to evaluate the preparedness of the electrical transmission and distribution infrastructure and whether it can support electrified building stock increases the bill will cause. The study should analyze any infrastructure investments that are needed along with the costs of such investments. Time expired. Uh, uh, thank you, Josephine. Uh, did that complete your statement? I can give you one more sentence if you had one more sentence to go. No. Okay? Yep, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Samara? 
The next witness is Sarah Bayer from Magnuson Architecture and Planning. Time starts now. Thank you for allowing me to speak in full support of intro 2317. My name is Sarah Bayer. I'm an Associate Principal and Director of Sustainability at Magnuson Architecture and Planning. We focus on affordable, supportive, and senior housing in the greater New York City area. We are the architects for three new buildings currently in construction that are all electric and another eight all electric new buildings that are in design. This represents a total of 1500 units for both private and nonprofit developers. Many of our affordable and supportive housing renovations are also converting their old combustion systems for heating stoves and hot water to heat pump and all electric systems. The vast majority of our recently completed projects have all electric heating and cooling systems as well. Often heat pump systems do not cost much more than unhealthy and inefficient combustion equipment and has a coefficient of performance many times greater than fossil fuel equipment will ever have because it does not generate heat, heat pumps move heat around. We typically pair heat pump systems with a building enclosure that is slightly more energy efficient than current code, which currently reduces owner's operating costs and therefore from a more realistic life cycle, like life cycle perspective is a wiser choice economically. It is important to note that the refrigerant in these systems must be managed properly to ensure their high global warming potential of them are not inadvertently released. If we empower building owners and operators with the right tools, this can be done. Yeah, Thank you very good. much for your statement. We, we certainly appreciate that. Stay on for questions. Samara, next witness. The next witness is Mark Ginsburg. Time starts now. Thank you for allowing me to speak in strong support of Intro 2317, banning fossil fuels and new construction. My name is Mark Ginsburg, FAIA, an architect with Curtis Ginsburg Architects in Lower Manhattan, a member of the American Institute of Architects, and a former president of the AIA New York chapter. My practice's major area of focus is affordable, sustainable housing in New York. Climate change is the existential issue of our times. Some have said that electrification will add cost to affordable housing. It will add a little capital cost, but significantly lower operating costs over the life of the building. We have completed four multifamily passive house projects with two more in construction and a number in design. These buildings reduce energy consumption 50 to 70% below a code compliant building meeting the city's objectives of 80% carbon reduction by 2050 now. More importantly, our first two all electric buildings are two months away from completion and we have five more in design and three boroughs for private developers and not for profits. If we are doing this now, I see no reason why others cannot. These buildings will have a much lower carbon footprint when they open, and in 2040, when the state has mandated a clean grid, they will be net neutral. I would add this legislation follows in the footsteps of 60 localities in California and the city of Seattle. This legislation is a cost-effective and straightforward way to move us towards the low carbon future we need to get to as fast as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... Thank you very much. I, I, I appreciate all the testimony of this panel. I found it very specific, very um, um, and, and very helpful. And I would urge uh, you, um, everyone on this panel to make sure that we have your full statement in writing so that we can continue to ponder that. Um, and, and there will be you know, ongoing discussions between um, our staff and everyone on this panel and all of the panels. And so uh, I, I, I know that the, um, that the sergeant or someone had said at the outset for people who want to submit their testimony, um, um, why don't we repeat that again for the purposes of uh, making sure that people submit us their written statements. Whoever said that, I think it was a sergeant who came on and began to test the beginning. Yes, of yes so uh, you can send your testimony to testimony at council dot nyc dot gov we have a slide up on the zoom so anybody can see it okay uh, 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 thank you sergeant and uh, with that I, I thank this panel very much and i want to ask uh, uh, samara if there are any questions uh for this panel from any council members who are in attendance i do not see any 
hands up presently. No hands oh. up. Okay, I, I certainly do once again appreciate this uh, uh, good panel of um, you know dedicated experts and um, uh, and we're ready for the next panel tomorrow. The next panel is um, Ben starts with Ben Prosky of AIA and then Daryl Zarilli Dan, of Columbia. Dan, Dan Zarilli. Uh, Dan, Daniel Zarilli of Columbia. And then Keith Leonard Kitch of Block Power and then Sadia Hoke of Nyperg and then Mega Hearn of Nyperg. So okay, thank you. Starting with Ben Frosky. Time starts now. Heard I'm Ben Prosky, who is executive director of the American Institute of Architects. Uh, and you have heard from some of our members. Uh, we represent public and private sector architects who are passionate about buildings, uh, about building more sustainable city. AI New York strongly supports overall uh, intro 2317, which would stop new and retrofitted buildings from being powered by fossil fuels. Architects, as you've heard, have been designing fossil fuel free buildings in Europe, East Asia and many other parts of the country for years, even in our own city. We just heard some examples um, ranging from new construction, uh, high rises in Brooklyn to even uh, NYCHA's electrification program for existing buildings. Yet many public and private building owners in the city remain uh, insistent on continuing fossil fuel use. A mandate uh, is needed to move our city towards electrification of buildings. Eliminating fossil fuel use in buildings and transitioning to electric power would have many positive effects. Since most New York City's carbon emissions originate from buildings, cleaner power would mitigate climate change and improve air quality. Electric power provided by renewable uh, sources such as wind, solar, and geothermal uh, is also more reliable. A few years ago, our state's utilities company instituted a gas moratorium illustrating how limited supply of fossil fuels can be manipulated against the public's interest. Lastly, fossil fuels are incredibly dangerous. Too many New Yorkers have been killed or permanently injured from gas fires and carbon monoxide poisoning. Gas, gas puts architects, tradespeople, firefighters, and others at risk, and threat uh, of the risk becomes greater in violent storms and increasingly, that increasingly disrupt our city's gas lines. So while this bill would cover many buildings in the city, most existing buildings will not be impacted by these requirements. Additional action should be taken by the city council and the DOB to mandate replacement of outdated and hazardous equipment Time expires. and adoption of safe carbon-free technology across the city. Thank you. Thank you very much for your, for your testimony, your statement. Uh, please stay on and we'll have questions at the end of the panel. Zarelli. Time starts now. Good afternoon. It's um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank Chair Gennaro and all the members of the Environmental Protection Committee for this opportunity to testify in support of Intro 2317. My name is Dan Zarelli. I'm the Special Advisor for Climate and Sustainability at Columbia University. M much has already been said about the climate crisis that's already arrived on our doorstep. In fact, at Columbia, we've led the way in understanding this crisis. Uh, it was our scientists at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory that first coined the term global warming based on the observations that they recorded. <clears throat> now we're marshalling all of our capabilities to address this challenge. Last year, we made an extraordinary commitment to confronting the climate crisis, creating a world leading Columbia Climate School, the first new school at the university in 25 years. Our commitment to this crisis shows up in our labs in our classrooms and we're walking the talk on our campuses as well. The university in, in recent years has dramatically decreased its greenhouse gas emissions through ongoing investments in renewable energy, building retrofits, electric vehicles, shifts in commuter behavior and composting of organic materials and building on prior work Columbia released in uh, April of this year, our plan 2030, which is our roadmap to, to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 or sooner. Most relevant to this hearing, just this past September, coinciding with Climate Week, Columbia University announced it will no longer install new fossil fuel connections in any new construction, refresh, or renovation projects on our campuses. 
to support this transition, we're already in the process of evaluating how to, how to fully electrify our campus by replacing the on-site combustion of fossil fuels with clean, renewable energy sources. This work may sound challenging, yes, but it's feasible and it's necessary. By ending the expansion of fossil fuel infrastructure on our campuses and pursuing electrification, we're taking the necessary steps to align the university with the goals of the Paris Agreement and the city to clean the air in our surrounding communities and end the world's addiction to fossil fuels, um, all part of our commitment to empowering the next generation of climate leaders on our campus. Um, so we applaud the council and council member Amphrey Samuel for taking on this important challenge and putting forward intro 2317. It's feasible, it's necessary, and, uh, and this is how the city is going to achieve its goals and avoid the worst consequences of our climate crisis. Thanks again for the chance to testify. Thank you, Dan, appreciate that. And we'll, we'll come back with comments and questions. The next witness is Keith Leonard Kitch of Block Power. Time starts now. Good afternoon, my name is Keith Kinch. I'm the general manager and co-founder of Block Power. I'm a supporter of Intro 2317. Block Power is a clean tech startup based out of Brooklyn that makes buildings energy efficient, utilizing software to analyze finance to lower costs for building owners. Last week, we were in, it was announced that Block Power will be helping the city of Ithaca remove every building off fossil fuels. Um, as we think about where we are now in this city, uh, we still battle a healthy economic crisis. The question we have to ask ourselves is, how do we move New York forward? How do we make sure we move forward health-wise and economic-wise? And quite simply, the answer is not putting gas in new buildings. Um, the issue is around first health, health across the board for all New Yorkers, but more importantly, health for New Yorkers in low to moderate income communities, especially children and those with seniors that have asthma or other issues with their air quality. When we think about this conversation about why we're moving from one type of entry to another, it's not new. There's a time long ago where people argued over wood chips over oil. People like putting their hands over the fire and not using oil and it worked. And then we know what we did. We made billions of dollars of investment in oil and we came off wood chips. Then we had the same conversation a couple of decades later, gas to oil. How would it work? How would we put gas into a building? We like oil, we like to see the oil go in the building. You know what we did? We made billions of dollars of investment and we built gas lines and pipelines and now we have gas and oil in our buildings. Now we're having the same conversation on electricity. The answer is still the same. We need to make billions of dollars of investments, private and public sector, to make sure our grid is renewable and to make sure the air is clean in our buildings. Now, this isn't an idea that is made up yesterday. The idea of heat pumps not working is not real. Right now, as I'm talking to you, block piles installing heat pumps in Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan, the Bronx. For those who are in Queens, council member Janeiro and others, there's a veterans post in Queens that is currently working to install heat pumps in their building. I'm pretty sure we don't tell our veterans, hey, we don't want you to have clean air. Please have natural gas all the time to serve this country and move forward. We can set up a visit for you to see that. Time expired. My last point is that my last point is very briefly. I, make the last I, point, please, please. My please, last point please. briefly is that I thank you for your time, sir. I think to your to the other other panelists' points, you've done a great job uh, your entire career, even before the council. I uh, work like this, so I'm happy that you you took time to do this, and happy that you work with Council Member Abby Samuels. I appreciate it. Oh, of uh, of uh, uh, of course, of course. Thank you. <laughs> no problem, man. Yeah. The next witness is Sadia Polk from Nyperg. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Sadia Hawk, and I'm the chairperson of the board of directors for Nyperg and a CUNY Brooklyn College student studying biology and biochemistry. Thank you, committee chair Gennaro, for the opportunity to testify. The need to pass in show 2317 is urgent. We are already seeing extreme weather in New York City from climate change. Reports regularly come out warning that if we don't take immediate and dramatic climate action, things will only get worse. Yet the Glasgow Climate Summit has ended with reviews including weak and falling far short of what scientists say is needed. New York City's leadership on climate change can shape US policy and now it must. We're depending our futures on it. The policy decisions made by the New York City Council now will impact my future more than my parents or yours. Intro 2317 will combat climate change, cut, de cut, cut deadly air pollution, reduce gas explosions, and promote environmental justice. Burning fossil fuels for heat and hot water in New York City buildings contribute to poor air quality and over 1,000 premature deaths every year, particularly among communities of color. 
By stopping new gas infrastructure from being built, intro 2317 will prevent millions of metric tons of climate pollution from heating the climate and making people sick. Shifting New York City's buildings away from fossil fuels will also reduce the risks of deadly gas explosions. Gas explosions in the Bronx, Harlem, and the East Village over the past few years have been deadly, destroying whole buildings and displacing dozens of families. We, we believe the bill can be made stronger in two specific ways. This bill has a two-year enactment for new buildings and gut renovations. We believe that's too slow and enactment should be changed to one year after passage. We also urge you to amend the bill so that it clearly covers gut renovations. Just like with new buildings, that's the best moment to go fossil free. The fact that the world's leaders are falling short on climate action is even more reason for New York City to lead the charge. Please pass intro 2017 without delay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your testimony. New York uh, Public Interest Research Group. Meg? Meg? I'm on you. Oh, hi. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Megan Ahern. I'm NYPIRC's program director. Um, and just to follow up on Sadia's testimony, I just want to underline two points, which are the specific changes we think need to be made to the bill before passage, which is to um, move from a two year after passage enactment to one year. And um, sorry, I just lost my place for a moment. Um, no. There we go. So, um, no. As we're hearing today, there are already, um, we think it's practical and, afford and possible and affordable to move from two years to one year, because as we're hearing today from expert after expert, there are already fossil free buildings and projects in New York City of all sizes and types, from skyscrapers to low income housing being developed and built all electric. And NYSERDA is showing through their bids that construction costs, counting subsidies for projects have now effectively equalize costs. And thanks to high energy efficiency in these new projects, people pay lower utility bills. Um, we also urge you to amend the bill so that it clearly covers gut renovations rather than um, the other, the definition that's currently in the bill um, for major uh, renovations. This is the perfect time to go gas-free when everything but the shells and joists are replaced, just like as for new buildings. Um, and there's a longer list of changes to the bill that we think would be really smart to make in our written testimony, which we're submitting now. Uh, I just wanna also underline that the costs of not passing intro 2317, what are they? Um, Superstorm Sandy caused $19 billion in damages to New York City and damaged over 300,000 housing units from flooding. I'm expired. Okay. Uh, please finish your sentence, please. Sorry. Um, thank you. And uh, after Hurricane Ida, the MTA alone estimated 100 million in damages from the storm. A deteriorating air quality is resulting in more costly emergency room visits, illnesses, and deaths. Um, and uh, heat and frequent severe weather will increase demands placed on the city's infrastructure from damage to a mass transit system to sewage overflows from increased precipitation. So please pass Thanks. intro 2317 without delay. Thanks so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> um, uh, regarding this good panel, uh, I, 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 you know, long work with uh, 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 NYPERG for, you know, many, many years. And, um, uh, and uh, you know, Dan and I go way back. I want to, um, you know, thank Dan for his partnership um, over the years. Uh, you know, early in Mayor Bloomberg's tenure, uh, you created the um, uh, you know New York City panel on you know climate change for a limited scope of work that was going to look at city infrastructure. It came into existence, did its job, went out of existence, um, and I thought it was wise to kind of bring that you know panel back uh, to uh, put that in law and to um, uh, 
uh, and to widen its scope from just city um, infrastructure to um, uh, um, communities um, across the city that were uh, suffering from, you know, climate injustice. And, uh, you know, Dan was a big part of um, us figuring out what the New York City on, uh, on you know, climate change was going to be uh, in that bill. And so I want to take this uh, opportunity to give a public shout out to Dan for, you know, all he did for the city when he was working for an all this partnership. Uh, with me and, uh, you know, regarding everyone else on the panel, um, Ben, Dan, Keith, Sadia and Meg, um, I appreciate your testimony. And as Meg just said, uh, she's going to be, uh, you know, submitting her testimony in, in, in writing. And I hope everyone else uh, does that. And uh, with that said, I am uh, grateful that this panel has shared the benefit of its good views with us. And I'm ready for the next panel if there are no questions tomorrow. I don't see any questions. So the next panel uh, is um, Rocco Lesertosa from the New York State Energy Coalition and Michael Tronzo from the National Biodiesel Board. Uh, 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 I've got... Um... Uh, Floyd Vigara and Stephen Dodge of the National Biodiesel Board as well. Are they not testifying? They are not testifying. Okay, fine. Okay, well, let's do it. Okay. Thank you, Chairman Gennaro and the rest of the committee members for the opportunity to testify before you today. My name is Rocco J. Lasertosa, and I serve as the Chief Executive Officer of the New York State Energy Coalition, NYSEC. NYSEC serves as the voice of the renewable biodiesel and heating oil industry in New York City and Long Island. Today, I would like to focus my testimony on intro 2317, sponsored by council member Amprey Samuel. Amprey Samuel. Uh, since 2012, NYSEC has worked tirelessly with our state and local partners to ensure a cleaner and more re renewable liquid fuel was being used in buildings throughout New York City and state. Beginning with the Bloomberg administration, we have worked to phase out dirty fuels in New York City with the goal of having all heating oil at a B20 or 20% or higher level by 2034. In order to achieve this goal, the biofuel industry has invested tens of millions of dollars in infrastructure in New York to ensure that there is a larger and more accessible supply of biodiesel for New York customers. Next year will mark 10 years since we set out to create a cleaner and more sustainable heating fuel. And I am pleased to say that those efforts have resulted in the removal of millions of gallons of petroleum from the market or the equivalent of over 500,000 cars being taken off the road. It is this success that makes us excited for the future of biofuel in New York and the reason some of our members have strived beyond the B20 target. In fact, some of our members have recently begun supplying B50 to their customers. With regard to intro 2317, we are deeply concerned about the potential impact this legislation could have not only on the biofuel industry in New York City, but the city's fuel diversity. Again, let me say that again, the city's fuel diversity. What worries us more, however, is the chilling effect this will have on the biofuel industry and the signal it sends about the value of future investment. We are committed to getting to higher blends of biodiesel. We cannot do this without future investment. We look forward to discussing this further with the council. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. And our next witness uh, thank you, Rocco. is You're welcome. Michael Tronzo of the National Biodiesel Board. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Michael Trenzo. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I got you. Okay. Michael Trenzo with Schenker, Risso, and Clark. Our firm represents the National Biodiesel Board, the trade association of domestic producers of biodiesel, renewable diesel, and sustainable aviation fuel. The National Biodiesel Board joins the City Council in their efforts to reduce carbon emissions and phase out the use of fossil fuels. Dating back to 2010, we've worked with the City Council in passing statutes to implement the replacement of heating oil with 20% biodiesel blends by 2034. This year, we successfully worked with the state legislature to move that 20% blending level statewide by 2030, for four years earlier. That bill is awaiting Governor Hochul's signature. New York State consumes 1 billion gallons of heating oil annually. 
These laws will result in the displacement of 200 million gallons of heating oil used in the state. Our goal is to replace 500 million gallons by 2035 with a B50 uh, requirement and all 1 billion gallons by 2050 with 100% biodiesel, renewable diesel. The full life cycle analysis will show a 73 to 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions when using biomass-based diesel versus petroleum diesel. These carbon savings are immediate and provide health benefits that will lower cancer rates and lessen instances of asthma. Our testimony will include a study with those findings. Relative to intro 2317 does not take into consideration the full life cycle analyses, but only tailpipe stack emissions. Uh, we would suggest that the bill be amended to include the word fossil before carbon dioxide in the sentence emits 50 kilograms or more of carbon dioxide. This will allow uh, the use of clean burning biodiesel and renewable diesel to continue to help contribute to the lower, lowering of fossil emissions in the state. Our testimony uh, will not dissuade you from the goal of electrification. I'm inspired. That's not okay. our goal. Uh, please speak. finish your sentence. Please, uh, uh, sure. uh, uh, please finish your sure. Yep. Our, our testimony is not to dissuade you from the goal of electrification, but to speak to the immediate uh, savings um, on how biodiesel and renewable diesel can help achieve carbon reduction goals with little or no cost to consumers, nor the need for new appliances in their homes. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you to you uh, both. I, I have a long uh, history with you know trying to advance uh you know biodiesel in or, or you know bioheat in in new york city just as the administration has done uh with uh you know biodiesel in its uh, uh in its fleets and um heavy duty vehicles and um uh you know the the you know clean air savings that uh have been able to have been you know realized in new york city are um uh, are, are, are you know should be you know should be duly noted and um uh i look forward to that whole life cycle um analysis uh that you are discussing uh that of course would relate to um uh you know the 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 the, the enemy so to speak is when we have you know transferred uh, you know, carbon, you know, that was deep in the earth and made a net transfer of carbon, you know, to the atmosphere through the use of fossil fuels. Uh, but when you're dealing with a bioproduct, uh, you know, a plant, basically, uh, you know, during its life cycle, it, you know, will, it, 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 it will, uh, um, uh, it will, you know, pick up CO2. And then if it is, uh, you know, combusted or, or just left to decompose that you know, CO2 will, you know, return to the atmosphere. So, uh, you know, not all, you know, not all CO2 is created equal. I think that's what you're getting at um, with that, with that, um, with that life cycle analysis. Uh, you know, we look forward to that and uh, we look forward to an ongoing conversation with the, uh, uh, with the National Biodiesel Board, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, nationally and with Rocco and his partners locally as we move forward. And so, uh, you know, that concludes my comments for this panel. And if there are no questions for this panel, we can move on to the next panel. Uh, the next panel uh, is begins with Corey Lechter from the New York Energy Consumer Council. Corey? Uh, um, uh, why don't we call the whole panel, okay? Okay, so they know. and Diana Sweeney, from the New York City Energy Consumers Council, John Rice from the New York City Energy Consumers Council, Wendy Heos from Consumers Energy Alliance, and Lauren Moss from the New York Energy Consumers Council. Thank you, Samara. Time starts now. All right, so uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you for having us for this uh, hearing today. Uh, my name thank is you. Corey Letcher from the uh, Energy Consumers Council in New York. Um, we were supportive of uh, the bill and the spirit, uh, but we believe there's some significant changes we'd like to recommend. Uh, one of the concerns that we have is the impact this legislation is going to have on the current electric grid as it stays today uh, with the phase out of gas and other fossil fuels that this bill aims to achieve. 
Electric options are going to be needed to replace these fuels. Uh, this in turn will increase the demand and the stress on the current electric grid. Uh, given these implications to the electric grid, uh, we'd like to propose that um, the utilities, uh, namely locally here, Con Consolidated Edison, should be directed to commission a study by an independent third party to evaluate the current preparedness of the electrical transmission and distribution infrastructure throughout the impacted service territory so that we can determine whether the grid can currently support electrified building stock under the specified timeline that is outlined by the bill. Uh, this study should analyze whether there are any additional infrastructure investments that are needed, along with the cost of such investments and how these costs would be allocated. This study should also be made publicly available for review and public comment. Uh, the necessary infrastructure upgrade project timeline should also be made public so that it can assist with proper planning by developers. The effective timing of the fossil fuel ban should track the timing of the completion of such infrastructure projects. Uh, this is um, aligned with uh, intro number 2091, which calls for the assessment of possible timeframes for the electrification of existing buildings of various types and sizes. Uh, this is a study that we would propose should include the impact of newly developed electrified building stock. Uh, thank you, Chairperson Gennaro and committee members for giving me this opportunity to testify and for addressing this important issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Diana Sweeney. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Hi, I'm Diana Sweeney, uh, President of Energy Watch and also the Executive Director of the New York Energy Consumers Council. Um, we are supportive of the bill. Um, however, we do recommend the following six amendments to the bill. Uh, one, with regard to the bill applying to buildings undergoing renovations, there should be clarity as to what type of renovations would trigger compliance with the bill. The clarity is needed because if small renovations that are unrelated to systems that consume fossil fuels would trigger compliance, that could present an economic hardship to many buildings. We propose that the bill would apply to buildings that undergo renovations that have a value of over 50% of the property value. Um, second, we believe there should be language added to allow for an exemption in the event Consolidated Edison cannot cost effectively provide electrical service to a new building. Third, with regard to the undue hardship exemption, there should be an explicitly defined process with guidelines in order to claim this exemption. Fourth, New York City owned buildings should also be included in the bill as required to comply to lead by example. Fifth, standby generators used for curtailment activities, which bolster the grid resiliency should be exempted. And finally, nothing should prevent a newly constructed building from connecting to a district heating and or cooling system, including Con Edison's district steam utility. Um, per the bill, prohibited emissions are those due to combustion with, quote, within a building. When a building utilizes the district steam, steam system, combustion is off-site. We would like to clarify that a building will have the option to utilize district steam as a thermal energy source. Um, thank you, Chairperson Gennaro and committee members for giving us this opportunity to testify and for addressing this important issue. Um, we are very willing to work with you further to further um, finalize the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, the next uh, panelist is John Weiss from the New York City Energy Consumers Council. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Chair Gennaro, uh, Councilman Ampri Samuel, and moderator Samara. I'm um, uh, John Rice. I'm the president and principal of Legacy Engineers, New York City's premier Black-owned consulting engineering firm. I'm a board member of the Urban Green Council, and I'm a member of the Energy uh, Consumers Council. Uh, part of this question may have been answered earlier. I, I believe I heard that when Councilman Ampri Samuel spoke, that she said this legislation was for new buildings and gut renovations. Uh, I, I'm here to uh, in favor of, we're supportive of the bill, and we're in here in favor of a phase and approach similar to what Chris Halfnight uh, presented earlier in his testimony. Uh, the most efficient technologies for buildings today are heat pump uh, units, air source heat pump units, which require significant roof space for existing high rise buildings due to the limitation of the building footprint. The roof setbacks are typically not large enough to accommodate the necessary equipment on the roof. 
Therefore, without a phase in, many buildings are are opting to go just towards strict uh, electric resistant heat rather than heat pumps, which would actually increase emissions uh, given the inefficiencies of those systems. Thus, uh, we would propose a, um, a phase in approach over time based on the square footage and or the building height to provide more time for products to come online that can meet the needs of all segments of the building stock. Uh, as an example, uh, for buildings that are 50,000 square feet, three feet or less, a two year phase in for buildings that are 500 square feet, uh, 10 stories or less, five years, and for buildings that are, and all other buildings, uh, eight year phase in approach. I uh, thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Uh, the next witness is Wendy Hills from the Consumers Energy Alliance. Hi, I'm sorry. Good day, Chief Gennaro and members of the Environmental Protection Committee. My name is Wendy Ehos, and I'm the New York Executive Director for the Consumer Energy Alliance. I appreciate the opportunity to share our comments today. Founded in 2006, CEA is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization with more than 350 member companies, and more than 550,000 individuals in our national network, our nationwide network. Our mission is to help ensure American families and businesses have access to reliable, affordable, and environmentally sound resources. We believe in an environmentally sustainable energy future that includes both traditional and renewable resources that create the energy mix to meet the needs of our nation's families, businesses, environment, and economy. We support U.S. energy in all forms so we continue to meet our climate expectations, continue progress towards net zero, and maintain our energy security while keeping the cost of reliability needs of families and businesses in mind. As the committee considers its legislative agenda today, it's important to highlight New York's incredible environmental progress while natural gas use and infrastructure have expanded across the state. According to state data, total emissions from the electricity generation sector fell 42%, while natural gas use for power generation increased more than 150% from 1990 to 2015. Additionally, the Department of Energy reports that New York's energy-related carbon dioxide emissions decreased a remarkable 18% from 1990 to 2018. CEA is concerned about the harmful economic impacts that the suite of bills being considered today could have on working families, small businesses, and those struggling to get by, especially with today's inflationary environment and soaring energy prices. The latest Department of Energy winter outlook projects with 30% increases in natural gas prices, 54% spikes for propane, 43% surge for home heating oil, and winter gas heating bills could be $746 and $1,268 for electric heating. I'm CA expired. Uh, 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 please finish your sentence, please. CEA recently issued a heat or eat report that found that consumers would pay over 13.6 billion in additional higher winter energy costs as a result. Um, I, I do have a few more sentences. Um, it'll probably take me about 15 more sentence, seconds to finish. Uh, uh, please be brief. Okay, these excessively high unnecessary costs have real life impacts for those living at or near the poverty line. And in September of this year, the New York City's region unemployment rate was twice the national average. This is why CEA shares its concerns with the suite of bills being considered because they could potentially lead to higher energy costs and reduce consumer choices. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next witness is Lauren Moss of the New York Energy Consumers Council. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Uh, I am currently the Senior Vice President of the Center for Active Design and also a board member of the New York Energy Consumer Council. We are supportive of the spirit of the bill. However, I believe that significant changes are needed. A case study was performed on an existing NYCC member's multi-tenanted residential building to review the impacts of eliminating natural gas combustion if the legislation had been implemented as it currently is written at the time the building was developed. The study was performed on a recently constructed 560,000 square foot multifamily residential building built in 2019, it currently has a natural gas fired condensing hydronic heating system. The findings, which are rough estimates, are summarized below. The installation of electrified heating systems would have resulted in an increase in first costs of about $4.5 million, or $8 a square foot. 
annual operating costs would increase by $75,000. Uh, the loss in annual revenue of $120,000 consisting of $100,000 in lost rent from a reduction in views associated with the exterior mechanical equipment placed on roof setbacks, as well as $20,000 in lost amenity fees due to a reduction in outdoor terrace amenity space. And the initial carbon savings from electrifying the heating systems vary between 250 and 300 tons of carbon per year, depending on whether E-grid or local law 97 coefficients are used. The impact on the cost of new development of a large building for Further supports the NYCC's position that large buildings over 500,000 square feet should be phased in over eight years following completion of necessary infrastructure upgrades. This will allow time for new technologies to enter the market, which should make the cost of development more feasible. This will also avoid many buildings installing electric resistance heating rather than heat pumps, which would actually increase emissions given the inefficiencies of these systems. Thank you, Chairperson Gennaro and committee members for giving me this opportunity to specify and for, adjusting, for addressing these important issues. Uh, uh, thank you uh, very much, Lauren. And I, I, I thank this entire uh, panel uh, as I'm urging all panels, uh, you know, make sure that we have uh, in all of your testimony in writing. Um, this is what I do for fun. I read testimony and then I make little lines and circles and I bother staff and this is, this is, this is what I do. Yeah. You, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's my life. What can I tell you? And so um, make sure we have all that. Uh, I, I, I would like to thank this panel again for giving very specific testimony uh, on what, you know, you would do to make revisions to the bill. Um, this is always the kind of specificity that we're looking for. I ask that you, uh, you know, send this along. I don't want to make sure from the sergeant that I will have the ability to um, to actually watch the uh, hearing again. Will I have that ability, sergeant? Uh, can I have a tape of this? Yes, once once it's uh, uploaded to the uh, council website, you can watch it there. Okay, uh, I, I would uh, 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 ask my legislative uh, director, uh, Nabby, to be in touch with the council when that will uh, you know, be available because I'll be watching this again, as well as looking through all the testimony. Um, so I, I thank this panel and if there are no questions, um, we can move on to the next panel. Are there any other questions for this panel, uh, um, Samara? I don't see any council person questions or any other okay. questions. Uh, okay, then let me just jump in right now for the sake of, for the sake of balance. Um, you know, the next panel to testify was going to be panel number nine. I'm gonna, uh, we're going to, uh, you know, um, with my apologies, go to panel number 10 first for the sake of sort of balance. Um, you, you know, we, we've had a couple of uh, panels in a row that have had okay. a certain perspective. And so I think for the sake of balance, we're going to do panel 10 and then follow that with panel nine. My apologies to panel nine, as I was talking to council member uh, Samuel before, it's very important to have balance. Some people think this way, some people think the other way. And so we're gonna um, uh, you know, put panel 10 before panel nine, okay? You got okay. that, Mara, so we'll do that. Panel 10, Eric Weltman of Food and Water Watch, John Pope, general contractor, A.J. Pyers, president of Alloy, Amy Turner of Columbia University Sabin Center for Climate Change Law, and Leah Stokes of the University of California at Santa Barbara. Time starts now. My name is Eric Weltman, and I'm a Brooklyn-based senior organizer with Food & Water Watch, a member of the Gas Free NYC Coalition. On behalf of Food & Water Watch's nearly 100,000 supporters in New York City, we urge the City Council to pass Intro 2317 now. Seven years ago, New York declared a ban on fracking, striking a blow against the fossil fuel industry. It was a necessary measure to protect our water communities and environment from this dangerous drilling process. And Chairman Gennaro, you played an important role in that effort for which we are grateful. 
Since then, we've continued the fight to move New York off fossil fuels, with Governor Hochul taking a major step forward by blocking frac gas power plants in Queens and the Hudson Valley. Now New York City must continue to lead the way by banning gas hookups and new construction and gut renovations. This policy, folks, this policy is bold, practical, and necessary. The evidence on the ground is clear. We have the technology and we have the skills to use it. Now we just need the council's leadership. Of course, ExxonMobil is scared of this legislation, and they should be. What happens in New York doesn't stay in New York. We fully expect that New York's leadership, your leadership, will be emanated. And let's be clear, we need it to be. The stakes could not be any higher. Higher. Hurricane Ida was another tragic reminder that the painful impacts of climate change are already hitting home. More extreme weather events supercharged by climate change, as well as deadly heat waves, will continue to devastate our communities. Any delay, any delay in moving off fossil fuels means more death and destruction. To be blunt, folks, delay equals death. New York City would reap a multitude of benefits from intro 2317, good green jobs, cleaner air, and improved public safety. Firefighters and other first responders are on the front lines of disasters I'm caused by gas in our buildings are made even more deadly and dangerous by its presence. Google New York City gas explosions and you'll know what I mean. Finally, finally, we join New York Communities for Change and other allies in the Gas Free NYC campaign in calling for intro 2317 to be strengthened. Let me just quickly note, for example, Please conclude. Please conclude. in just one year and by amending a bill so that it, it clarifies the definition of gut renovations. Thank you. And again, we urge you to pass this bill without Thank further delay. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate that. The next one is John Pope, general contractor. I'm sorry, Sam. Hi, everybody. My name is John Pope. Uh, how are you all today? Thank you for having this hearing. I am here to be in full support of 2317. I'm a, probably the elusive small business owner, general contractor here. Um, and I do, uh, I do not build uh, entire buildings, but I do do all one gut renovations with some regularity. And I'm here in full support of this. While we have these buildings opened up, let's get them sealed up and let's get them electrified. Um, I, uh, I don't see the logic in the cart before the horse. I think that as we go forward, we have to do quite a few things simultaneously. So waiting for the grid to do this, you know, we're just gonna end up like many have said before, you know, with a bunch of stranded assets. And that's unfortunate. Um, I heard a, a earlier speaker talk about pinning the, uh, uh, the, the threshold for uh, getting to uh, this bill for the uh, gut renovations at 50% of the cost. And I, I don't think that's feasible because I think it's gonna be a lot of hocus pocus. And I think we should, uh, clearly define what gut renovation is. I'm ready to go, my guys are ready to go, and I thank you very much for your time. Thank you, thank you for your spirited testimony. I appreciate that. And we love to hear from small business owners. Uh, the next witness, A.J. Pires, president of Alloy. Time starts now. Uh, thank you, Chair Gennaro and the committee for holding this important hearing today and for council member Amprey Samuel and others for sponsoring this bill. My name is AJ Pires and I'm the president of Alloy Development, an architecture and development company based in Brooklyn. I'm here today as a licensed architect and a real estate development company to express my strong support for banning new natural gas connections in New York. Designing and building a fossil, fu fossil fuel free building in New York is possible today and cost effective. My company, Alloy Development, is building the first all electric skyscraper in New York City at 100 Flatbush in downtown Brooklyn. The building will be 44 stories tall and contain 440 units of market rate and affordable housing and retail. It will rely on off the shelf technologies that are widely available to heat and cool the building and provide hot water. These include water source heat pumps, electric boilers and hot water heaters, induction cooktops and heat pump dryers. And will do so at a similar cost as a conventional building. When it's operational in 2024, it will be 20% more efficient than a conventional new building. And by 2030, relying on the electrical grids transition to renewable energy, it will be 200% more efficient. 
it will have superior indoor air quality, an airtight building envelope, and most importantly, it will be future-proofed, that is designed to operate in a carbon-free future we must start planning to live within. Installing a natural gas system today is a bit like installing copper telephone lines. The reality is, like steam and fuel oil before it, gas infrastructure is now approaching the end of its useful life. Banning new natural gas connections will not only significantly reduce carbon emissions and improve air quality, it will also make New York a leader in sustainable development nationally and internationally. There are many problems related to the climate that we don't have solutions for. How to make low carbon steel or low carbon jet fuel. This is not one of those problems. The technologies and the knowledge that exist today to prepare our buildings for a carbon free future. All we need now is the political will to do it. Thank you. I appreciate your testimony. Please stay on. Uh, we have one council member that's raised his hand for questions. So we'll be posing questions to the council, uh, to, to, to the panel when the panel is completed and I ask Samara to call the next witness in this panel. The next witness is Amy Terma from Columbia University Sabin Center for Climate Change Law. I'm starts now. Hi, uh, thank you to Chair, Chair Gennaro and to the council for allowing me to participate in today's hearing. Uh, my name is Amy Turner. I'm a senior fellow at the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law at Columbia Law School. I research city decarbonization law and policy, and I advise cities across the country on building decarbonization and building electrification policies. I'm here today to testify in support of Intro 2317. Um, and specifically, I'm here to talk uh, about the city's legal authority uh, to enact Intro 2317, and in particular, to do so right away. Um, so, you know, as you know, local laws in New York City have to have some form of, of authority to, to back them up. Um, and in this instance, in, in the instance of 2317, uh, New York City has ample police powers uh, delegated by New York State's municipal home rule law, um, specifically the authority to govern in relation to the public health and welfare and for the protection um, of the city's physical and visual environment. New York City, like other municipalities in the state, um, is also permitted by New York State air pollution control law to enact local laws relating to air pollution, um, so long as they meet or exceed minimum state, uh, state requirements, as Intro 2317 does. Um, and finally, of course, New York City has building code authority, and so while there are sufficient, while there is sufficient authority for the city to enact Intro 2317 um, through its home rule powers, police powers, and air pollution control authority, the building code authority buttresses that authority and provides a statutory home for Intro 20, uh, 2317's requirements. Um, I have a bit more in my written testimony about why this law is not preempted. I trust that the chair will read it given his enthusiasm for, the, for reading testimony. Um, what I want to say is that while New York, City has the legal, New York City has the legal authority to require new building electrification and it has the authority to do so today, there is no reason why the city cannot require that new building permit applications meet intro 2317's requirements as soon as it is enacted. The city, will be, the city will be behind if it does not enact this law right away. More than 50 all electric building requirements of various kinds are already in effect today in the US. So if there is a long time horizon for implementation of this law, um, New York City will be showing that it's a follower and not a leader on building decarbonization. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. And the next witness is Leah Stokes from the University of California at Santa Barbara. I'm starts now. Hi, my name is Dr. Leah Stokes and I'm an associate professor. I specialize in energy and climate policy and I'm a former resident of New York City and an alumni of Columbia University. New York City has a really big chance right now to join with over 50 other cities across the country who have taken bold steps to stop installing new gas in buildings. 2317 being discussed today would be a landmark change that would deliver big public health and climate benefits while creating jobs in the city. I urge you to listen to the experts from WE Act, New York Communities for Change, uh, Columbia University and others who have spoken today. They have told you, get this bill done, make it apply to gut renovations and make it come into effect as soon as possible. The good news is that building electrification will tackle climate change, create jobs and deliver public health benefits. Scientific research has shown that we cannot build any new fossil fuel infrastructure and limit warming to 1.5 degrees. That includes putting new gas in buildings. And we don't have to do it anymore. We have heat pumps, we have induction stoves. 
New York City already has a clean enough grid that electrification does cut carbon pollution. Anybody who has testified today, and I've heard several people do it, who has said otherwise is being factually inaccurate. I am an energy policy expert, and I looked it up myself today. If you put in an electric stove or an electric heat pump, it has a lower carbon footprint today with the electricity mix in New York City today. In addition, other factually inaccurate statements that have been made have been around how heat pumps are not possible in New York City. This is just not true. Numerous buildings across the city are already being electrified by companies like Block Power, which is creating good paying jobs and training New Yorkers. And you're going to hear people talk about that. So that is factually inaccurate. Scientists have also told us that burning fossil gas in homes is really bad for health. It increases the risk of asthma by 42%. And even when gas appliances are turned off, they're still leaking, including carcinogens. So I'd just like to close by saying that council member Ampri Samuel is right. These health impacts are a matter of life and death for New Yorkers and they're hitting communities of color the hardest. So it's time for New York City to ban gas in buildings. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, I thank this panel and I know that I, I see Council Member Levin has his hand raised and with, um, uh, um, with the approval of the moderator, I will recognize uh, mm -hmm. Council Member Levin. Is that okay, Please. Samara? It, 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 I, I, um, unless someone else raises his hand before Steve. No. Please. Okay. Please okay. recognize Steve. Yes. It is, my, uh, it is my pleasure to recognize uh, Council Member Levin. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, uh, <clears throat> my first question is for um, uh, for AJ. Um, uh, you know, I was the council member who um, approved that project that you're speaking of uh, in my I district. I remember. Yeah, right. Um, and, um, you know, we had a, you, uh, Alloy as a developer, you guys want to make a profit, right? You guys are looking to uh, have a, uh, you know, a, 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 you're in, you're not a not for profit. You're a for profit company, so you have every interest in trying to um, make a cost effective development. Is that correct? That's correct. Sure. Um, and so the um, to to make an all electric building or development, as you said, this is a I forget what the density is on 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 80 Flatbush, but it's, 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 it's a, it's a dense development site. Um, uh, you, you see that as a cost effective uh, way to go. So the, the business case is, is multifold. Um, so there is a minor upfront cost premium and I would agree with Chris half night sensibility. It's about one to 2%. Um, you're saving costs on some things. There's no incoming gas line. There's no gas infrastructure, but you're paying a little bit more for an increased switch gear room um, and additional equipment. The long-term benefit is um, on the operating savings of the building from an energy usage standpoint, um, as compared to a traditionally designed building. Um, some of it is also policy-based, which is complying with local law 97 and the benefits of that. And if there is to be a cap and trade program, the additional benefit of that. Um, this building as designed would meet not just the 2030, uh, 2024 rule, but the 2030 rule upon opening. Mm -hmm. um, the other though is a, um, is a long-term um, value priority relative to sustainability, which is um, we believe that the users and occupants of the building are desirous of a, of a place that's from, you know, looking to lower its carbon impact and that um, renters, when given the choice of renting across the street or here, will choose to rent in a building that is all electric, um, much like most people use their purchasing power to choose one piece of clothing or another or one type of food over another. Um, and we believe long term that um, it's, it's uh, those expression of values that will be rewarding and um, bring um, the other piece of the economic benefit of the project. Okay. Do you, are you are you running into um, practical problems around um, you know uh, issues around heat pumps or effectiveness around um, the technology that's available now or do you think that I mean you mentioned this in, in your testimony but that uh, you believe that there's that you have the, the, the there's not a there's no technical technological limitations in front of you right now that you see as kind of deal breakers for um, pursuing this with this development? 
we we don't and we're under construction with the technology the some of the testimony today spoke about um heat pumps but they were air source heat pumps um we're using water source heat pump there's also ground source heat pumps uh, i would also question the validity of the statement that air source heat pumps don't work below a certain temperature they they work in very low temperatures some of that problem has to do with what the design goal is and what the efficiency air tightness of the building is so if you are in a leaky building and you're trying to get to 80 degrees when it's eight degrees outside it is going to be incredibly difficult to achieve that with a air source heat pump if you have an energy efficient building that's designed to a passive house standard and you're looking to get to 72 degrees you can do that so there's truth to a certain extent across the spectrum there but we have mm -hmm. a engineered system that works and we are building and and, and again you said it you're, you're this is a skyscraper this is this is a this is a big this is a big building i mean it was uh i, I think you could all you'd have to do is ask the neighbors and they would tell you that this is a big building uh on the you know on, on flatbush avenue um so you know it this is not this is not some three-story building or something like that what's the square footage of the building uh it's about four hundred thousand square feet it's 44 stories a little under 500 feet tall 440 apartments. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. Well, I'm 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 hopeful that um, that your testimony as a as a developer who is building a building right now in New York City um, uh, uh, will will be instructive um, for other um, you know uh, other developers in the in the field who are examining their options right now. Thank you. Really appreciate uh, uh, the question, Steve. Yep, you uh, got. It. Uh, uh, thank you, Council Member Levin, and uh, uh, thank you. Whoops, uh, AJ. Right? Am I talking AJ? Right? We just. Yep. Uh, hi. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, thank you for your um, uh, for, for your uh, for your answer to the council member and for your um, compelling uh, uh, testimony about what you've been able to do in. Uh, with with uh, your building. Uh, I only have one other comment for this panel. Uh, um, uh, um, Eric Weltman, I well remember the fracking wars and what we went through with the you know New York City drinking water supply watershed and how we carried that through to the whole state and like the documentary that was made about that, that was a huge thing that you played a major role in. I certainly appreciate your uh, your partnership on that, and I um, uh, uh, applaud the rest of the members of this panel for your good testimony. I look forward to getting it in writing and also having the opportunity to rewatch it in video. And with that said, I'll ask uh, Samara to call um, uh, the next panel, uh, formerly known as uh, Panel 9. Okay, Panel 9 the plumbing panel, April MacIver from the Plumbing Foundation, George Bassolino III from the Master Plumbers Council, Artie Clark, Artie Clark from the, dire the Director of Trade Education uh, at UA Local Union Number no. 1, and Arthur Goldstein of the Master Plumbers Council. Time starts now. Great, thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman and committee members. My name is April McIver. I'm the Executive Director of the Plumbing Foundation. Uh, given time and constraints, I'm going to get right into my testimony on 2317. No one can deny the vulnerability of our climate and the need to take drastic measures to reduce carbon emissions. We, the Plumbing Foundation, are absolutely supportive of methods to reduce carbon emissions, but I must urge the Council to take a step back and consider the larger picture. I do strongly urge you to read my entire written testimony, which has already been submitted, but I do want to briefly mention some of the main points. Uh, while the summary of this bill insists that it would apply to new buildings and major alterations, and I know that was uh, said several times today, um, the text is extremely vague and placement of section two in the construction code can be interpreted to mean it's actually applicable to a much broader universe of buildings, uh, not just doing gut renovations. So clarifications there would definitely need to be made. Uh, in addition, the effective date of two years from passage does not make 
a ton of sense in terms of the timeline of the emissions goals in the New York City Climate Mobilization Act and the New York State Climate Leader, uh, Leadership and Community Protection Act, especially given that the plan to meet those emissions targets is still being determined. I was, I was happy to hear from the city that, you know, they're working on, uh, working on it, but that's very much the, the status as far as, um, as, far as I, I'm aware. And finally, there hasn't been a full cost impact study done. Um, there is a, another bill on the agenda today, 2091, that would be a very necessary step before passing 2317. And we confidently predict that such impact studies would result in revisions to this bill. Um, you can reference two reports from California in my full written testimony that I think are of great uh, relevance in terms of the cost of gas bans and electrification. Um, so rather the Plumbing Foundation suggest a common sense approach with, must include wide encompassing in industry and all stakeholder involvement. So that means all of us, all of us here today. I'm actually excited to see how many people, um, you know, are here to speak uh, about the bill. Pros I'm excited. Uh, can I finish my sentence? Uh, uh, yes, April, uh, uh, by all means. Great. So the two other points are just uh, a diversified, meaning sources, an incremental approach to phasing out carbon emitting energy sources, as well as educational campaigns aimed at explaining the fact, science, and data behind the diversified approach. So we look forward to continuing this conversation with the council and all stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you, April. Uh, George Bessalino III. Time starts now. Okay, good afternoon. My name is George Bassolino and I represent the New York City Master Plumbers Council and I'm also a New York City licensed master plumber. Besides protecting the health of the nation, licensed master plumbers have been at the forefront of reducing carbon emissions for decades. The clean air we breathe today is due in part to our work replacing dirty fossil fuels with clean and reliable natural gas. As few as 30 short years ago, New York City was still installing brand new coal-fired boilers in our schools. Today, they've been replaced with modern equipment burning natural gas. On a daily basis, licensed master plumbers replace existing appliances with new, more efficient appliances, continuing to further reduce New York City's carbon footprint. The vehicles we drive today are 99% more efficient than when I started in this business. The point being here is we're making measurable progress and doing so in a responsible manner. And all work is benefiting both the environment and the consumer. And nobody denies climate change is real and must be addressed immediately. At some point, the use of fossil fuels must be eliminated. But as written, this bill is not only going to prohibit the utilization of natural gas and new construction and major renovations, but as April pointed out, it would also not allow for repairs, replacements, or upgrade work. If this is enacted prior to the establishment of the rec requisite infrastructure and electrical generation capacity, the carbon release in the atmosphere is going to quadruple immediately. Increasing electrical and retrofit costs were going to pose an economic burden on New York City's most vulnerable residents. The possibility of short-term uh, Brown and blackouts is going to increase during the summer months. Some reports have calculated the cost of banning natural gas to be up to $25,000 per household. Who's going to cover this cost? Many New York City businesses have been unable to pay rent during the pandemic and are struggling to survive, especially restaurants, which depends on natural, natural gas to cook. Will they survive? Um, New York City needs solutions that allow for continued growth and development while maintaining a high standard of living and quality of life. Our economy and daily life depend on reliable energy generation and distribution delivered at a price we can afford. New York City is depending on you to provide realistic ways that are compatible with reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you for your time. Thank you, George. Appreciate your testimony. Please stay on uh, until we finish the panel. Thank you. Uh, the next witness is Audie Clark, Director of Trade Education at, U at Local Union One. Time starts now. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Gennaro, members of the committee. Um, my name is Arthur Clark. I'm Director of Trade Education at Plumbers Local One. I have an intimate knowledge of the fuel gas infrastructure in New York City, having worked in the plumbing industry for over 35 years. The last few years have made clear that climate change is most certainly real. Nobody is disputing that. Our union is committed to the development and utilization of renewable sources of energy to reduce our carbon footprint. Making the transition from fossil fuels to low carbon sources of energy is the overarching goal. Achieving that goal must be done in a carefully planned and well thought out approach so that we avoid the hardship, expenses and regrets of unintended consequences. Um, we are, um, our union supports legislation that establishes a comprehensive carbon pricing system 
to ensure that New York achieves the goals set in the Climate Leadership and Protection Act. Um, a careful reading of this intro shows that the gas consuming buildings will be considered to be operating illegally if the intro becomes law. Building and homeowners will perhaps be given a hardship waiver, perhaps, uh, but for how long it isn't explained and it isn't clear how they get the waiver, how long they would have the waiver. Is there some kind of grandfathering status? None of that is explained in this, in this intro. It simply makes the, 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 the burning of fossil fuel illegal and therefore the person who is owning that building that burns a fossil fuel is now owns an illegal building. Um, who's gonna pay to scrap the, the water heaters, the clothes dryers, the boilers, the furnaces and replace them with electric alternatives? And, what, and how much rewiring is the building gonna need uh, it, it, isn't, it isn't clear and it isn't explained to anybody who's looking at this. Um, once it becomes law and the buildings are then burning gas illegally, they're going to face enforcement under as yet writ unwritten rules by the New York City Department of Buildings. Time we haven't expired. seen the rules. The rules aren't part of the law. They come after the law. And we're likely to face uh, more unintended consequences for the working class in the city when those people find themselves bearing the cost to prematurely replace gas equipment and pay for rewiring in buildings where uh, this occurs, uh, that they try to get a permit from DOB and they're told, okay, now rip out all your gas equipment. I think these things need to be clarified uh, much more before we, we move ahead with this. So as written, we oppose it. We think it needs more clarification. Thank you, Artie. Thank you, Artie. <clears throat> and, um... Uh, uh, yeah, and, and but uh, uh, um, uh, um, hold on, we'll come back when we finish the panel. Appreciate your statement. And the final witness for this panel is Arthur Goldstein of the Master Plumbers Council. Time starts now. So I'm going to pass, other than to say I uh, applaud uh, Chairman uh, Gennaro's uh, passion for this issue going back to. Uh, if I'm correct, when we were both staff at the city council, they had the same passion. So I'm going to pass. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Arthur. That was uh, more than 30 years ago. And, um, and God bless that we both still look the same. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> imagine that, you know. Uh, yes, I, 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 uh, 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 April, please rest assured uh, that I will read uh, 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 you know, your good testimony and everyone <clears throat> who has put um, uh, for testimony in the, uh, on this panel, um, uh, in everyone uh, you made uh, um, uh, uh, points that must be further probed. Um, and, uh, and for this reason, I will tell this panel, as I've told all the others, make sure we get all this testimony in writing. I'm sure that Arthur will make sure that that happens. Um, and it will get my full attention. And I look forward to um, discussing these matters with uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, um, Arthur and, um, and uh, this good panel uh, in uh, future weeks. So thank you. I appreciate that. And thank you for, <clears throat> we kind of jumped over you in order for balance and thanks for being good sports about that. Okay, so I just want to recognize your patience um, uh, and, and working with me in this quest for what I call balance. So uh, thank you, uh, thank you to this panel. And if there are no questions for this panel, uh, we should move on to the next one. Um, the next Mara? panel, Bob Wyman, a geothermal expert, Zachary Fink of ZBS Geothermal and the Association for Affordable Energy. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if we have anybody signed up for the, I mean, I, I got this list with a, Question mark after the Association for uh, Affordable Energy. I think they were, I think staff had been apprised that they would be signing up. We'll see when we call them if they, um, 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 if they reveal themselves. So um, why don't we start with Mr. Wyman and go from there. <clears throat> okay. Good afternoon. My name is Bob Wyman. Uh, my comments will focus on uh, in 2091. I'm, I'm an independent advocate of beneficial electrification, particularly focused on encouraging geothermal heat, heat pumps for space and water heating. Working with Google, I inspired and co-founded Dandelion Energy, now one of the largest providers of geothermal heat pumps in the USA. I'm also a party to the rate cases of both Con Ed and National Grid, as well as many other utilities in New York State. 
I will not repeat the benefits of electrification mentioned by others. Today, I want to point out that the alternative to beneficial electrification, which is continued investment in gas infrastructure, will be financially ruinous for gas ratepayers. While the bill calls for an assessment of the cost of electrification, it should also require an assessment of the cost of not electrifying. Let me explain why. We must recognize that due to the way that utilities recover their costs, continued expansion of or investment in gas infrastructure will inevitably result in a very dramatic increase in the delivered price of gas. We will see a death spiral for gas that will inevitably uh, impose high costs on the low and moderate income ratepayers who are likely to be the last ones to abandon gas. Even if the gas commodity magically becomes free, gas will still become excessively expensive. The problem is simple. The costs of providing gas service are largely fixed and independent of the quantity of the gas which is sold. It costs the same amount to finance a gas pipe whether it is used to full capacity or abandoned as a standard asset. Once gas infrastructure investment is made, it costs or its costs are recovered over periods as long as 85 years. In the past, given a growing demand for gas, it has been possible to spread infrastructure costs over an increasingly large number of units of gas sold. However, because the CLCPA, Local Law 97, and other laws and regulations require that we reduce the quantity of gas sold, those fixed asset costs will be spread over an increasingly declining volume of sales. The result is a mathematically inevitable cost increase. Time expired. Because, let me just say, because the cost of providing uh, yeah, yeah, gas... Yeah. Uh, please finish your sentence, of course. Okay, because the cost of providing gas service will remain fixed, even as the demand for gas declines, the price of gas... Uh, the per unit price of gas will increase in proportion to the reduction in demand for gas. Um, and just one example here. Uh, for uh, instance, please, uh, please conclude. There's only so there's only so much give I can I, I can um, extend. Okay. Just if we do reduce consumption by 85 percent as required by the law, uh, that means that the cost of gas delivery must go up at least seven times. Essentially, we cannot afford not to electrify, we can't afford to have people remain on gas. It's time to move on uh, to the second great electrification of our city. Thank you, thank you. Um, the next witness is Zachary Fink of ZBS Geothermal. Time starts now. Hi, I'm Zachary Fink. I'm the president of ZBF Geothermal and a board member with the New York Geothermal Energy Organization. As a family, I'm the third generation in HVAC. My grandfather started his business as, a coal, as an oil delivery company to convert people from coal to oil. And now I'm working on electrifying some of the same homes and businesses. In New York City, we have four operational multifamily buildings with geothermal, each at least seven stories. Um, and we have dozens of projects in various stages of design and construction representing over 3,500 apartments, over 3 million square feet of space, ranging from affordable housing to market rate buildings to our office buildings and buildings as high as 36 stories. Um, geothermal systems do not use the outdoor air. Um, so the concerns about what happens for heat output in a polar vortex or when it's zero degrees outside are not a concern. The ground temperature in New York City is constant. Geothermal systems also reduce environmental noise eliminating the need for condensers, dry coolers, and cooling towers on the roofs. Um, others have mentioned the higher operational costs. So I just want to address that for a second. Uh, one of the first large scale geothermal projects we did in New York City was a, a passive affordable housing project in Far Rockaway. That project has air conditioning costs for the tenants of under $10 a month, uh, which increases the affordability, increases the indoor air quality for the residents that in affordable housing in New York City wouldn't necessarily otherwise run air conditioning because of the affordability concern. Um, and then the other big thing that was mentioned was domestic hot water not necessarily being ready for prime time. Um, since we've started large scale geothermal designs in New York City in 2017, I know of at least a dozen new projects that have come to the market, um, including, and these are new to the New York City market, not new to the market as a whole. Um, and a lot of those were driven because of local law 97. So the phase time, the phase time in would allow additional products to come out as well. Time expired. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your, for your testimony. And um, uh, Samara, let's see if uh, the Association for Affordable Energy is uh, around. I don't see them. Is anyone representing the Association for Affordable Energy? 
Uh, okay, why don't we, uh, 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 then let me just give my comments for this panel. I, uh, I, I was the one that, um, uh, you know, did my best to get the ball rolling on, you know, geothermal um, back with, I guess it was John Reiner who worked for PW, I, PW Grossman, I think. That's right. And, and uh, um, that was a long time ago to do like the geothermal map. So I certainly applaud, um, you know, like the, you know, the most renewable of all, you know, renewable. And speaking as a geologist, I'm a little, um, you know, I, I, I'm a little partial and biased. Uh, you know, with regard to my affinity for uh, geothermal, and I thank these two witnesses for, um, you know, giving a, a this broader audience the, uh, you know, benefit uh, of this, uh, you know, technology that I would like to see, um, um, uh, uh, you know, multiply, you know, many fold in New York City and make sure that you send us uh, both your, uh, you know, copies of testimony in full. So that we can benefit, so that we can get the most benefit from it. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for your statements today. Group twelve. Group twelve. John Raff of New York Geo. This is the statewide geothermal uh, organization. Bill Nowak of New York Geothermal. Um, Rachel Grace, Rewiring America. Amar Shaw, Rocky Mountain Institute, and New York Passive House. Thank you, Samara. Time Thank starts you. now. Thank you, Chair Gennaro. Uh, I've been itching for over an hour to answer the question of Council Member Amphrey Sam Samuel about how do we get the yes, and also answer your question about whether there's a trade organization involved. In and uh, so I would be one of those people from the trade organization, New York Geothermal Organization. We represent designers, installers, drillers, manufacturers, and education people responsible for the installation of energy saving ground source heat pumps. And, and I was, I'm pleased to know that you're an expert in that. Uh, so uh, it, it's good to hear. As you heard uh, Mr. Fink say, we already have real life examples of healthier and cost competitive buildings in New York City that don't use fossil fuels for space heating and they don't use them for cooling or hot water heating. We already have contractors that are providing excellent wages for ground source heat pump, pump work in New York City. And our members have uh, unfortunately lost cost competitive projects simply because developers do not understand and are not familiar with with uh, heat pumps. So this uh, number 2317 will send a much needed uh, market signal because frankly education isn't going to be enough. And in closing, I just want to let you know that uh, the New York GEO members support uh, intro 2317 and our members are able and willing to move New York City to a cleaner, healthier and electrified environment. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Uh, the next speaker is Bill Nowak. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair DeNaro and Council Swanston. Uh, regarding Bill 2091, the Building Electrification Study, New York Geo completely supports this bill and would be very interested in providing input on geothermal's value in electrifying heating without adding to peak demand and stressing the grid. It was good to hear Director Furness's enthusiasm for the efficiency of air source heat pumps. He'll be even more impressed with the performance of ground source heat pumps which are significantly more efficient than air source, especially on the coldest and hottest days of the year when the grid is most vulnerable. This goes directly to council member Amprey Sam Samuel's earlier question and the points others have raised about the electricity supply. Regarding 2317, the writing on the wall needs to be clear for everyone to see. New York's construction and housing markets need clear signals and how and when it will be necessary to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. 
There's currently too little awareness as new buildings are going up and old buildings being rehabbed that fossil fuel heating is approaching obsolescence and may need to be replaced at significant costs sooner rather than later. The clearest way to send the message is to establish a strong timetable for the transition. Without distinct writing on the wall, it's not clear that any amount of cost cutting or education will jar the market out of doing things the way it's always been done. The market is currently comfortable with fossil fuel heating and needs a strong signal to move that comfort in another direction. We also face an enormous challenge transforming the HVAC industry itself to one that's working to meet our climate challenges. A clear set of end dates will be very helpful in turning the attention of HVAC stakeholders to the transition to fossil fuel free heating. New York State has more than adequate supply of contractors capable of installing heat pumps with a small amount of training. What is needed is a market signal. Time expired. It's important to think of the jobs that will be created and geothermal heat pumps take more labor to install than fossil fuel systems. We urge our friends in the labor movement to look at the big picture, embrace the necessary change and start accessing the tens of thousands of jobs that will be created. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Samara, we're calling, yes. uh, yeah, uh, the next uh, person on this panel, please. Amar Shaw from the Hi. Rocky Mountain oh. Institute. Oh, what happened to Rachel? Uh, oh, Rachel Grace from Rewiring America, excuse me. Time starts now. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Gennaro, the Environmental Protection Committee, and distinguished members of the New York City Council for your time today and for considering 2317. My name is Rachel Grace, and I am the Director of Strategic Policy Initiatives at Rewiring America. We are a nonprofit dedicated to widespread electrification as a way to achieve emissions reductions, create jobs, and reduce monthly energy bills. We are here today in strong support of Intro 2317 as an ambitious but practical way to advance the city's climate goals. Approximately 75% of New York City's greenhouse gas emissions stem from the energy used in buildings, then over half of these emissions come from heating needs, largely powered by natural gas. In 2019, natural gas accounted for 62% of energy used in mid to large size multifamily buildings. Also in 2019, New York City awarded over 24,000 new housing building permits, the majority of which were for large buildings with over 50 units. All of these are going to need heating. At this pace by 2030, New York may have awarded 240,000 permits for new residential buildings alone. There is simply no way for the city of New York to meet its commitment to carbon neutrality by 2050 without doing all it can to minimize, if not eliminate emissions originated by these projects. To meet NYC's targets, buildings will need to make the switch from gas infrastructure to electric infrastructure. This is clear. Intro 2317 gives the city an advantage, an opportunity to stop the cycle of infrastructure replacement before it begins. The appliances, the heating and cooling systems will not need to be replaced with efficient electric versions in the years to come because they will already have them installed. This allows the city of New York to focus its attention on helping New Yorkers electrify existing buildings, getting us on the path to a carbon neutral 2050. In sum, Passing 2317 is essential for the city of New York to reach its climate goals. Buildings drive New York's greenhouse gas emissions led by its heating needs. We have the technologies commercially available today to electrify, and we urge the council to advance intro 2317. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, Samara, I think now we're going to, um, to uh, um, Amar Shah, are, are we not? Samara? Uh, Amar Shah from the Rocky Mountain Institute. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Amar Shah, and I'm a manager at the Rocky Mountain Institute, an independent nonprofit focused on just, prosperous, and zero carbon energy transition globally. I join today to testify in support of intro 2317 and to urge the council to pass the bill this year. New York City needs to stop digging its climate hole and stop deepening its reliance on fossil fuels in buildings. 
I also wanna lift up the revisions proposed by Urban Green Council in written testimony, which are specific, ambitious, and feasible in implementation. And these changes can be accomplished this year. Three themes that I'd hit on in this live testimony. First, as noted earlier, reliance on gas in buildings is not just a climate issue, but a public health one. A recent study out of Harvard Chan Public uh, School of Public Health found that New York is the worst state in the country for premature deaths stemming from air pollution from buildings. It's not just oil, gas use was a lead culprit in the study. Second, continued new construction with gas is expensive and risky for New York City. Every building built with fossil fuels today will very likely need to be retrofitted at higher costs down the road. To make matters worse, downstate ratepayers are currently subsidizing the addition of new buildings to the gas system by an estimated $120 million per year, according to research by New York Geo. One more year, $120 million more of ratepayer spending on gas build-out that may not even be used for its full useful life. Third, in contrast, new all-electric buildings are cost-effective. Research from RMI, NYSERDA, and others has shown that developers can build all-electric and save money doing it. These cost savings will only increase as the market develops. In conclusion, with more than 100 million square feet of projected building area growth this decade, Intro 2317 is an opportunity for New York City to claim a leadership time position, mixed by it. Spur Please market, conclude. Uh, spur the market and have a significant climate and health impact. We encourage this body to act today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have the, the next guest is New York Passive House. I don't know if anyone's here from New York Passive House. <clears throat> Do we have anyone here from New York Passive House? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, um, why don't we uh, save that and, 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 and if the, the, uh, and if the representative is around, they can uh, testify later. <clears throat> well, let's not hold things up. Okay. Many, many, many more people that want to uh, uh, testify. Uh, I actually uh, uh, have a question for um, uh, for um, oh, I, yeah for well I, I guess for you know uh, uh, um, I guess for uh, 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 Mr. Rath and Mr. Uh, Nawak regarding you know the difference between. Um, you know, using geothermal, um, you know, versus 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 air for for heat pumps, and um, mm. you know, with the um, consistent you know temperature that we uh, find below the earth, uh, you know, just in terms of you know relative efficiency. Mm. So there's that uh, on top of um, uh, there are probably areas in the city. Uh, this is the whole. Um, um, thrust behind my um, uh, uh, quest, you know, years ago to do a, a full, you know, geothermal map for New York City where it could be best utilized because I'm sure that um, utility companies and other entities who have wires under the ground are, um, you know, sometimes can um, impede the you know, deployment of geothermal. So that's like the second part of my question, sort of like the so the first part is like the relative efficiency of you know cold weather, um, you know heating, you know, you know, very cold weather heating versus uh, uh, is, is that and um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, areas of the city that uh, you know geothermal cannot be well utilized because of red tape and other um, impediments to deploying the technology. I hope that makes sense. And that's for sure. for 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 um, for uh, uh, John or Bill, whoever wants to take that on. Thank you very much for that question, Mr. Chair. And and that's a, an extremely important po point. You know, air source heat pumps at um, relatively mild temperatures can be fairly efficient. There, but ground source heat pumps because they rely on the temperature underground, which is constant year round. Uh, are much more efficient on the coldest and hottest days of the year. And this is really going to play out. A number of people brought up the point about, you know, the grid and, and the impact of electrification on the grid. If you're dealing with an air source heat pump and it gets down 
to a coefficient of one or one and a half uh, on the coldest days of the year, that will be problematic for the grid. We uh, realize uh, that- uh, gonna... I, 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 If you just back up, on, I, when you say a, 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 a coefficient of one or one and a half, like what does that mean? That means essentially uh, the, the same as electric resistance heat, that you're getting 100% of what you're putting out into the uh, electrically into the heating system. Whereas with geothermal on that same day, you'll be at 300 to 400%. Um, for every unit of electricity you're putting in, you're gonna be getting uh, three or four units of heat. And this right. really makes a difference when we, when we come to those coldest days. It is going to be important that we utilize air source heat pumps but wherever possible, we should be working with ground source heat pumps because of that dampening effect on peak demand. You know, you, you mentioned the, the areas of the city where geothermal might not work because you can't drill through uh, a subway tunnel or a water tunnel. And those are the places that if we electrify, it's going to be air source heat pumps or possibly water source using uh, some of the, the the heated water that's flowing through the city subways and being uh, wasted in many circumstances. But, uh, you know, we really need to focus as much as we can on ground source and make that the go-to technology supplemented by air source where it works out better in more limited circumstances. That, that would be really important advice and really important information for this panel to take particularly as you consider the electrification study bill. We have a, a presentation that we've been giving to the Public Service Commission and to the governor's office on this that we would be more than happy to take you through at some point. I, uh, I, uh, sure, I, 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 uh, um, I would direct staff to make sure that uh, that, that uh, connection is made and that I do um, uh, and that I do get the benefit of uh, it, it, it's bill, right? I'm talking, I'm talking to bill, right? Yeah. Uh, um, yes. Yes, sir. That, 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 that I get the uh, you know benefit of that presentation. This is something I want to pardon the pun, kind of like drill down on because I think this is uh, you know very important. So I I I thank you for that uh, you know clarification. I you know urge all members of the panel as all panels to send. Uh, uh, you know all of the you know all the good testimony you've given in writing, so I can study it further. And I really appreciate uh, this panel being here today, talking about geothermal. And uh, Bill, you uh, particularly for shedding light on the question that I posed. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, and now going forward, uh, Samara, I mean. Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, these are um, uh, folks with uh, you know various affiliations and are not actually paneled together, like so to speak. So, should we do one at a time on these, or how yeah, should we sure. proceed? Why not? Okay. Uh, Patrick Boyle from uh, NYSAFA. Time starts now. Muted. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, gotcha. Thanks so much. Um, my name is Patrick Boyle. I'm the director of policy for NYSAFA. We're the trade association for the affordable housing industry in New York State. Uh, we have almost 400 members, uh, developers, architects, engineers, builders, lenders uh, of affordable housing, some of which have testified uh, already in support of uh, 2317. Um, I want to thank uh, the chair and the other members of the committee for the opportunity to submit this testimony and read it. Um, I won't read it word for word in the interest of time. I'll just sort of go through um, yeah. and say that the affordable housing industry is, um, is very supportive of this, um, specifically uh, intro 2317. Um, you know, really as an industry association, we've pushed our members uh, to be very aggressive about meeting climate goals. We were supportive um, of previous climate mandates at the city and state level. Um, a lot of our members are very aggressive with respect to meeting enterprise green community standards, passive house, solar energy, green roofing, um, and a lot of electrification projects. A few of the members that have spoken and testified already um, uh, have participated in a lot of those fully electric buildings. The NYSAFA members have, uh, have contributed to the affordable housing portfolio. Um, so we're supportive of it. Um, we appreciate uh, the council making it a priority. 
Um, we do echo sort of two comments that uh, a number of previous um, speakers today touched on. Um, greater clarity is needed in the legislation on what exactly is meant by the, uh, the rehabilitations. Uh, the definition in there now doesn't conform to the, to the exact DOB code. We understand it to mean sort of major alt one uh, renovations, but that needs to be sort of made more explicit. Um, and uh, number two, uh, as has been said sort of repeatedly, uh, heat and hot water are sort of very different in terms of what's available out there now. So we support the, the phase in as it exists in this bill with respect to heat. We recommend a five year phase in with respect to, to electric hot water. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, um, thank you very much, Mr. Boyle. Everyone is, uh, I'm sure, you know, very familiar with the, uh, you know, good work of NYSAFA, and we appreciate all that you do for um, affordable housing and making that available and also trying to, you know, uh, uh, be in, in very much a part of, uh, you know, the green movement and making sure that, um, or that, that we're not, you know, sacrificing um, environmental advancement, you know, at the expense of affordable housing, we can do both at the same time. And no one has been a better exemplar of that uh, than uh, NYSAF. So thank you for being here today. I look forward to reviewing your full testimony um, in writing. Thank you. The next you. witness is Atalia Ho. How? Time's from the Community Preservation Corporation. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Gennaro and other distinguished members of the New York City Council for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Italia Howe. I am the Assistant Vice President of Initiatives and Impact Investing at the Community Preservation Corporation. We're an affordable housing and community revitalization finance company. Over our 47 year history, CPC has deployed nearly $12 billion for affordable housing and community de development, leading to the creation and preservation of nearly 220,000 units of residential housing. CPC supports the intent of intro 2317 and shares the desire to significantly reduce the city's greenhouse gas emissions. Whole building electrification represents an important step towards reaching the city and state's established climate goals. However, there are two main areas of concern. The first is that while electric solutions exist and are reaching cost parity with conventional building systems, large buildings are complex and appropriate solutions for large loads are not yet widely available. As such, we stand with our affordable housing industry partners and recommend the council adopt a five-year phase and period for large buildings to electrify specifically domestic hot water systems. Our second concern is that the bill uh, references major renovation. However, it is not defined and it should be clarified in the bill text. In the event that the council decides to include ma major renovations based on an unambiguous and, and reasonable definition in the legislation, CPC has outlined the following issues for consideration. Adequate infrastructure and adequate resources. The task of electrifying the city's building stock will require additional capital to cover the incremental costs associated with the system's improvements. Owners of small buildings and others who operate on thin margins and lack the requisite financial and technical resources, including many owners of rent regulated properties and unsubsidized affordable multifamily, will be particularly affected by a law like this and least able to comply. The council must make it financially feasible for building owners to retrofit their properties, something that is a clear precedent in our city's past. When New York City needed to revamp its housing stock in 1955, the council created the J51 tax abatement to offset costs and encourage building owners to renovate their properties. It worked. Electrification of the building stock, particularly the existing building stock, is no different. City council should look to the early success of J51 as a blueprint and recognize that it will not be enough to mandate electrification, particularly in existing buildings. Uh, 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 thank you, Ms. Howe, for your, uh, for your compelling testimony. And um, um, I, 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 I look forward to getting that in writing. And uh, you, you make several points that are, um, uh, you know, will get my full attention. So thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, the next witness is Eric Lifton of Mesh Architectures. Time starts now. Hi, uh, I'm Eric Lifton of Mesh Architectures. I'm an architect and our firm is based in Brooklyn. Um, at Mesh, we've been capping gas lines and converting cooking and heating over to electricity for several years with great results. Uh, this year, so far, we've completed two all electric row houses. We're doing a new six story building on Union Street, which is new, nearly complete. We will have no gas in it. Our heating and cooking will be done by electric heat pumps. 
We will heat our water with heat pumps and our cooking will be done on amazing induction cooktops. These systems work very well and are not particularly expensive. We will have solar panels on the roof as well, by the way. The key thing to keep in mind is that today's buildings are different from old buildings. Our buildings are insulated and air sealed. They don't need as much heat as buildings of the past. Burning fuel in our buildings is an obsolete practice. It requires exhaust flues and a steady supply of oxygen, which greatly detract from a building's energy efficiency. The old model of air leaking in and out of the building while a huge furnace blasts heat into it is long over. Today's heat pumps are incredibly efficient and effective. Cooking on induction stovetops is much safer, easier to maintain, more reliable than gas, and is a pleasure to cook on. Going all electric is very easy to do. It doesn't cost too much, it's healthier, and it prepares a building that will be around for many decades to use increasingly sustainably produced electric power. The bill should prohibit all combustion in new buildings and in renovations that replace heating systems and have an opportunity to modernize insulation. Thank you. Thank you very much for your good testimony and for all the work that you're doing uh, to show how this can be done. I look forward to uh, you reading your um, uh, remarks, which I hope that you will send along to us and uh, uh, best wishes in all your good works. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, Jim, the next testimony is from Ismael Diaz Tolentino from El Puente. Time starts now. Hello, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Ismael Diaz Tolentino and I'm the environmental justice coordinator at El Puente. El Puente is a human rights institution that promotes leadership for peace and justice through the holistic engagement of the community in the arts, education, scientific research and environmental action. We operate mainly in Williamsburg and Bushwick two low-income communities of colors that have been historically vulnerable to environmental injustices, with poor air quality being one of the most dangerous. Um, several sources contribute to poor air quality in our areas, including the traffic from the BQE, the Williamsburg Bridge, a large bus depot, and traffic associated with solid waste facilities. As we already know, the space and water heater and appliances, such as furnaces and boilers, bear in gas, gas or oil to produce heat and emit several dangerous pollutants. These include the notoriously notoriously dangerous fine particulate matter, PM2.5, and others like oxide of nitrogen and sulfur. This polluted air takes a toll in our neighborhood, and as a consequence, the rates of asthma and asthma-related hospitalizations are double across Brooklyn. Um, additionally, 6.3% of the population in our communities have reported having asthma, a percentage twice as high as the rates for New York City, respectively. Um, this environmental injustice is compounded by high levels of poverty, unemployment, and a lack of, of access to adequate health care for long-time residents. And our communities cannot be burdened with any further infrastructure that compromises the health of the residents. And we need to come together to prevent gas infrastructure that does not support the city nor state commitment to transition to clean energy. And then gas use in new constructions and would avoid large increases in air pollution from thousands of newly constructed or got renovated buildings each year, which would reduce mortality and other health effects such as asthma and other respiratory issues in our communities. For our communities to be truly healthy and sustainable, there is the need to prioritize these policy changes and, and create clean jobs while doing it. Our communities in Williamsburg and Bushwick are in support of this bill because it would translate into improved air quality I and better health for our residents. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being a, a crusader and for uh, uh, you know, doing all that you do for your local community. And I appreciate your presence here today and your patience. From now on, I'm going to start thanking everyone for the patience. We're many hours into the hearing, um, <laughs> and you. Uh, 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 and I, I appreciate you and everyone who will uh, 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 testify subsequently. Please give us your um, uh, um, testimony in writing so we can give it the the. Uh, the uh, 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 you know the deep dive that we need to do uh, uh, on it. Thank you very much for being here, uh, Chairman Janeiro. We are going to be switching moderators now, and we will be switching over to Irene. Irene Brovsky. Yes, good afternoon. Transition at four. I, Irene. <laughs> Oh, okay, oh, yes. well, so I, well yeah, but, but I, for me. yes, but I think everyone should give Samara a round of applause for everything so far. How about that? <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Samara. My so name thank is you. Thank my you. Name is Irene by Irene, 
Samaritan. Oh, I left off at Patrick Hugh Houston from New York Communities for Change. Thank you very much again, Samara. And our next panelist is Patrick Houston from New York Communities for Change. Patrick. Times. Time starts now. Okay, Hi, there guys. it is. Thank you. Um, and yes, Houston, Houston, like the city. Um, thank you. My name is Patrick Houston. Thank you for holding this hearing. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today. Um, I'm testifying on my own behalf as a younger person concerned about the climate emergency, um, but also on behalf of New York Communities for Change with whom I work. I urge the New York City Council to strengthen, then pass Introduction 2317 this year to fight climate change. The temperatures of our city, the water levels surrounding it, the frequency of flash floods and subway shutdowns are all implicated by the action we do or do not take today. I know anecdotes don't answer all of the technical questions in the bill. They can, however, put the cost of delaying or decreasing the impact of the bill into context. And we've heard several short-sighted efforts to do so today. So thus I share. In 2012, my AmeriCorps National Civilian Community Corps team and I uh, were called to assist with Hurricane Sandy response. I remember seeing the devastation. It was surreal. Boats strewn across roads, blocks in from the beachfront, sh shattered houses with backyards visible from front yards after floodwaters tore through the first floors. I remember recording families' material losses, which seemed endless, spoiled medications, totaled vehicles, lost pets, inundated basements, and first floors. Further, um, disrupted school years for many kids and families, displacement, dis depleted family savings. Um, this all rocked families and communities, all while NGOs, state and federal agencies scrambled to respond. Chaos. By not taking big climate action now, we leave open the floodgates to more of this chaos. Let's do everything in our power to avoid this future. And that means passing the strongest version of intro 2317. On that note, we urge at least two major slide. adjustments in the bill. I just finished with these two major adjustments. Um, one, shorten the timeline to one year for implementation. Two, amend the language to more clearly ensure that gut renovations are included. And further changes have been included in my written testimony, which has been submitted. Uh, um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Patrick. I, I look forward to that uh, your written testimony, and I'm happy that you have submitted that. Thank you for being a crusader and all that you do. I appreciate your patience and your, and your good testimony. And our next panelist is Kim Franchek from Sane Energy Project. Time starts now. Kim Franchek? Uh, if I could just jump in, I, I, I have in my list uh, Leroy Johnson and, Ash, and, and uh, Ashton Stewart before Kim, but I don't know if they're here. I mean, uh, I, I'm just going off my list. Yeah, currently I do not see them on the list. If they oh. will join us again, uh, we'll definitely call their names. Let's go to the next panelist. Uh, Edith Kantrovitz. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Edith Kantrovitz. I'm with United for Action, a grassroots organization fighting climate change, and I'm also affiliated with New York City Friends of Clearwater. I would like to add my voice to those who have uh, thanked the committee for having this hearing and who those who have urged in the strongest way possible that we pass intro 2317 in this session, this year, and without delay, because climate change is not delaying. We can see it, I see it right outside my window. I, I don't see the Antarctic melting, I don't see the Arctic melting, but what I do see is a tree that is green. And every other year at this time, it already turned yellow, bright yellow. And so we see that even the natural cycles of, of our trees in New York City has been disrupted, okay? I would like to also, endorse the two changes that have been suggested by many of the other speakers, that we should move from a two-year implementation framework to a one-year implementation. 
and that we should clarify the language around gut renovations to make sure that gut renovations are included. In addition to the impact on climate change, this will have tremendous impacts on our air quality in New York City. Over a thousand people a year die unnecessarily from air pollution related to buildings. And the impact of that falls more heavily on communities of color. And so by implementing this, we will be taking a big step for environmental justice. Not to add that there will be also tremendous creation of green jobs, and there will be elimination of some of the dangers that we have associated with gas explosions in buildings, providing a safer environment and a healthier environment, and a tremendous step towards containing, to whatever extent we still can contain, climate change. Anyway, thank you for your time. And please, let's make sure we pass this bill in as strong a form as possible. Uh, uh, thank you, Edith, very much for your, for your good testimony. We look forward to you submitting it to us in writing if you have not done so already. And I want to point out to Irene, I have someone on my list uh, from Sane Energy Project, Lee Zeich, it looks like. Is that on? Do you have that? Do you have that, Irene? Who was before and Edith? Is that on your Zeich. list? It could be that you're dealing with a more updated list because I got mine very early this morning. And so sometimes the staff has the latest and best list. So um, I just don't want to miss anybody that is. Oh, yeah, I, I totally understand, Chair. Yeah. I, I have my list updated. And actually, I just noticed that Kim Franchek joined us. OK. From Sane Energy Project. Yeah, she she was uh, hey, right. Thanks. You, Sorry, I had to bounce off for 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 a meeting from three to four. But um, yeah, if I could, uh, um, um, I'm the chair, and I say you're on. So you're on. Thanks. Right. Thoughts now. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Kim Frachek. I'm the director of Sane Energy Project. We represent uh, almost 17,000 New Yorkers working for the past decade to halt fossil fuels and move our economy to 100 percent community owned and led renewables. Um, it is such a pleasure to work with such a forward thinking city council and I thank you for your valiant efforts to address climate change as the crisis that is in our beloved waterfront city. Uh, we support council member Amber Samuel intro 2317 that is long overdue for New York. We must ensure that methane is no longer a part of our energy equation for heating, cooking, generating electricity in our buildings. And this bill is a major piece of the puzzle to get us to 100% sustainable and healthy city that can be resilient when the next Superstorm Sandy or Hurricane Ida hits us. Um, we also support um, council member uh, Lewis uh, 2196, which is also long overdue um, to, to ban gas and kitchen stoves. Um, we know that addressing the climate crisis also means addressing the inequitable health and economic crisis that targets low income communities and communities of color who make New York City the creative, powerful, vibrant city that it is. Uh, we know that during Michael Bloomberg's time as mayor of New York City, he did everything in his power to push for oil to gas conversions and lying to everyone that gas was somehow cleaner and greener and suppressed programs that uplifted renewable heating for buildings and pushing for the Spectre pipeline in the West Village to facilitate the connection with the fracking in PA to force consumption of fracked gas here in New York City so he could line his personal pockets that were invested in the fracking industry and now have us behind in our climate goals and now we're locked into the rising cost of infrastructure and find ourselves in this mess. Um, we also saw a lag in uh, decision making and commitments from the United States that the COP26 um, in Glasgow recently, and it's our duty as New York City to be leading this. Time um, expired. Pardon? Your time, time is up, so I'm asking you to, so we're asking you to uh, conclude. Okay, well, we, we support the bill from um, Council Member Andrew Samuel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Please submit your testimony in writing. I'm grateful that you were able to pop back in with us. Yeah. Our next panelist is Lee Zick. Ziz? Yeah, I like Zeich. If I mispronounce the name. Yeah, it's like Zeish, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. We'll, we'll, Zishi, we'll find yeah. out. How do you say right. it? Uh, Zishi, like rhymes oh, with fishy. Zishi. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I am um, Lee Zishi. I am the community engagement coordinator for St. Energy Project. 
Um, and as my colleague just said, you know, we absolutely support intro um, 2317 and we very much support making sure that it gets passed this year and it is not weakened in any way. We support the recommendations um, made by WE Act and other members of the Gas Free NYC Coalition. Um, and, you know, we cannot push this down the line anymore. St. Energy, as Kim said, has been fighting frack gas infrastructure for a decade. And for a decade, this city has been going in the wrong direction, um, believing the fossil fuel lies that gas is cheap, but just that gas is clean and that is good for our climate. Um, but what we've really been doing over the last 10 years is connecting our homes um, here in New York City through pipelines to fracking fields in Pennsylvania. Um, that is one of the most radioactive shale plays in the country. And so we are creating pathways for unhealthy gas to come directly into our city, and that is leaking all along the route. And what the actual cost of that has been is hundreds of millions of dollars on us as ratepayers. National Grid, Con Edison have continued to build pipelines um, like the North Brooklyn Pipeline, which is in council member um, Ampre Samuels district. And you know, this time last year, community members put their bodies on the line to shut down that pipeline because they understand that we have no time left. Um, so please do not weaken this bill at all. We have such little time and we have spent so much of it going in the wrong direction. Um, we know that this gas is not clean, that when it's being burned in our homes, it is unhealthy for us. We know that the methane that is leaking is just, you know, have been sending us in the wrong direction. Um, so please stand with these communities. You know, it really has been New York City communities that have led the fight to get us where we are today. And it's just so crucial that we do not waste any more time, time going in the wrong direction. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your testimony, uh, uh, Lee. And uh, please submit your comments in writing. Thank you for all of your advocacy. Thank you. And our next panelist is Karen Arpino from Northern East Hearth Patio and Barbecue Association. Time starts now. It's the Northeast Hearth Patio Barbecue Association. Thank you so much for having me today. I represent the Hearth patio and barbecue retailers in the Northeast, Northeast, which is New England and New York. While considering this uh, legislation today, it's important to consider that during a time in which natural gas use and infrastructure has expanded across the state, um, CO2 has uh, been reduced. CO2 emissions have been reduced. This season, we've already had four weather-related power outages that have had homes and businesses, business owners relying on gas, oil, and wood for heat. Additionally, the economic impacts of full electrification on working families and small businesses, as well as those in environmental justice communities, would be costly with today's rising costs and increasing, and increasing energy prices, price, prices. The consequences of policies that ban affordable energy always hit hardest those who can afford at least the Northeast HPBA uh, is concerned with the hyper-focus on electrification. Currently in New York, three out of five homes or nearly 60% of homes rely on natural gas for home heating, and it provides over 40% of the state's power generation. According to the Energy Information Administration winter fuel forecast, the average U.S. residential gas customer will, will pay 572 for energy, energy this winter compared with 1,209 for households using electricity for heating. That's a difference of 111%. New York area households already pay more than 50% more for electricity than the national average. In the last decades, New York has had the country's biggest increase in the number of households using natural gas as a heating fuel source, according to the US Census. Between 2005 and 2014, the number of New York natural gas customers went from 3.7 to 4.2. This is an increase of over 500,000 households and is more than the net increase in the rest of the country combined. Yet still in the last several years- Time expired. Uh, uh, please conclude, uh, 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 please conclude. Despite that, in the last decade, CO2 emissions have gone down 18%. I submitted my uh, testimony written. Thank you so much for the time today. Uh, 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 thank you, Karen. I appreciate you being here. And uh, 
Thanks for your patience and waiting to testify and thank you for your good testimony. I My pleasure, it. thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. Our next panelist is Moira McComas from Supportive Housing Network of New York. Time starts now. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Maura McComas. I'm a policy analyst. Um, sorry, one moment, pulling up my script. I'm a policy analyst at the Supportive Housing Network for New York. Hello, Chair Gennaro uh, uh, and members of the Committee on Environmental <laughs> Protection. Sorry about that. No, uh, it's, it's all good. <laughs> OK, uh, so the network is a membership organization, and we represent over 200 nonprofit members who operate and develop supportive housing. Uh, in doing so, we also strive to keep the best interests of tenants and staff a priority. So supportive housing is permanent affordable housing with embedded social services for eligible individuals and families. So those who are experiencing chronic homelessness and living with disabilities. Uh, the network has over 100 corporate members as well, including tax credit syndicators, banks, and other financial institutions. So thank you for this opportunity to submit testimony regarding intro 2091. So the network supports many of the goals of this legislation and appreciates the attention on the feasibility component of city, uh, city measures to decarbonize New York City's buildings. Um, ultimately, we understand the city's emission reducing targets and initiatives aim to provide equitable uh, that benefit the community suffering the worst impacts of pollution. So we wanna underscore just a few specific concerns um, <clears throat> and then provide some recommendations. So we have overall concerns with electrification initiatives. Um, they are gonna take a massive public investment and any reg regulations must be paired um, with uh, programs that ensure we're not diverting limited resources from the development of supportive housing. Uh, so as the network supports the feasibility assessments, um, but we need uh, and hope that this legislation will be used to identify any issues um, that would disrupt the pipeline, uh, preventing preservation efforts and future development. So we can't allow uh, people experiencing homelessness to suffer as a result of these climate goals. The cost of any required rehab or system upgrades needs to be addressed in the assessment um, and then worked to the parameters of city term sheets. And I just have one more point here. I know time expired. Um, uh, so uh, 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 um, what I will do, uh, uh, um, yep. um, I will assert my prerogative as chair and uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, um, uh, 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 yeah, just, uh, just to let you, you know, finish your thought. And then I have a okay. question for you. Sure, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so uh, there's no mention of a timetable in the legislation for disseminating information to the community and arriving at outcomes. We just need to ensure all assessments are completed and ensuring resources are put in place prior to deadlines. Um, and we'd also, uh, you know, we've heard testimony on 2317. We'd like to, the committee to consider adding feasibility studies, not just for existing buildings, but for new construction. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah you know what, uh, uh, the, the question, because you were testifying on, you know, 2091, and we appreciate yeah. your, uh, you know, comprehensive uh, 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 testimony on that uh, intro, because, um, you know, the other two bills today have been kind of in the shadow of, 2317, and yeah. I was wondering uh, whether you thought that that 2317 should be sequenced after the completion of 2091. Is that what you're getting at? Because uh, the outputs from the study from 2091 will inform 2317. I don't want to put words in your mouth. I just want to make sure that that's your position. I Yes, and we've also reached out to New York City Accelerator, and we want to get their opinion as well on what and how those timelines uh, align with Local Law 97 and, and other local laws. So I, I'm looking for some more clarification on that. But we need the feasibility study to, like, as you said, inform 2371. And um, but with, with that, we need to know what the feasibility is and the timeline and the costs associated with new construction, because 2091 is just focusing on existing. Right. OK, so. Um... So again, not to put words in your mouth, but your position on on two three one seven would be to hold and assess, right? Is that is that is that is that a fair statement? I mean, we are in support of of two one three seven, um, but we just want to make sure that uh, uh, two three one seven uh, two three uh, two three one yeah. seven. For the record, oh. yeah, um, oh. but yeah, we, we would want to see the feasibility studies, um, and it could be concurrent, but we need to know what is going to happen with two three one seven, and what the cost feasibility assessment is going to be. And and, and uh, you, your business is uh, supportive housing, and um, uh, um, 
it, and you indicated some concerns about the future development of supportive housing in the face of you know bills that we're trying to advance. Could you um, sure. articulate a little more on what your concerns are with regard to supportive housing um, with respect to this uh, um, to these bills? Absolutely, and thanks for the focus on this for a moment. Um, so there's currently a lack of dedicated and reliable funding to achieve climate goals, especially regarding the financial burden that's going to be disproportionately put on the developers of supportive housing. Um, so we just don't want any regulations to um, impede the future pipeline. And so we are looking for outcomes of the feasibility assessment. And when you say pipeline, you mean the pipeline of making supportive housing, right? Yep, supportive housing units, yes. Because pipeline is kind of like a loaded term in this hearing today, you know, sure. so... Ah, fair enough. Yes. Um, so it, what, what we need is to make sure that policy goals match the underwriting realities. Um, term fees need to be increased to meet climate goals. And if that's since that's the case, the city's housing budget must also be increased commensurately to ensure that we maintain production. Um, so, uh, I, yeah. So I, I, I thank you. And I, I, I look forward to um, for your for, uh, to your written testimony and uh, uh, what is your title with regard to the organization Supportive Housing New York? What's your title? I'm a policy analyst. Policy analyst. Okay. Yes. Uh, well, uh, uh, Moira, thank you very much for your uh, for your testimony and your patience, and uh, we look forward to your written testimony. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McComas. Chair, our next panelist is Michelle Hook from New Yorkers for Affordable Energy Coalition. Unfortunately, I do not see Ms. Hook online right now. I will circle back. And I now would like to call our next panelist. And the next panelist is Hillary Iden from Earth Justice. Good afternoon. My name is Hillary A. Dune, and I'm an attorney at Earth Justice. We support intro 2317 and urge the council to adopt the bill but lower the emissions threshold. Electrifying buildings is a key component of addressing both climate change and the even more immediate public health threats posed by fossil fuels. Burning fossil fuels in buildings contributes to dangerous air pollution, both indoors and outdoors. Stoves and heating appliances that use gas or oil emit nitrogen dioxide, which causes learning deficits, aggravated respiratory systems, and changed lung functions as well as particulate matter, which can increase the risk of heart and asthma attacks and lead to premature death. Communities of color are exposed to higher levels of this pollution than the general population. Intro 2317 will make a meaningful contribution to addressing these problems by supporting the transition to a more sustainable building stock rather than further entrenching reliance on natural gas. But we urge the council to revise the bill to make sure that this outcome is achieved. The bill's current emissions threshold would prohibit the combustion of pure natural gas in new buildings. But we are concerned that an emissions rate of 50 kilograms of carbon dioxide per million BTU creates a loophole that could unintentionally allow continued reliance on natural gas and incentivize the use and expansion of other dangerous fuel sources like hydrogen. Because combusting hydrogen does not produce carbon dioxide, blending hydrogen with natural gas is often touted as a way to make natural gas cleaner. But nearly all hydrogen is produced using fossil fuels through an energy intensive process that generates significant greenhouse gas emissions. And when combusted, hydrogen can emit even higher quantities of nitrogen dioxide than natural gas. An emission standard that could be met by a hydrogen natural gas fuel blend would threaten New Yorkers' health by increasing nitrogen dioxide emissions and allow the use of natural gas in new buildings. For these reasons, we urge the council to pass intro 2317, but reduce the emissions threshold so that the bill would preclude the use of hydrogen natural gas fuel blends in addition to preventing the use of pure natural gas in new buildings. And for further information, I'll refer you to my written testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hillary. We uh, uh, appreciate your testimony, your patience, the good points that you made, and uh, your uh, service to the great organization, Earth Justice. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Our next panelist is Lisa DiCaprio from NYU Sierra Club. Hello. Yes, I'm here. Well, my, may I speak? Uh, yes. Uh, 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 yes, you're on. Okay. All right. My name is Lisa DiCaprio. I am a professor of social sciences in the Division of Applied Undergraduate Studies in NYU School of Professional Studies. 
and serve as a coordinator of our new Bachelor of Science in Real Estate and Urban Sustainability. I am also a member of several environmental organizations, including the Sierra Club, which is playing an important role in the all-electric building campaigns in the United States. The Sierra Club New York City group has endorsed Intro 2317. I am going to abbreviate my comments. Uh, I did submit my written testimony here several main points. One, electricity is the only form of energy with the potential to be obtained entirely from renewable sources. The electrification of buildings is a global movement and an essential corollary to the greening of the electricity grid throughout the world. Two, intro 2317 is designed to preempt legal challenges. Three, gas stoves contribute to indoor air pollution as documented in recent studies by the Rocky Mountain Institute, Harvard University, and UCLA. Four, all electric buildings are technically feasible, as demonstrated by the increasing number of new and retrofitted all electric buildings in the U.S. and throughout the world, as pointed out by several architects who gave testimony today. Moreover, the NYSERDA Buildings of Excellence Competition Award, which was initiated in 2019, includes several all electric building projects. You may see the projects at the Buildings of Excellence website round 1 2020 and round 2 2021. This demonstrates NYSERDA's confidence in all electric buildings. Four all electric buildings are economically feasible because electricity is a more efficient source of energy than natural gas or oil. Five, the electrification of buildings must be accompanied by the reduction of energy consumption. Therefore, new and substantially retrofitted buildings that are all electric should achieve the criteria required for a green building certification, such as passive house lead, living building challenge, and net zero energy buildings. There are, for example, several passive house all electric buildings in progress or already constructed in New York City. And finally, scientific reports I'm on climate change. I, I, I wanted to, con sure, I I, to just include one sentence. Yeah, please scientific include. All right, scientific reports on climate change issued this year highlight why we must simultaneously, and I'm emphasizing simultaneously in response to some of the comments made by speakers today, accelerate the electrification of buildings, reduction of energy consumption by green building design, and the greening of the electricity grid. As UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez emphasized in his statement on the August 9, 2021 UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, quote, this is code red for humanity, end quote. Uh, thank you, Lisa, for being here and for your service to the Sierra Club and for uh, uh, all the things you do to try to uh, advance uh, sound environmental policy. I think you indicated you sent your uh, comments in already. Did you? Yes, I did. And, okay, and what good. I read today good. is an abbreviated version of those comments. Yes, uh, I, I look forward to reading your comments in full. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for the hearing. You bet. Thank you, Professor DiCaprio. And our next panelist is... Ann Pernick from Safe Cities. I'm starts now. There we are. Hi. Thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today. I'm Ann Pernick. I'm the Safe Cities and Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Community Manager at Stand Out Earth. And I'm connecting to you actually from Portland, Oregon, because New York City is a leader in the Safe Cities movement. It's an international movement where local governments around the world use their authority to stop fossil fuel expansion and phase out fossil fuels. With passage of intro 2317, you have an opportunity to remain a leader for this movement and for all New Yorkers. This year has brought more devastating and deadly climate change impacts to New York. It's clear the consequences of fossil fuels are only getting worse for New Yorkers and for people around the world. Meanwhile, the fossil fuel industry and other vested interests are still pushing business as usual. It's exciting that this important bill, intro 2317, more fondly known as Gas Free NYC, is getting a hearing today. New York needs to, to continue to say no to fossil fuels. The positive impacts of passing gas free NYC on local health, including asthma rates in kids, local safety, and global climate, will be enormous. That's why hundreds of our standout Earth community around the city reached out to the council to urge you and your council colleagues to do three things to ban new hookups of dangerous, unhealthy methane gas, which we're talking about today, to defend local law 97, and to join the call for international action on fossil fuels by endorsing the Fossil Fuel Non Proliferation Treaty which has had a hearing, but not yet a vote by this committee. We applaud the leadership of council member Ampri Samuel and are honored to be here today, along with the local advocates who have been leading this fight to ban new gas hookups. NYPIRG, New York Communities for Change, We Act for Environmental Justice, and Food and Water Watch. In partnership with them 
and with many others, our community urges a yes vote on intro 2317 by this committee and swift passage by the full council to protect health and safety around New York City and climate here and around the world. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you, Anne, very much for being here and for your patience. Um, uh, and I uh, look forward to reading your comments in full. Uh, uh, if you can send those along. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. You bet. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Pernick, for your testimony. And our next panelist is Emma Urofsky from WE ACT. Time starts now. Hello, my name is Emma Urofsky. I'm studying sustainable development and I'm a member of WE ACT for Environmental Justice. I'm here today in support of Intro 2317 and to urge you, members of City Council, to pass this bill now with the urgency the climate crisis demands. Optimistically, this bill would be a notable stride towards phasing out toxic gas, oil, and all the incredibly deadly pollution that comes with the use of these fuels. Upwards of a thousand New Yorkers are killed every single year from burning fossil fuels, including natural gas, in the buildings we learn, eat, sleep, worship, and love in. The main opponents to this bill are the real estate lobby and ExxonMobil, two actors that profit obscenely by ruining the lives and health of working class people and people of color. Unsurprisingly, the API is also lobbying against this bill. I'm so sick and tired of watching this pattern play out again and again on multiple scales of governance. Everyday people take time out of our already busy days, time that could be spent resting, studying, socializing, or taking care of our loved ones to fight for what is now the bare minimum of what is needed to do damage control for the climate crisis, while a small group of wealthy white individuals leverage systems of violence and oppression to delay any meaningful action so they can continue to make more money than they could possibly spend in their lifetimes at the expense of literally every other living thing on this planet. For longer than I've been alive, the fossil fuel industry has been succeeding in delaying climate action. Their goal has literally been to delay. I'm asking our city representatives, don't let them delay any longer. This is urgent. Legislation like this should have been passed in the 1970s. I'm terrified of what's to come and what is already here. I don't wanna get asthma from living in the city or drown in a basement the next time there's a hurricane. I don't want my neighbors to either. We need to stop using fossil fuels to keep each other safe and healthy. It is your job to help the people who live here and you can do this by passing intro 2317. Thank you for allotting me time to speak I hope you do what is best for our city and for our planet. You actually have the power to make a better world. Don't waste it bending to a decades old fossil fuel propaganda campaign. Pass intro 2317 today. Uh, uh, thank you, Emma. It is a privilege to have you with us today. I thank you for your, uh, for your patience and for your testimony. I look forward to receiving it in writing if you'd be so kind to do so. And I thank you for your service to the great organization we act. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Ms. Yurovsky. And our next panelist is Gina Kruzik from Water, I'm sorry, from Food and Water Watch. Hello, everyone. My name is Gina Kruzic. I'm currently a student intern with Food and Water Watch. I'm here to testify in favor of intro 2317 and urge the council to pass it immediately. Intro 2317 is not only feasible, as we've heard the experts talk about all day, but it's your obligation to your constituents. The city's own Office of Climate and Sustainability reports that over 70% of our city's greenhouse gas emissions come from our buildings. To take meaningful action in our fight against climate change and meet our own carbon neutrality goals by 2050, we must demand that no new construction has the archaic, problematic, and counterintuitive fossil fuel infrastructure. Other cities like Oakland and Seattle already passed similar laws and enacted them within a year. The two-year period this bill is asking for is incredibly lenient compared to that. I will also ask those who are still skeptical or in opposition, why? The opposition is largely coming from the Real Estate Board of New York and ExxonMobil. We have let real estate dictate what goes on in the city for far too long, and it has created a city where many cannot afford to live and promoted fundamental changes to many of our neighborhoods. We have to live in this city, not ExxonMobil. What is New York City to them except our money? It's also worth repeating that climate change is already front and center. 
the city, New York City and state both have carbon neutrality goals to meet. How are we going to meet them if we don't take decisive action and set the precedent for a fossil free, fuel free future? If this is the direction we are heading towards anyway, why resist it? And for all the elected officials who will not be returning to city council in the upcoming year, do something incredible before you go and pass intro 2317 now. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate uh, 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 Gina. Yes, I'm sorry. I, I have so many, so, so many names on the list. Uh, uh, and thank you for your patience, for your testimony. We look forward to getting it writing and for your good service. So are you, you're an intern, right? For Food and Water Watch, right? Okay, whoops. Okay, I guess they muted you. So- uh, <laughs> Yes, uh, correct. Uh, 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 um, thank you very much for being here and for your, um, uh, in, for your passion to try to create a better world. This is a wonderful thing to see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And our next panelist is Sabrina Maharaj from New York Public Interest Research Group. Time starts now. Ms. Maharaj? Why don't we uh, why don't we pass and circle back? Absolutely. Uh, our next panelist is Dorian Fulfio from 350 NYC. Time starts now. Hi, thank you, council members and Chair Gennaro. Um, my name is Dorian Fulvio, and I'm a lifelong New Yorker, a retired public servant, and an active member of 350 NYC. I support intro 2317, the gas-free NYC bill, and I urge the council to do the same, to strengthen the bill and to escalate its passing this year. I worked for the city in information technology, and I also served for about 15 years as my agency's disaster recovery coordinator. I bring this up because I, along with many others, had to manage the chaos of Hurricane Sandy and saw firsthand how the city struggled to deal with infrastructure failure and our first experience having 300,000 public employees unable to go to work. I vowed that when I retired that I would do whatever I could to fight climate change and prevent this from happening to my city again or any city. And my testimony today is part of that commitment. There are powerful vested interests working to maintain the status quo, to lie to us, feed us disinformation and delay action to reduce our use of fossil gas. As a result of their efforts, we've already seen massive failure at the federal level and in COP26 at the international level as well. At the local level, we cannot afford to sit idly by. It will be our responsibility to clean up and pay for this mess locally. New York City and state must act now because state and local action is our last best hope for reducing climate change. Intro 2317 will allow us to take immediate and definitive steps to reduce greenhouse gas emissions Time by, stopping new, by stopping new infrastructure from being built, intro 2317 will prevent millions of metric tons of climate pollution from heating our city and our planet. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, Dorian. Thank you for your long service to the city and for your ongoing service uh, to uh, quests that uh, you think need to be fought and won. And um, uh, I also appreciate that you're part of 350 NYC. Um, please submit your uh, comments in writing. And um, thank you very much for having the patience to be with us all these hours. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chair Donato. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, again. And our next panelist is Monica Weiss from 350 NYC. Time starts now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, preempt my own testimony because in the interest of not being redundant, there's very little that hasn't already been said. 
Um, my name is Monica Weiss. I'm a retired New York City educator. I'm a member of 350 NYC, and I want to speak in support of this bill. Um, what I'd like to do first is give a shout out to Dr. Leah Stokes, because basically what she said, and I'm going to leave it at that, articulate, intelligent, thoughtful, and absolutely correct. Um, also, I'm going to pick up on Eric Weltman's comment that what happens in New York does not stay in New York, which is absolutely true. If anyone on this Zoom has not yet seen the climate clock at Union Square, I strongly urge you to take a look. We were the first city in the world to have a climate clock installed, and it was installed about a year and a half ago at Union Square. And the clock itself has two running streams of information. The first one is a deadline, which essentially calculates the remaining carbon budget globally, of course, not just in New York City, and how much time is remaining until we use up the entire carbon budget on Earth. That's about seven years. That line is moving very quickly. And the one beneath it is in green, which reflects the lifeline, which gives information about the amount of clean energy being supported and used and generated. And that number is at about 12%. So those two streams of information uh, correlate. And whatever you do on the city council, you need to pay attention to the deadline and to the lifeline. Because if the deadline reaches zero before the lifeline reaches 100%, I'm ended. Um, we're in trouble. So I ask you in all, thank you, in all of your deliberations to consider the urgency of this issue when you consider the solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. I appreciate uh, uh, you've, your patience. Uh, please send us your uh, comments. If you can reduce them to writing, that, that would be helpful to us. And thank you for your service to uh, uh, 350 NYC, a great organization. We appreciate you being here. Thank you. Our next panelist is Candy Kane from 350 NYC. Time starts now. Mm -hmm. Hello. Um, my name is Candy Kane, and I live in Stuyvesant Town, Peter Cooper Village. I have lived here since August 1986. 35 years. Passage of intro to 2317 could not come soon enough for the residents of Stuyvesant Town, Peter Cooper Village. As our landlord, the private equity group Blackstone, with a market capitalization of around $110 billion, wants to build two fossil fuel plants right on the property of Stuyvesant Town. In fact, They've already built one on Avenue C and 15th Street and has plans to build an even larger one on 20th Street. We need to pass intro 2317 now. Stuyvesant Town, Peter Cooper Village already has the distinction of being the neighborhood with the second worst air quality in the city. Because we live across the street from Con Edison which burns huge amounts of fossil fuel to power all of lower Manhattan. And because we live across the street from the FDR Drive, where fossil fuel burning cars and trucks traffic it all day and all night. I am gasping at the thought of what we are breathing. New York City cannot wait to pass intro 2317. New York City thinks of itself as a world leader in every arena. It must lead the world in new power technologies. It was already devastated in 2012 by Superstorm Sandy. Superstorm Sandy pushed the Atlantic Ocean northward through the Bay of New York and up the East River, causing the East River to surge over the river's banks. The aforementioned Con Edison. Time expired. Uh, please conclude, Candy. Go ahead. Which sits right there at the conjunction of the East River and Stuyvesant Cove was flooded. It blew up and shut down. And when it shut down, all of Manhattan below 39th Street shut down for a week. Thank you very much.
The council needs to pass 2317 now and to commit our city to a clean future. This matter is urgent and the time is now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Candy, for your patience. We appreciate receiving. Oh, wow, we have, we have, a, uh, we have a pause. We have a pause. Okay. Thank you. Um, it, it's, always, it, it's always good to have supporters. And uh, yes. uh, uh, thank you for uh, advocating on behalf of Stytown and your experiences and um, how we can um, be a force for positive change. Please send us your comments in writing if you're able to do that and we would appreciate that. We appreciate that very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mr. Gennaro. Thank you. Thank you again, Ms. Keene. Thank you, Chair. And our next panelist is Jane Selden. Time starts now. Hello, my name is Jane Selden. I'm a retired New York City Community College instructor and a member of 350 NYC. I support intro 2317 because I'm deeply concerned that we are continuing to build fossil fuel infrastructure, including two new frac gas power plants in my neighborhood, Stuyvesant Town, when we need to be transitioning without delay to fossil free renewable energy. If we continue to allow gas infrastructure, we are locking ourselves into many more years of the pollution that endangers the health of our communities and will lead to climate chaos. Passing 2317 is an essential step forward, but the city and state can and must do more. They need to deny permits for any new fossil fuel infrastructure, whether it be peaker plants, pipelines, or CHP, combined heat and power plants, like the ones being built on the grounds of Stuyvesant Town. The owners of Stuyvesant Town, the Blackstone Group, a private equity firm, recently built a fracked gas CHP plant on Avenue C, just steps away from the huge Con Ed power plant on 14th Street and plans to construct a second larger plant between two residential buildings on 20th Street. The electricity produced by these plants will not go to the tenants, but instead will be sold to Con Ed. However, we, the residents, will be the direct recipients of the plant's toxic emissions. Our community already suffers from the second worst air quality in the city because of its close proximity to the Con Ed plant and FDR Drive. Allowing these plants to operate will not only exacerbate this deadly pollution, but is also a 20 year commitment to continued reliance on fossil fuels. We are already experiencing the devastating effects of the climate crisis. The time to stop further fossil fuel infrastructure is now. I urge the city council to pass 2317 without delay. And I urge city and state agencies to stop issuing permits for additional fossil fuel infrastructure, including the ones for Stuyvesant Town's combined heat and power. Plant. Time expired. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jane. Thank you for your, uh, uh, like candy, your, um, advocating on behalf of your um, community, and you spent hours to, uh, you know, give your voice to this to this hearing, and we do appreciate that, and we look forward to receiving your uh, testimony in writing if you could do that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next panelist is Anne Logan. Time starts now. Hello. Um, first of all, I'd really like to thank you for continuing this hearing rather than cutting it off before hearing from unaffiliated individuals like me. I do appear at these things from time to time and I have been left waiting at the end of a period before, so thank you. Oh, you bet. Um, sure. I appreciate it. Others have spoken about the two primary details that need to be changed. One is to shorten the period before it becomes effective, and the other one is to define gut renovation. But I'm here about something more personal. When I was thinking about where to retire, I chose New York and New York City in part because of its leading position on issues that progressives like me really care about. One of them certainly was pure water, which New York has made a point of preserving. Another one, however, was fossil fuels. At the time when I moved here, which was just after 9-11, I thought that the climate crisis was something that wasn't going to affect me, that it was going to develop gradually 
and that I would be dead, frankly, before it got too bad. I was wrong. The infamous end of the hockey stick that goes straight up is happening now during my lifetime. We can see measurable changes in everything from wildfires to temperatures to the acidity of oceans and more. We cannot afford to move slowly. We can be deliberate, we can be well-informed, but we have to move expeditiously. Time expired. Uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, sure, sure. Go ahead, Anne. I just wanted to say, yes, I know there may be speed bumps, although I have confidence in the human ability to get past them. And yes, we may need to support financial support for those who are adversely affected, but we have to make changes now. We cannot afford to wait. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and <clears throat> let me just thank you for being the first one <clears throat> to bring up the issue of uh, ocean acidification, <clears throat> as you and perhaps many other people on the Zoom may know or may not. <clears throat> about <clears throat> about a third of uh, uh, about a third of greenhouse gases are absorbed, uh, you know, by the ocean, and that produces carbonic acid. Uh, the process is called ocean acidification, although, you know, it's really, they're really getting less alkaline, really, because if the oceans ever do cross that uh, barrier and to like a pH of, you know, less than seven, like we're all dead already. <clears throat> but I served as the chair of the you know, New York State Task Force on Ocean Acidification. <clears throat> um, that was uh, 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 that was a, a, a law that was passed by my uh, uh, by my mentor Steve Engelbright. And I was working on that when I was the a deputy commissioner at you know DEC, and um, um, and it doesn't get as much attention as it should. Thank you for raising that issue. Thank you for being here. And I don't care how long hearings go on. I am here for as long as it takes to hear everyone's voice. Uh, you know, particularly yours, Anne. So thank you for being here and advocating for your community. Thank you. The, you this, this matters so much. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Ms. Logan. And our next panelist is Ross Pinkerton. I'm starts now. Hi, thank you, uh, everyone, for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, and for your time and efforts to deal with this critical issue. Uh, as a physics teacher in Manhattan, I've long been concerned about climate change and its effects on my students' future. And clearly after the summer storms and as the previous speakers have said on our city right now. Um, but in addition, I recently became concerned about the air quality and health impact of gas appliances, um, both on my two sons, including Leo here in our apartment and on my neighbors in East Harlem. I thought it would be easy to replace my gas stove and water heater with electric appliances, but I discovered that my fairly new building, which was built in 2013, was not designed to supply enough current to each apartment to electrify those appliances. I have the resources, fortunately, that I'll be able to fund retrofits, but it will be much more cost effective to build new construction with electrical appliances in mind. And the bill will also help ensure that the benefits reach lower income New Yorkers and prevent greater environmental inequity across communities, as Ismail and other speakers so eloquently pointed out. And um, just to respond to some of the kind of misdirection from opponents, there are cases where blends, including biodiesel, may be better than old heating oil systems. And I'm sure they will continue to have a use for the many buildings and heavy vehicles that continue to use fuel during the long transition it will take to replace all of New York's infrastructure, but we need to not lock in future need for blends or even for full biodiesel because of the ongoing carbon and particulate emissions. So we should not make a blanket exemption for biodiesel um, as some people argued. Instead, we should acknowledge that even with this great bill, we're gonna have a, a lengthy transition and we will make use of those as they are a little bit better, just like natural gas may be still a little bit better than some others, but we shouldn't lock in more use. Thank you very much. 
Well, uh, 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 thank you, Ross, and thank you, Leo, uh, for uh, you know participating in this uh, uh, in this hearing. This hearing is about you, Leo. I hope you're listening to us. And uh, uh, you know, thank you, Ross, for giving this personal story about how you wanted to retrofit, and then you know you gotta you know do it the hard way, and some people just aren't in a position to do that. And so, thank you for your patience. Thank you for being a great dad and for uh, 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 and for being with us today. Please submit your comments in writing if you'd be so gracious to do that. I will, thank you. Thank you. Shiar, I see that Ms. Sabrina Maharaj from New York Public Interest Research Group is online. And I would like to call her next. Hi, my name is Sabrina. I am a student at BMCC. I am interning with New York Public Interest Research Group. Thank you and, and the committee for your time. I support Gas Free NYC Bill Intro 2317, whose primary sponsor member is con Council Member Alika Ampri. Samuel, I support this bill because in order to halt the worst effects of climate change, we need to move away from fossil fuels and electrifying buildings is a path towards that goal. Buildings emit 70% of NYC's greenhouse gases, which pollute the air and contribute to the climate crisis. Plus, it uses dangerous fracking gas, which pollutes our water as well. We need to make sure all buildings in the future are running on electricity, not gas, for a fossil fuel-free future. This issue is also very personal. I have rel relatives that passed away from the Ida storm, there was flooding in their basement while they were protecting themselves from the tornado warning. These relatives were part of the 11 other people in NYC that perish from the extreme weather. If we do not stop the worst effects of climate change, there will be more people who have similar fates. I don't want anyone dying from massive floods in the future. This is why I support in, Intro 2317 to make sure all new construction and new buildings is not hooked up to gas. Thank you for your time and please pass Gas Free NYC. Thank you, Sabrina. We appreciate um, uh, you, you know, coming back to be with us. Uh, if you could please uh, uh, submit your testimony uh, in writing, uh, that would be great to have for us to continue to study and uh, we really appreciate you being here and for your supportive comments. Our next panelist is Miles McManus. Fine starts now. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Miles McManus. I live in Manhattan and I'm here to support intro 2317. Um, recent findings from New York's Climate Action Council which is planning the implementation of the CLCPA, actually provide another reason uh, that I think this bill needs to move faster. Um, the council posted their initial analysis and some draft scenarios on October 14th. And that draft confirms that, quote, more rapid and widespread end use electrification and efficiency, end quote, is needed uh, to achieve the mandates. Uh, just to give one example, the council scenarios project it will take 30 years to retire existing gas powered space heating as it reaches the end of its life cycle and gets replaced with electric. Uh, it just takes a long time to make the transition gentle for current gas users. And of course, that gas will continue to harm New Yorkers health and the climate as it very slowly phases out. Um, there is a cost benefit analysis included in their latest report as well, which shows very high costs to the state and very high benefits, financial benefits to moving faster. Uh, now, of course, as we've seen, the real estate and petroleum lobbies and other vested interests are gonna use every trick in the book to slow this down. 
but big cities like Seattle, San Jose, and Oakland already have gas bans in place, and green building techniques are mature and widespread. So the technology and the industry are ready, and we have no time to spare. So please speed it up. The bill should take effect one year after passage, not two. And please ensure that it clearly covers gut renovations and bans all new fossil fuel hookups, including false solutions like biofuels and blends. The bottom line is every new gas hookup installed today increases emissions. And that's exactly what the CLCPA promised to stop across the state. Please pass intro 2317, protect our communities, and help New York start keeping its promises. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. McManus, for your compelling testimony uh, and for your patience in waiting this long to deliver it. Uh, we look forward to getting your testimony in writing if you have not done so already. Thank you. Thank you again for your testimony. And our next panelist is Delia Kulkundus. Time starts now. Thank you for holding this hearing and allowing members of the public to speak to you today. My name is Delia Kulakundas and I live in Long Island City. I'm here to voice my enthusiastic support for Intro 2317, the gas-free NYC bill, and to urge the council to make it take effect earlier in one year instead of two, and to clearly include gut renovations as well. By now you know that if we, need, if we want to avert catastrophic climate change and ensure a livable future, Every new machine that we install must be electric. If we continue to install new gas burning appliances, we'll either have to retire them early or accept the decades of emissions that they lock in. I urge you to consider that with gas, those emissions don't just occur when we burn it, but all along the leaky pipeline routes that bring it into the city, all the way back to the fields where it was fracked and flared in the first place. It's great that we banned fracking in the state, but we should make fracking obsolete. Right now, as members of this council, you have the ability to ensure that new buildings will be combustion free, saving everyone from more costly retrofits later and making the air cleaner for everyone. Your constituents don't wanna be stuck with stranded assets in their homes and buildings, and you have the ability to prevent that. So I ask you to stand strong. Don't let Rebney and Exxon scare you. The rest of the fossil fuel lobby would like you to stay paralyzed with guilt about your personal carbon footprint and keep you distracted with false promises of hydrogen or biofuels or whatever technology they promise to come up with sometime in a decade. Ignore it and ignore the calls to delay. We have the technology now and the ability to solve climate change now. And the first step is electrifying everything, starting with new buildings. Please pass intro 2317 now. Thank you so much to council member Ampri Samuel for your leadership and for everyone's patience and perseverance and for letting us you know, speak from the public. Thank you. Thank you, Delia. Um, we appreciate your patience and your compelling testimony. Uh, please submit it to us in, in writing and um, um, and and, and, um, uh, and I found your testimony compelling and I appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Colquindus and thank you, Chair. And now, my colleague Nadia Johnson will continue moderating the hearing. Hi, this is Nadia Johnson. I am the Senior Policy Analyst for the Committee on Environmental Protection, and I will be completing the moderating tasks for this hearing. And I would like to call on our- Thank you, Nadia. Thank you, Nadia. I appreciate it. Of course. I'd like to call on our next uh, participant, Stuart Waldman. Time starts now. Yes, um, my name is Stu Waldman. I'm a retired children's book publisher who morphed into a climate activist when my granddaughter was born. I never imagined I'd spend my golden years committing multiple acts of civil disobedience. When you were 80, sitting bent over and handcuffed in the back of a police van is an act of pure desperation. But desperation is exactly how I feel at this moment. Two years ago, New York City declared a climate emergency. The definition of emergency by Webster Dictionary is a dangerous situation requiring immediate attention. I refer to the last two words, action and immediate. 20 years ago, we might have been able to hedge on a bill like intro 237. We could do what I heard people earlier today did. 
you know, suggests. We could commission studies. We could delay implementation. implementation. We could use phrases like as soon as possible. Give a little to environmentalists. Give a little to Redney. Tell everyone we'll get it right the next time. But climate legislation is different. Nature doesn't compromise. Halfway isn't good enough. And we're at a moment where there is no next time. This is a state of emergency, a dangerous situation requiring immediate attention, action. They didn't get the troops off the beaches of Dunkirk as soon as possible. They did what they had to. A robust intro 237 were, would result in significant reduction of emissions. Of course, one bill in one city won't keep the world at 1.5 degrees. New York isn't just another city. What we do here about the climate sends a powerful message to our state, our country, and the world. Let that message be we're willing to not just make declarations of an emergency, I'm expired. but act as if there is one. Years from now, our children and grandchildren will look back at this moment and ask, what did they do when they knew? Let's hope the answer will be the right thing. Thank you. Stuart, uh, thank you for being here. I gave you extra time on behalf of your grandchildren, okay? And so uh, uh, thank you for your passion. Don't get locked up anymore, okay? You know, and- uh, I can't promise. Okay, okay. Fair enough. Uh, please send us your comments in writing and appreciate your passionate advocacy. Thank you. We now call on Samantha Galanti. Time starts now. Hi, thank you. My name is Samantha Galanti. I am a full-time college student and I have successfully completed training in the Climate Reality Leadership Courts. I'm speaking before you today to discuss the urgency and necessity of passing intro 2317. It has been recorded that 19 of the hottest years have occurred since 2000 as a result of global warming pollution. As a person born in the year 2002, I live with the unsettling reality that I was born into a climate crisis that was created entirely without my assistance. This alarming reality is enough of a reason to stress the urgency of putting an end to the use of gas in new constructions and gut renovations. If the bill is passed, it will aid in the reduction of air pollution and emissions that heavily contributes to global warming and increasingly deadly climate phenomenon, which will lead to combating the health disparities experienced by low-income communities and communities of color. It greatly disturbs me that while I have the privilege to speak before you today, there are children living in East Harlem who are being hospitalized for asthma at an unnerving rate, which is three times more than the city rate. Now, after sharing this information with you, it appears to be inconceivable how any persons or any entity can be against such a bill that would combat these major forms of oppression. However, companies such as ExxonMobil have been spreading misinformation and lies to ensure that this bill is not put into effect. For far too long, we have seen mythical conspiracies created by those who put dollar signs before people surrounding environmental and racial justice, delaying important pieces of legislation such as this one from making real social, social change that enhances the lives of all members within our communities. My goal for today is that at least one point I have made in this short period of time has inspired and invigorated you to take action in passing this bill and beyond by using your power to promote justice for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Samantha, for your patience, for your passionate advocacy and for um, your, uh, you know, dedication to join, what core it is, you, 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 what, what core, you, you were climate, what, what was it again? Uh, the Climate Reality Corps, it was started by former Vice President Al Gore. Oh, of course, okay, well, um, uh, you know, thank you for joining that crusade and for being here with us, if you could send us your uh, testimony in writing, we greatly appreciate that, thank you again. Thank you. We next call on Ken Schles. Time starts now. Thank you. I appreciate this time. Uh, my name is Ken Schles. I'm a third generation New Yorker and a father of two. A volunteer with Food and Water Watch with nearly 100,000 supporters here in New York City. I'm a New York Times notable author and photographer. I grew up in this city suffering from asthma, a disease that nearly took my life on more than one occasion. Now I suffer from cardiovascular disease made worse by PM 2.5, an insidious fossil fuel pollutant. In 2016, I nearly died from a heart attack. Both ailments are comorbidities associated with burning fossil fuels, past 2317 without delay. 
Frac gas is a significant indoor pollutant linked to asthma, cancer, and premature death. According to just a just released Harvard study, gas leakage is two to 10 times worse than current EPA estimates. We are, quote, missing significant sources of methane emissions. These findings pro provide more evidence that we should be moving away from natural gas towards renewable energy to heat and electrify our cities, unquote. The human costs, some of which I can attest to are staggering. Lost school, lost work, and irrevocably traumatized families. Tragedy is especially felt in economically and resource strained environmental justice communities. My cellar flooded during Hurricane Ida. And we lost irreplaceable family papers. The CLCPA's Climate Action Council looked at premature mortality, heart attacks, hospitalizations, asthma, emergency room visits, and lost work based on fossil fuel emissions. The cost of inaction exceeded the cost of action by more than $80 billion. There are great external benefits, opportunities to create hundreds of thousands of jobs, improve air quality, generating health benefits ranging from 160 to 170 billion, reduced emissions, avoid economic impacts of damages caused by climate change of approximately 260 billion, unquote. My personal losses never, may never be ameliorated, but others needn't share my fate. If we're to meet emission targets of the I'm expired of the Paris Agreement, adhere to COP26 Global Methane Pledge, if we're to keep global warming below 1.5, not burn through our planet's forever carbon budget in 11 years, we have to get off fossil fuels. Implementing 2317 is not a choice, it's an urgent necessity. I urge you to pass 2317 without an extended phase-in. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ken, I thank you for your passion and, um... I, uh, I'm sure I speak for everyone when we, uh, you know, wish you good health and um, um, and if you could submit your uh, you know, comments to us in, in writing, that'd be greatly appreciated. I will. Thank, Thank you, you again. Thank you. Thank you. We next call on Matthew Lipschick. Yeah. Time starts now. Hello, uh, my name is Matthew Lipschick. Uh, I'm a lifelong resident of New York City. Uh, a retired teacher, a, a member and volunteer with Food and Water Watch. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I urge you to pass uh, intro 2317 now. Uh, you can take this small step to lower the rate of global heating, but it's a, it's a powerful step to improving local air quality and health. But it will also lower um, fossil fuel infrastructure accidents, uh, fewer explosions, leaks, fires, deaths. But it's a further improvement to societal health. Uh, I don't know what the downside is. If fossil fuel companies make less money, that, that, that's not a concern of the committee. And, and the real estate lobby is against it, but they're, they're too afraid of change to, to see how this bill will actually benefit New York City real estate. So uh, please uh, strengthen this bill, pass it today, and mandate that it take effect within the next 12 months. Uh, uh, good day. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Matthew. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your service to Food and Water Watch, with whom we do a lot of business. <clears throat> and I appreciate uh, your good testimony. And if you could transmit that to us, we greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Be back. Thank you. Next, we call on Hody Nemez. Time starts now. Hello, I'm Rabbi Hody Nemes. I'm the co-founder and leader of Jewish Climate Action Network NYC, which is a group of Jews of many backgrounds. Uh, we advocate for climate action as a moral and religious issue, and I'm here representing them. I'm also here because of my wife. Uh, on the night of September 1st, I thought that she was going to die. And here's my son. Um, my wife is a pediatric emergency room doctor. Hurricane Ida was raging that night of September 1st and uh, she had to go uh, take care of sick kids at the hospital that needed her. So she went into the storm and she called me shortly after leaving our house panicked. She was on the major Deegan and uh, floodwaters were rising and uh, her car stalled twice. The waters kept rising. She called 911 and, and no one answered. So uh, for hours we wondered if she would survive. And I, and I was home with our young children, one of whom you just heard, I was praying. Uh, when EMTs finally rescued her, I, I cried. 
and I've studied climate change for years, but this was the first time it, you know, I felt it really threatening my family directly. So I, like everyone else, uh, or many of the people who've spoken, I'm asking you to pass intro 2317 uh, to strengthen it by making it apply, you know, in, in one year and, and by making sure to clarify that language around the gut renovations. Um, I, I also want to mention, you know, my wife is an ER doctor, has seen, ironically, she's seen thousands of, of children, uh, you know, suffering from, from uh, asthma, particularly from the South Bronx in her ER. And we've heard a thousand New Yorkers are killed by, by building pollution. Um, and I just want to mention that, you know, Jewish tradition, which, of which I'm a part, is obsessed with saving lives. From the very first verses of Genesis, uh, one of our great theologians, Rabbi Yitz Greenberg, has said the Torah's central value expressed in ritual and ethics is to increase life and the quality of life. Jewish Climate Action Network. I'm expired. We ask that you vote to protect life. Uh, thank you, Rabbi. Um, L'chaim, and I, uh, my wife is Jewish, so I, I'm, you know, <laughs> Excellent. I got it going on. So, um, uh, you, know, uh, you know, sorry that you had that harrowing, um, uh, you know, day in which you didn't know the fate of your wife, and may that never happen again. Um, and we appreciate your, um, uh, your, your uh, focus on the, you know, moral imperative and, um, uh, it has lent the richness to this proceeding that um, uh, that we deeply appreciate. So thank you, Rabbi, very much. And please, uh, with that said, that that doesn't get you off the hook about sending your uh, comments in writing. Okay, so I'm giving you a homework assignment. So um, thank you very much. Best to you and your wife and family. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Bet. Thank you. Next is Natalie Cronin. Time starts now. Hi, how are you? My name is Natalie Cronin. Um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to support this bill. Um, I'm calling as a, a mom and daycare provider on the Upper East Side. Um, our park, Carlshire's Park, faces a big giant power plant that um, we're looking forward to going away and um, we're happy that the Astoria Peaker plant was not passed. Um, one of the things that's really important to me as a person who cooks and uses my home um, for work and play and, um, and to, to earn a living um, is that um, I learned through climate action that fossil fuels come into my own kitchen and um, some of the pollutants, I'm sorry, I'm distracted by my kids upstairs right now. <laughs> some of the pollutants that are there um, are really, really dangerous. What captured my attention was a woman holding a sign saying, radon is bad for kids. And as a, um, a person from the Western Pennsylvania corner where um, fracking has started its boom, I learned that the, the radioactive gas coming from where I grew up is actually in my kitchen. And um, one of the things I know as a mother, the radon when it breaks down becomes lead. Um, and we don't want lead dust and we don't want lead pollution in our homes, especially if we have children and pets. And we also wanna make sure that we're able to make sure that our cognition is continuing to strive because learning disabilities um, strike you at any time, learning challenges. So I think that this bill is extremely important to keep pollution out of our day-to-day -day homes. It's not just a, a big far away issue. Climate change is happening right here in New York City. And one of the things we can do um, right here right now is to defend our own nests, including our kitchens. And I thank you for that. Thank you, Natalie. We thank you for being here while simultaneously you know, giving us the benefit of your views. You're taking care of your kids. You're taking care of <laughs> presumably other people's kids. Um, in my playroom. <laughs> yeah, I think you can do it all. So um, I, I, I uh, you know, really appreciate your um, perspective. Would be grateful if you could transmit your comments to us in uh, writing and uh, all the best to you. Thank you for your patience uh, in being here and giving us the benefit of your good testimony. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Next is Amber Ruther. Time starts now. Hello, uh, my name is Amber Ruther and I work at Alliance for a Green Economy, also known as AGREE. Um, 
We have been working for years to phase fossil fuels out of buildings, and we've helped over 100 New Yorkers switch to heat pumps through the Heat Smart CNY program. Agree urges the council to honor the rights of New Yorkers to good quality housing, clean air, and a livable climate by passing intro 2317 immediately. We also encourage you to work with New York's disadvantaged communities to ensure implementation is equitable and affordable and that the emission standards in this bill are strengthened, loopholes are tightened, and expensive polluting and false solutions like so-called renewable natural gas, biofuels, and hydrogen are avoided. These false solutions are being pushed by the fossil fuel industry so that we'll, we will be forced to continue using their infrastructure. But countless studies show that heat pumps are a safer, healthier, and more cost-effective way to decarbonize the heating sector. The technology for heat pumps is there and cold climate models can operate efficiently below negative 10 degrees. Very cold countries like Sweden already get 75% of their heat from heat pumps, including geother geothermal district heating system designed to capture waste heat. And this is not a technical problem, it's a political one. We also intervene in utility rate cases around the state and spending billions building new gas infrastructure that will soon become stranded assets is coming at a great cost to ratepayers at a time when over a million New Yorkers already can't afford their utility bills. National Grid is already raising their rates an average of $125 a year, and this winter, homes that heat with fossil fuels are projected to see an increase in their fuel bills, ranging from 22 to 94 percent, while homes that heat using electricity will see an increase of only 4 to 15 percent. New York leads the nation in premature deaths. Time expired caused by fossil fuels in buildings, so we urge you to pass this bill to protect public health. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Amber. Uh, again, I thank uh, you as I have all, all the others who who, who, were, who have testified uh, um, in the you know latter part of the hearing for your patience. We're going on more than five hours, and uh, you know for you to show that kind of dedication to stay in there just to uh, you know to give us the benefit of of your perspective is a real value added to what we're doing here. Please send us your comments in writing. And um, we wish you all good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Marie Pierre. Time starts now. Good afternoon, good evening. And thank you for allowing me to testify. My name is Marie Pierre and I'm the co-chair of the Brownsville chapter of the New York Communities for Change. I'm and also the chair of NYCC board. I testify today to call on New York City Council to strengthen and pass intro 2317. We have been witnessing failure of climate action on the global and national levels. The lesson is clear. It is nearly up, it is really up to us to secure climate change progress on the local level. Passing a, passing a strengthened intro 2317 will be a victory for New York and the world. We are a city of buildings and I can, I can bring you to my neighborhood to see my buildings. We emit far more than our fair share of pollution as a city. Local law 97 of 20, 2019 was a great step to fight pollution. But we know, more, we know more needs to be done quickly. Prohibiting the use of gas in our new construction is a common sense follow-up to local law 97. What else is a common sense? Is that the buildings that undergo gut renovations be required to fully electrify. I ask the council to incorporate concrete language to ensure this provision. Likewise, the timeline need to be shortened on intro 20, 2317. Why delay when climate crisis intensifies every day? In Brownsville, we are not the ones contributing to the large scale climate. We commute on public transport. I even have solar panels on the roof. I'm expired. Home. But we know that we as individuals can, cannot do enough. 
cannot do enough to control what's happening. I ask you to pass 2317 and thank you for allowing me to testify. Uh, thank you, Marie. Thank you for your patience and your passionate advocate, your passionate um, advocacy and your work for uh, you know, New York Communities for Change. Please submit us your comments in writing and we thank you again. Thanks. Thank you too. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we call on Georgie. Time starts now. Shit. Hello? <laughs> hello? Yes, hello, Georgie. This is Chairman Gennaro. You are on. I apologize. Um, no, it's quite all right. It's, it's been a long, it's been a long hearing. Um, good afternoon, Chair Gennaro, members of the Committee on Environmental Protection and fellow citizens. My name is Georgie Page. I live in District 35. I'm a constituent of Council Member Combo and a volunteer with 350 Brooklyn. I'm here today to state my strong support for Intro 2317. I come to the environmental movement through a deep conviction that our country, our cities and streets belong to everyone and should be protected and shared equally. I'm thinking specifically today of the 2014 gas explosion that devastated two apartment buildings on 116th Street in Harlem when I still live there. This explosion killed eight people, injuring at least 70 and displacing 100 families. Ultimately, this failure was blamed on Con Edison, but blaming them did not bring those eight people back or make up for the disruption and fracturing of lives and families that occurred. Gas is dangerous, it is poisonous, it is toxic, and we don't need it. Even damage that might seem minor to an outsider can have a major effect on the ability to function in everyday life. In any case, this is not how this city should function. We need to protect our citizens, not leave them vulnerable and damaged. I would like to remember them today as we consider whether it is really necessary to continue fracking dangerous gases out of the ground and piping them across the country and into our cities, causing damage and contamination every step of the way and not just to humans. Our nature and wildlife is also ultimately affected. Are you okay with the prospect of a world without honeybees and pollination? I am not. In the wake of that, wake of that catastrophe in Harlem, I walked the streets of my neighborhood newly attuned to the rotten egg smell of gas in the air and wondered if my building, a five-story walk-up, would be next. Are we truly relying on the sharp noses of busy citizens to prevent the next disaster? A recent constitutional amendment passed via statewide vote has firmly established the right of each citizen to clean air and water and a healthful environment. Perhaps the most shocking thing about this new article is that it didn't already exist. Time expired. What is more fundamental than this? What is our government for if not to protect us? I don't want to make the point that it will personally, I do want to make the point but that I will personally consider a failure of leadership if the council only approves feasibility studies. We already know that decarbonizing and electrifying is challenging, but it is feasible and possible. So we need 2317 specifically to pass during these last weeks of the session, or we will miss this opportunity. And we know that Adams is very well funded by real estate interests. So it is very urgent that you consider your legacy and not shy away from this bold and progressive action. We can Please never, conclude. Get, this, Please conclude. We can I, never I, get this time back. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. And thank you for your patience and waiting so long to testify. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Next is A. Wilson. Time starts now. Hello. Hello. Good to see you, James Gennaro. Yes, Don't hello. Um, I'm glad to be able to speak tonight. And uh, I would like to address first the- Is this um, Annie? Is this yes. Annie? Yes, oh, it it's is. Annie. You should have said so, Annie. Yeah, okay. Annie Wilson, yes. Yes, of so course. So thank you. This is from for anyone. It's been a long time. So I'm yeah. really glad to see your, where you are and thank well. You. And so um, very quickly, the um, the uh, first comment I wanted to make was about the uh, study of the health impacts from gas stoves in intro 2196. Very important so that people could really understand when and what they are dealing with. And um, I don't know by when this study would be supplied by, but 
Uh, the second uh, study looking at the feasibility of electrifying existing buildings. And I guess you'll be looking at all issues, including what was raised earlier today, the air source and ground source heat pumps. Uh, that also, by when would that be published? Just, I'm curious. And so the um, intro 2317, absolutely should be supported and hopefully voted on by the end of the year and strengthened uh, along with the better definition of what the renovations are and uh, addressing a loophole that was, was mentioned earlier, which would increase um, or decrease the uh, threshold uh, to 25 kilograms or more of carbon dioxide per million BTUs. And um, I would like to know how this might coincide with what is the state bill. There's a Senate bill 6843 that looks at having introduced by Brian Kavanaugh, a state senator, um, that would require that there be a prohibition to municipalities throughout the state for issuing any new permits for the construction of new gas powered buildings after 2023 and conversions of existing buildings, I guess that's renovations after 2022. So uh, either way, I suppose that if the city doesn't pass, the state will, hopefully. And um, there was a comment, you know, with the electrification and the needs for reduction I'm of emissions. Excited. Okay, let me wrap it up. The, the need for reduction of emissions. We have local law 97, we have the using more electricity. And I want to address what had been mentioned by Ben Furness, Director of Mayor's Office of Climate and Sustainability, and uh, his reference to 2,500 megawatts coming down from transmission. And he was wrong about his facts. In fact, it's 3,800 megawatts with the NIPA Clean Path New York project. And then there's the proposed Blackstone transmission corridor that is permitted and should not be contracted out by the city of New York, which intends to, under this de Blasio administration, to procure power that is sourced from hydro dams built on indigenous Annie. lands in Canada. Annie, 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 we're getting a little far afield we're here. Done. I'm only saying okay. we've got to be conscious about where our electricity come from. And that's where I'm closing. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, 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 Annie, uh, uh, I mean, so so your uh, testimony is uh, um, concluded, but I, 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 I uh, you know, uh, I thank you for... Uh, for uh, uh, you know uh, being so patient, and uh, you know, thank you for you know bringing in these you know other issues about you know where our power is sourced from. Not necessarily like a topic of this hearing, but certainly worth noting. <clears throat> and because you and I are friends, certainly willing to give you a little latitude on that. And I look forward to um, seeing you again soon. Now that uh, I'm back doing this again, so uh, Annie, I look forward to uh, you know long and fruitful collaboration um, with you and like-minded people on how we can make the city more green. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Next is Harry P. Johnson. Time starts now. Yes, hi. My name is Harry Johnson. I'm the vice chair for Flatbush chapter of New York Communities for Change. Today, I urge the city council to strengthen and pass intro 2317. Uh, please note in my written testimony, which I have submitted for the record, I have included some suggestion for strengthening intro 2017, 2317 that I think should be incorporated into the bill. I wouldn't review those in my verbal remarks now. At the end of the day, the situation is quite clear. Burning gas is cooking the planet. From Brooklyn to Bangladesh, black and brown people are paying the greatest cost. Scientists say we must immediately begin phasing out, phasing out gas use. They are cleaner and safer alternative to gas ready right now. Intra 2017, 2317 could be a huge step in the right direction. It would cut indoor and local air pollution that kills. It creates tons of good jobs. It would make our city fairer. At the end of the day, we either take rapid and big action to choose a livable future or even a travelable one. Or we slow walk off the climate cliff because a handful of people in our society want to make an extra buck. Let's choose rapid and big action. Decision maker of the New York City Council 
please tighten up intra 2317. A good start as it stands and pass it as soon as possible. Show us you can put climate justice first. Thank you for holding this important hearing. Uh, thank you very much, Harry, for staying around uh, for, what is it now, uh, you know, more than five and a half hours to give us the benefit of your views and please submit your uh, testimony in writing to us. And uh, we thank you for making a very compelling statement today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if there has been anyone that we inadvertently missed who has registered to testify today and has yet to have been called, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be called in the order that your hand has been raised. Okay. Okay, I see two, two more people. Thank you for for waiting. Uh, first, I'll call three more people. Uh, Rebecca Duval. Hi, I'm Rebecca Duval. I live in Brooklyn. I enthusiastically support 2017 and would like it to be passed as quickly as possible. I am appealing to you today as somebody in, who is really worried about our future. I work in a school with two-year-old to 14-year-old children, and I love them so much. Their energy and joy for life and their ability to love without limit is really a reason for me to live. Um, I look at the children in my life and my family and surrounding me, and when I think of their near future, I feel a rush of panic. I worry about the probability that their lives will have more pain because of climate collapse and that they will directly experience pain and upheaval from rising temperatures, extreme weather, physical displacement, and the social and economic upheaval that comes from these growing changes. I also worry about the pain that they will witness as the most vulnerable throughout our country and the world bear the most severe consequences of climate destruction hinged on our reliance upon fossil fuels. In my life, I've already experienced growing trends of extreme weather and the instability that comes from it, from Hurricane Sandy to the increasing frequency of slow moving low pressure precipitation systems that regularly wreak havoc on our infrastructure, on streets and transit that have ruined homes and caused loss of lives. lives. Um, I've seen West Coast wildfires burn beyond control and have seen the smoke reach New York Less dramatically, but quite noticeably, I've felt the erratic seasonal shifts that come from warming temperatures. Globally, I've seen the ocean's irreplaceable health compromised Time by expired. oil and plastic waste. I've seen the ocean on fire. I've seen massive numbers of climate migrants, lives uprooted far away from me. And while I've seen this, I've seen the city continue passively. I worry when I see the pressure wielded upon the city by the money. Becca, please conclude. Please conclude. This is entwined with the fossil fuel industry. I'm hopeful that we can reverse this pattern. 2317 is a chance for New York City to make a please real. Please conclude. Focus. Please conclude. We owe it to our children. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us. Please submit us your statement in writing. We appreciate your patience and waiting so long to testify. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Nina Grigoriev. Time starts now. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yes, you're coming in fine. All right, excellent. Um, dear Chair Gennaro and members of the Committee on Environmental Protection, um, my name is Nina Gregoriev and I live in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. I'm a constituent of council member Justin Brannon in District 43. I worked in public health communications most of my professional career. I'm a mom of two kids, a first generation immigrant and a Brooklyn native. Um, I'm here to speak on behalf of myself and as a volunteer of um, 350 Brooklyn. I know you've heard from a lot of technical experts already. It's been a really, really long day. Um, and really important technical points have been made on both sides. I'm here today to make the case from a really 
personal perspective from my neck of New York City right here in Brooklyn. Um, I live in a historic 450 unit pre-war building and I've served on the building's board for a number of years. Our building has been aging and has needed a lot of repairs. Um, in my experience on the board has convinced me that intro 2317 is a common sense measure that as many experts already testified today will put New York City on a, on a path to modernize our very old and frail infrastructure. Over the past few years, Bay Ridge has had multiple major gas leaks, major health and safety issue, we don't have to tell you that. As a result, our streets right down the street from here have been torn up to replace aging gas pipes. The pipe replacement work has been done right next to our local school across the street from where I live, PS 102. The waterfront along Shore Road, an area popular with families such as mine, and next to major commercial strips on Third Avenues where thousands of people eat and shop every day. A lot of folks, if you haven't come to Third Avenue to grab a bite, come, it's awesome. I appreciate the city allocating resources to replace some of those old, old pipes, um, but moving away from reliance on gas for heating and cooking would reduce the need for costly road repairs and the resulting traffic jams and parking nightmares, as well as the release of very harmful gases into our air. I mean, we don't I... want to have 311 on speed dial. Are we out of time? I uh, sadly, yes, but okay. um, well, I, I think you, you get my point. Everyone deserves to go home and have dinner right now. But um, Chairman Gennaro, thank you so much for your patience, your grace and your humor for five and a half hours. That's wild. <laughs> it's nothing. It's nothing. I can do 10. I can do 10, you know. Um, I submitted my testimony as well. I think it's one small slice from one person in this big, big city. But thank you for all of your work on, on this issue. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, being patient and giving us the benefit of your heartfelt personal views. And uh, say hi to Justin Brandon for me, okay? Will do. I see him around okay. all the time. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, it, we have uh, Donna Gill. Yeah, time starts now. Did you unmute me? Thank you very much, um, Chairman Janaris and everyone. Thank you. Um, uh, for listening to us today. I, um, I come to you to say pass intro 2317. And I am a member of WEAC with my colleagues, um, uh, my WEAC colleagues, Annie and El LJ and Sono and um, other people, I just wanted to bring us back to what we were talking about. Um, the intro 2317 is called Gas Free NYC. And this bill ends gas in new constructions and gut renovations. The bill also asks, it also fights climate crisis creates energy jobs, cuts deadly air pollution in our neighborhoods, ends gas explosions and fires and promote environmental justice. So I thank you for having me to, to speak on this, um, on this bill today because it's very important as my colleagues um, spoke uh, so eloquently, the, the leaders in, um, in the industry and common everyday people like us, who are the ones that are going to benefit from the impact of this um, from a grass free NYC? Um, I know we we need to be change agent, agents and to push us forward. So I thank you for having this and for staying with us for this long. I appreciate you. I appreciate the city council. But the the bottom line is pass intro. 2317. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Donna. I, I, I appreciate uh, uh, everything that uh, you do, your work for um, We Act. Um, uh, you know, many, many, I guess it's like 20 years ago. It's just like I got my, you know, the first environmental award I ever got was from We Act. Uh, you know, Peggy and I have been, you know, friends for a long time. And um, I've always had a special place in my heart for um, for Peggy and for We Act, and uh, boy, don't we miss uh, you know Cecil Corbin Mark. We you know it's so sad uh, still. Um, 
uh, that he is not with us, but he is with us today. And um, um, yeah, so I think uh, I think that's a good way to end the hearing to think about Cecil and how he dedicated his um, you know professional life towards uh, making sure that we had a greener city and a better life. So um, um, there you have it. So um, thank you, Donna. We appreciate your good testimony. Uh, please submit it in writing, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, and that concludes public testimony, and I now pass it back to Chair Gennaro for any closing remarks. Uh, sure. I, I, I want to uh, thank all of the, you know, witnesses. Am I, am I on? Yeah, I'm, I'm on your... <clears throat> I want to thank all of the witnesses who gave us uh, you know, their, their whole day as I go to the gallery function, I, I, I noticed that there are, you know, many people who testified hours ago who are still on. I think that's a testimony, uh, you know, to the passion about, you know, uh, uh, 2317 and the other bills <clears throat> uh, and a passion for, uh, you know, Greater New York uh, and, uh, you know, Greater New York. I want to thank the staff, the moderators. Uh, uh, we have Nadia and... Who do we have? Nina and uh, um, 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 everyone who served as a moderator, uh, um, all the staff. Uh, uh, I want to, uh, you know, thank the uh, uh, Speaker of the Council, Corey Johnson, uh, and uh, um, uh, Chief of Staff, uh, uh, Jason Goldman, and uh, uh, my staff, Nabby, and, you know, Samara, and all, all the folks that, that, that uh, you know, put this, you know, put this good hearing together. <clears throat> I'm saying I'm saving my uh, my uh, 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 highest praise for Councilmember Ampre Samuels. Uh, uh, you know, Councilmember um, Ampre Samuel has really been a, a a real force and a real change maker, um, and I thank her very much uh, for her you know um, advocacy in bringing this bill forward. Uh, and I look forward to what is to uh, uh, to come. I don't know if she's still on, but I. I um, uh, you know, uh, grateful to her and uh, with no one else wishing to be heard and my thanks having been expressed, my deep felt gratitude to everyone involved in this hearing uh, with sadness, because I could go another two hours, uh, I am uh, uh, closing the hearing. Oh, uh, um, Alika, do you want to say something? I see you. Okay, okay. I got a thumbs up from um, Alika. I will take it. Okay, thank you all very much. And with that, 